Thomas, 23rd of June. That's today. Our last day at DGC Live. Our last day, but we have definitely saved the best for last. The next 12 hours are going to be amazing, just like the 24 hours that we had before. Absolutely. Now, this day is going to be, I think, the most cerebral. There's so much to learn today. We've got things like eSports management. We've got things like how you monetize your games for developers. We've got um, how you build games for Africa, which is a huge, huge opportunity for a lot of people, as well as virtual reality, which I'm really excited for. Yeah, we have a great session with HTC yeah. on location-based virtual reality, but we also have special sessions on blockchain and yeah. games, education and games, and much more. Now, we could go on about day three for a really long time, but why don't we just start it and then everyone watching can get involved. Perfect, Thomas. Let's start it. Let's start. An inspiring business hub where over 20,000 talented minds are positioning Dubai as the engine of innovation by pushing the limits of creativity every day. Home to over 2,000 media companies from around the globe, Dubai Media City is a vibrant community offering business, entertainment, and lifestyle, enabling our partners to lead with creativity that resonates. Redefining the future of media innovation. Dubai Media City. Uh, it's day three, and uh, with Nami Suzon, 
who is the business development manager for apps and gaming uh, from Google. And she's joining us now in, uh, from Dublin in Ireland. Hi, Lamise. Hi, hello. I'm really happy, very excited to be with you today. Uh, so Lamise is going to be, you, you, uh, you're going to be uh, speaking about ad monetization and gaming with brand mm -hmm. and programming campaigns. Uh, Lamise, you're from, from uh, Google and you usually work with the developers, correct? Yes, absolutely. Yes. I'm part of Google's AdMob team and I work with publishers and app developers to help them monetize their content. I'm a business development manager within the AdMob team. So my role is really to try and find strategic publishers, app developers across MENA and other countries within uh, Europe and bring them on board and equip them to be long term strategic partners of Google. Perfect. And uh, I'm sure that uh, Everybody is already contacting you to book meetings on the meeting platform. Uh, we gave access to all the developers from the region and outside of the region for free to be able to benefit from, from uh, business meetings as well. And uh, mm -hmm. I, you are, you are going to do a presentation now, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you start and then we can chat a little bit when you are done. Um, uh, welcome everyone. I am very excited to be with you today and I'm really honored that uh, DGC has uh, invited me as a speaker to be with all of you today. Uh, my name is Lamise Ozon and I am part of Google's uh, AdMob team. I'm a business development manager for apps and gaming developers at Google. I've been working at Google for uh, about eight years now in various roles, and I've been three years in my current uh, in my current job, um, uh, working with uh, publishers and app developers in MENA and also in other uh, countries in Europe. Um, I'm really excited to be here today. I wish that we were meeting in person. Uh, because I really enjoy, uh, you know, the networking and the chit chats at the events. Uh, but hopefully next year we can all meet together in person huh? and that I won't bore you too much with my content for today. Yeah, but I mean, in the end, you just have the slides, not me. Right. So today's topic is going to be around smart monetization uh, with AdMob. Um, we're going to talk about, um, I'm going to show you what I'm going to cover. One second. We're going to have a walkthrough um, uh, of what I will cover today. First of all, I will talk about the state of play and give you a quick overview of the MENA gaming market. And then we'll go into the core topic of today's meeting, which is our session, which is how you can maximize your ads revenue with Google AdMob's solution. And then how you can grow your overall business with other Google products, such as smart segmentation and Firebase. And then how you could bring a very uh, pleasant and healthy app experience to your users and your, uh, and your developers uh, by maintaining high quality ads and giving you more control over um, blockings and review centers. Right, so um, to start with, this is going to be a very quick overview, um, uh, just to give you some quick insights to what we are seeing in MENA today and when it comes to gaming. MENA has the fastest growing gaming population in the world. So this is information that we have um, uh, we have extracted from different resources, in where we have seen that Mina is the fastest growing population for online gamers uh, between 2019 and it, we see it as a trend that's going to go on until 2020. Uh, you can see there that it's close to uh, nine percent uh, in terms of growth versus the global growth, which is at uh, almost uh, five and a half percent. On the other hand, though, um, MENA has one of the lowest uh, in terms, lowest uh, regions in terms of the revenue uh, per gamer per year. And um, uh, this is like, it's, it's less than $60 if you compare it to what uh, the annual revenue from 
uh, from an average uh, spender in, in the US, for example, $100, uh, suggesting that there's definitely some room to grow in the region, but also maybe there are different factors in MENA that, uh, that contribute uh, to this low um, revenue, for example, the purchasing power of the user versus the purchasing power of the user in the US, for example. Um, mobile gaming uh, represents 58% um, of uh, MENA's games market. Globally, the mobile gaming is the biggest industry uh, uh, in gaming itself. Uh, so 45% of the global games market is actually mobile games. But in MENA, it's 58%. And one of the reasons of why is because MENA has leapfrogged you know, fixed internet and has moved straight into mobile. And that is due to the, to the fact that the high penetration that we have, um, the highest uh, penetration that MENA has in terms of smartphone penetration rate. For example, in the UAE, you have 78% uh, of, uh, um, of uh, mobile penetration. Uh, mobile also, mobile gaming also accounts for 33% of all apps downloads. And uh, so all of the applications that are being downloaded from the stores, 33% of them are actually games and 74% of consumer spend actually goes towards games and in-app purchases and in-app um, purchases and subscriptions to games and so on. And 10% of all the time spent within the uh, mobile apps is actually in gaming. Right, so mobile gaming is actually driving MENA's games industry growth, which is expected to exceed $6 billion in total revenue by 2021. Um, the global size of the opportunity or the global worth of the gaming industry, if you want, is about 149 billion in 2019 and growing. And MENA represents 3% of that, which is $4.8 billion of the global gaming industry. And it's the fastest growing with 10.8% increase in revenue between 2018 and 2019 versus 7.2% globally. So it's really, really an exciting, um, an exciting place to be is the gaming place. And an exciting market to be is, uh, is, is definitely MENA. <clears throat> Excuse me. So around uh, among the trends that we you can find uh, we're unable to hear you. Hello? Can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can hear you now. Right. So MENA, um, among the trends that can be found amongst MENA's diverse gaming population are a few that I have named. Firstly, is that MENA is mobile first. Um, like I said before, it has very high uh, mobile penetration. In fact, eight out of 10 are smartphone owners and seven out of 10 of these smartphone owners are gaming on their smartphones, suggesting that there's also room to grow as well. Um, the other thing is that um, it's uh, MENA in terms of like the profiles of the gamers that are there. Um, it looks like MENA re really enjoys the uh, casual and hyper casual games, um, such as like puzzle and cards and dice. Um, I'm sure if you're from the region, you enjoy uh, Tetris and, uh, and uh, maybe uh, Tagnib and all these card games. So it's, it's really a market that's keen on casual and hyper casual games, but also racing games and RPG games are highly popular in the region as well. Another one of the factors that's contributing to the diversity of the MENA uh, gaming population is the youthful population um, uh, of uh, gamers in MENA. And um, the population itself is quite youth and uh, youth, young, sorry. And 40% uh, of the population is actually under 25. And one of my favorite actually trends or insights is the fact that in MENA, 
uh, 50% of the gamers are actually female. And imagine in Saudi Arabia, they even exceed the number of male gamers at 90%. And that is also where the highest revenues per gamer are generated in MENA in Saudi Arabia. So um, our female gamers are really into their games and they're really spending in their games as well. <clears throat> right, so also looking at MENA and Turkey as part of MENA, if you want, we see like Turkey as the top market uh, opportunity per game download. Um, and Egypt then coming slightly behind, uh, suggesting that actually Egypt has the highest year on year growth comparing to other markets. Um, and uh, Turkey has, uh, in terms of with download volume, twice the size of other countries um, uh, in, in, in some markets. And I can speak firsthand to, uh, to this uh, because I work with a lot of developers and uh, publishers in Turkey. And I really, really admire this market when it comes to gaming. There's been so many like um, indie studios that have just came up and, uh, you know, learned how to publish their games and learned, uh, you know, how to promote their games. And now they're really topping the charts. Um, so I'm really, really excited also to see Egypt there and uh, the, the potential that is uh, lying in this market that has quite a high population as well. Uh, the other observation that we have is that Saudi Arabia basically contributes to the highest revenue in the region. And I think it's quite high amongst uh, globally as well, um, because it's expected to reach 200 million in revenue uh, in 2020, um, and where the average yearly spent per gamer is about $76 is what a gamer would spend on average a year inside a game. Um, and that is due to the country's high purchasing powers. And like I said, the majority of these gamer, gamers in Saudi Arabia are actually uh, female. And then Turkey would be the second one. And in Turkey, it's about $34 on average spent per gamer and a total revenue of around 180 uh, million in 2019. So I know that you would like to deep dive more into, and there's so much that we can discuss in terms of the of the MENA markets and the trends that we see there. Um, but maybe that's for another day or for you know an, another discussion, or you can you can get in contact with me after for more information. But for now, I'm going to have to move on to uh, our core topic, and that is how you can maximize your ads revenue from any demand source. Uh, using uh, Google AdMob. Um, so if you are a um, mobile app developer in, in the gaming space, um, you probably know that ad monetization has become a very uh, significant revenue driver or revenue stream um, for developers. And so um, we also see that a lot of publishers and app developers are diversifying their revenue stream so not only through ads, but within a mix of in-app purchases, plus ads, plus subscriptions, and so on. And today I want to help you to maximize, you know, how do you maximize this ad revenue, especially if you are using AdMob as a platform. And if you're not using AdMob as a platform, maybe I will inspire you to use it. Right, so we're going to talk about three pillars today when it comes to maximizing your ad revenue. We're going to, discuss, um, we're going to discuss and explore Google's demand. Then we're going to talk about AdMob's mediation. And finally, we're going to talk about open bidding. <clears throat> Excuse me. Right, so um, first off, we're going to start with Google's demand. One of the key differentiating elements about AdMob and about AdMob mediation in general is the access to the biggest and best sources of advertising demand globally. So you have you, de you definitely have access to 
loads of advertisers because those advertisers are actually Google's advertisers. And it's actually a fact that we have the biggest and the largest pool of advertisers. And so with that, you can always maintain and guarantee that you would have things through your application if you do use um, a Google Ad Mom. Um, in fact, like with our Google App campaigns, for example, uh, in where you can promote your iOS or your Android uh, apps across Google, uh, all from one campaign uh, across all of Google's products, we were able to reach uh, or drive over 20 billion downloads and installs up to uh, March 2020. And although Google's demand, this is something really, really important that I want to highlight, is that you get Google's demand from Google's platform and you get exclusive access to it in real time. So let me explain this a little bit better. Although Google Demand is available through other mediation platforms as well, AdMob is the only platform where Google Demand can compete for your inventory in real time. So I know I, this is something that I come across with a lot of developers who are considering other platforms um uh, to do some uh, uh, you know real time bidding and uh, and 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 they they think that google is going to be available google is available google's demand is available through these other mediation platforms but it's not available in real time outside of google's platform if that makes sense and if anyone tells you otherwise please double check this information uh, with uh, with your contacts at google or reach out to me <clears throat> right, so now moving on to uh, mediation, AdMob mediation. So as I said, we have the high uh, demand to fill your, your, your inventory and to fill your ad spaces. Um, but what else do you need to consider when you're choosing? Why would you want to, uh, an ad platform? And why would you want to choose AdMob, for example, to mediate your ad inventory? Uh, we are, you know, the way we've built our mediation platform is that we're improving it and we're always trying to make it easy um, and fair and easy to give you more control and efficiencies over, you know, your business and how you monetize your applications. And so therefore we have innovated and we've came up with models that allows Google um, to always bid fairly and in real time on our platform. And we ensure if there is a better bid available, we serve that impression. Also, we have created something that is called mediation groups. And mediation groups allows you to do a combination of targeting settings excuse me, that helps you to optimize your revenue generated by your ad units and gives you a little bit more control, as well as something called ad network optimization, also known as ANO. And ANO is a feature that basically, in short, allows AdMob to adjust the eCPM and, uh, and optimize for you. So it's like an automated way. So we're really trying to simplify things and to make it easy and more efficient for you. Right, so when you're considering uh, a mediation platform, another thing that you need to consider is that um, uh, you wanna make sure that the mediation platform supports the ad formats that you use in your application. And that's one thing that AdMob also does is that AdMob supports mediation for all major ad formats, including video, na native, uh, and rewarded, but also traditional formats like uh, banners and interstitial. Right, um, we're also in, uh, integrated with um, 30, uh, more than 30 actually, more than 30 um, uh, major uh, ad networks, including several regional networks, and these span all the major formats. Uh, a majority of them work with our 
network optimization product that I just mentioned uh, earlier. Um, but we also, if you know, if you have other ad networks that that are not included amongst these thirty ad networks, um, AdMob lets you work with more than seventy and gives you the flexibility to work with m more than seventy others uh, via a custom adapter. Right. So that's when we when we were talking about mediation, AdMob mediation, and and really AdMob mediation as a traditional solution. But we are moving on from this traditional way of uh, of mediating, and um, into a more advanced way uh, to to uh, enable you to maximize your revenues even either even more, introducing open bidding. Uh, open bidding is AdMob's real-time bidding solution, um, and it's a, it's a, it's a, to help you to maximize your revenues. And I will explain to you how in a few minutes. Uh, but it's also the only platform in where uh, demand from Google and we've partnered with Facebook and other party networks can compete for your inventory in real time. And I'll explain to you what it, how that is different to traditional mediation. So in the past, as you can see here, uh, traditional mediation basically um, uh, would, um, would uh, for example, if there are different ad networks um, uh, uh, bidding, uh, what traditional mediation uh, uses is basically historical average data uh, to prioritize networks and call them one at a time. Whereas open bidding calls all the participating ad networks at the same time, enabling them to compete equally in a single and unified auction. So I think I know it could be a little bit complicated, but basically, you know, to put it simply, um, mediation traditionally. Uh, it used to, you know, look at historical data and, and anticipate CPMs and and then the bid goes through, where this time this is in real time and all the ad networks get the same priority, including Google, and then you ensure to get the highest bidding network fairly and the highest uh, revenue for, for, your, for your impressions as well, if that makes sense. Um, so amongst the other, uh, you know, um, downfalls, I would say, or like difficulties that you have with traditional uh, mediation is that you really need a lot of human resources and efforts to try and, uh, you know, integrate all the SDKs that you need to manage and update. Um, you know, you need to manage waterfalls and uh, maybe ad latency that is uh, generated through these waterfalls. Uh, you need to explore and look at the reporting and the billing across several apps, across maybe several ad networks as well. So there is a lot of, um, you know, there is a lot of heavy lifting that uh, that your human resources need to do. Uh, but means? with open bidding, we're actually um, we're actually making Yes. Uh, you still have around four minutes. Uh, Only four minutes? You, you still have many slides? Uh, yes, let me run through them. All right, perfect. No worries. Okay, okay cool. So amongst the, um, the benefits that you would get also is that you would have, um, uh, you know, we're, we're introducing real-time auction, like I said, uh, but also single reporting and a single payment platform. So you will be able to be paid from a single platform, which I think that is really, really major for app developers working with different ad networks. And you will also have fewer SDKs, and we're moving towards, you know, uh, less and less SDKs as we go uh, as we go forward. Um, sorry, moving on to the next slide. Uh, so yeah, just uh, this is a very quick summary of what I've just discussed in terms of the benefits: unified auction, real-time pricing, 
uh, you know, work seamlessly and no SDK rendering. These are some of our supported partners. Like I said, Google Demand is only available in real time uh, through our platform. Uh, alongside with, uh, we've partnered also with uh, Facebook. And so you can get the uh, fans uh, demands also in real time out of uh, uh, through Google's mediation platform, along with some of these supported partners that you see here on the screen. And we continue to grow um, uh, and add more uh, ad networks as well. Right, so uh, that's it in terms of uh, monetization. And now I just want to touch upon very quickly on a few other resources to help you grow your overall business. Um, uh, as um, I mentioned earlier, a lot of app developers um, uh, our mobile applications in general include in-app purchases uh, as a revenue stream, a significant revenue stream in their application. Uh, but uh, you need to be aware that we uh, have done some research and only around 4% of your users are actually going to convert into an, uh, in, to make an in-app purchase. So that's leaving 96% of your users that will never spend uh, on an in-app purchase. So what have we done? We've introduced something called smart segmentation. Smart segmentation is a solution from Google that uses machine learning to try and predict the user's behavior within your application. And so what we do is we are able to segment the users into known purchasers or those that are not known uh, to make a purchase. And um, um, we are able to segment them. And based on that, uh, the way, you know, traditionally to today, the way the user journey looks like is basically you have, let's say in this game, you have a mission and you have two users. One is uh, likely to make a purchase and the other is not likely to make a purchase. They both have the same experience they in, in uh, or journey in your, in your application. They both see the same thing. Whereas if you use smart segmentation with machine learnings, we're able to segment your users into purchasing users and not purchasing users. And so the ones that are purchasing are likely to make a purchase predicted by our machine learning. You don't need to show ads to, and you can maintain them and, you know, and, and, uh, and maintain the revenue that would come from these in-app purchasers. Whereas the ones that are not likely to make a purchase, you, don't, you can show an ad, and that way you can monetize both and unlock revenue from both types of users. And this is thanks to uh, smart segmentation, which is really revolutionary. And just very quickly here, there is uh, one um, um, testimony here from Game Insights, one of our large strategic publishers in EMEA. And uh, they've seen an increase around 30% in ads revenue. And this is almost consistent across the board uh, of developers seeing the same thing. Very quickly as well, if you want to also maximize your overall revenues, um, I would highly recommend that you check out Firebase. Firebase is really a tool, a suite of tools for an app developer. It's like an app developer platform that allows you to access different tools to build better apps, to improve your app quality, and analytics to also understand your application and your users better. And I think like Firebase, is really, really, really a powerful tool. A lot of these things that are available are almost free, uh, you know, to get started with. So I would highly recommend that you check out Firebase. And then when you combine Firebase with AdMob, you basically are able to unlock more ways to, um, to grow your overall revenue. For example, if you, if you, if you combine uh, Firebase and AdMob, you can do different A-B testings, uh, allowing you to test different and experiment with different uh, maybe ad implementations or changes within your application smoothly and easily. Um, you can also use predictions, for example, uh, like I showed you earlier with smart segmentation, predict your in-app purchases. 
uh, and in-app purchasing users. And you can also use something called remote, remote config also in combination with uh, Firebase and uh, AdMob uh, to help you to make some uh, smooth and easy uh, changes like colors and fonts and, and so on within your application without having to republish your application done really, really, really smoothly. So I definitely advise you to check out Firebase. And finally, um, you know, within the core of what we do at Google, we really take the user's experience um, and the ecosystem and the health of the ecosystem uh, very, very uh, seriously. And uh, in everything that we do, we try to protect them and make sure that, uh, you know, the advertiser um, uh, is protected as an ecosystem and the user and the publisher in terms of the quality of the ads and in terms of um, the user experience. Uh, and where the ads are published. And so with AdMob, we have introduced more tools and solutions for you uh, to enable you to, uh, to manage your ads and the type of ads that are shown in your application better. Uh, introducing our ad review center that allows you to make different blocking controls uh, within AdMob, both on an account level, but also on an application level. Uh, so really giving you more flexibility and more control uh, over what uh, ads are running uh, within your account and within your, um, uh, within your application and giving you more control over blocking different categories. Um, there has been a lot of content, so I hope I didn't overwhelm you with everything. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really happy to, you can reach out to me and I can... Um, I can try and uh, answer any uh, other questions that you may have or, uh, you know, have further discussions. And um, uh, that was it for me today. Thank you. Thank you, Lamis. Uh, of course, Google has been the partner of the developers for, for, for a long time now, even uh, also in our region. It's really interesting mm -hmm. to see also uh, how positive the numbers of the region are. And uh, mm -hmm. this shows, of course, uh, great progress. And it means that we also have good content and, and, uh, and a lot of gamers, of course, that mm -hmm. are playing mm -hmm. the games. So uh, we really thank you for uh, the, all of these, the, this insight on the, on the industry and sharing all these data. And uh, I'm sure that uh, on the meeting platform, uh, you've mm -hmm. been receiving a lot of meetings already and that you are meeting with the developers from the region and outside of the region as well that participate mm -hmm. in UGC. And uh, we hope to welcome you uh, very soon here in Dubai. And, uh, you will, uh, you, and this way you will be able to meet the whole ecosystem uh, directly face to face. Yes, thank you so much for having me. And thank you to all the organizers at DGC. I'm really, really, really excited about the region. And I'm excited to, you know, meet more and more developers and help to grow the region because I think it's really promising. Um, and the gaming industry is a, such an exciting uh, place and space to be in. And uh, there's so much opportunity coming up for, for uh, Mina in general. I've uh, really enjoyed my time. And yes, I'm looking forward to meet more developers within the meetings uh, throughout the event. Thank you. Thank you, Lamis.
We are back, day three, uh, DGC Live with a really exceptional uh, presence from Seagate. And we will be discussing uh, Seagate, power up your gaming with Seagate. And we know Seagate is doing so much for the gamers and uh, we will hear a lot about it and also doing so much for the content creators as well. And I believe w without them, the, the experience will be really uh, difficult. And I am joined uh, to co-host this session by Ahmed Al Nashid, who you usually see <laughs> next to me, and uh, we are joking around and everything. But today he uh, he's joining us from from his home, and we have. I just wanted that experience. I just wanted that experience to see, like, if I can. <laughs> you wanted to be <laughs> Ahmed. Yeah, you wanted to I, be on I got the other jealous side, from huh? all. Yeah, I got jealous from all the other like game yeah. developers and every like <laughs> guests that we had. Like, I just wanted to try it. Yeah, and so uh, from Seagate, we are joined also by Rajesh, who is Seagate sales manager, and Idil, who is the marketing manager for Middle East, Africa, Turkey. Thank Any you. other regions you added, Idil, recently? <laughs> no. And, uh, and Faisal, <laughs> who is the marketing manager also at DK, because of the special partnership that DK and Seagate have uh, in our region as well. So uh, we have everybody on board. Uh, so my general question I will ask now, first of all, I want to know more about Seagate and DK, but also just in general, and then I'll let you guys uh, discuss so many other things. How do you really power up your gaming with Seagate? I would say that's the best question, Habib. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Idil. Okay. <laughs> um, so, I mean, to, is, to make a brief uh, start, uh, like an introduction, and thank you guys for you know, hosting us for this uh, nice session. Um, so it's Seagate. Um, one of our major uh, business segment is gaming, and uh, it's not only PC platform, but it's also console platform that we are uh, supporting. So we have our uh, special gaming products, uh, which could be uh, easily find on the Seagate.com page uh, with the uh, details. But today, uh, Rajesh will try to uh, give some information, some uh, you know, brief information about our gaming portfolio. So um, actually, Seagate is a is a company uh, which is serving to all humanity. So it it means that uh, yes, gaming is uh, one of our major uh, businesses, but uh, Seagate in is in uh, each lives you know securing the photos of your grandchildren, <laughs> videos, and also for the content creators, as uh, Ahmed may also tell about it. Uh, we are also, you know, we produce uh, quite fancy products for content creators. And also even on the streets, uh, we are also there uh, on the surveillance cameras uh, that is, you know, uh, in our daily life. Uh, for our security and also um, if you go look and uh, up in the sky you will see the clouds <laughs> there and cloud is also very special for us because uh, the data today is also uh, you know it's on the cloud as well and we are also supporting uh, that business that area so as you can see that Seagate is touching into life of every human and uh, we are here, um, 724, ready to uh, serve the all humanity, protecting their data with our technologies, like we are also rescuing their data, protecting. <laughs> and um, so perhaps Rajesh can add um, some more points on the products. Uh, thank you <laughs> for the introduction. 
Uh, thanks, Adil, and uh, thanks, uh, ITP, and uh, amazing experience to be there uh, in this uh, digital conference. So, uh, rightly, as she said, uh, we Seagate is uh, a kind of front runner in gaming, and uh, this has been spanned across decades, actually. And as we know, uh, the gaming is uh, basically an ecosystem of uh, the gamers, the game, uh, and the hardware. Uh, but it, un, but very interestingly, it doesn't stop there because off late, since uh, maybe a couple of years now, the demand for storage and uh, transfer speeds uh, are really becoming insane. And you have uh, passionate gamers, uh, like Edel mentioned, you know, you, you don't want to delete your personal uh, pictures with your uh, grandfather or your grandchildren just to make space. So there are passionate gamers who want to keep their old old uh, uh, vintage games, but also want also have the updates uh, coming on consoles. And then they are challenged by the latency and then they are challenged by the transfer speeds. And uh, Seagate has, uh, with its legacy of 40 plus years of technology, have always been a front runner and they have stepped up and much ahead of competition. And we have a range of products to cover the consoles uh, and also on the PC side, because uh, let me uh, make you aware that uh, earlier, uh, or traditionally, it is used to be a console platform. It used to be a PC platform, a mobile platform, but it doesn't stop there. The new era today is cross-platform, which means like if uh, you are playing on a console game, I am playing on a mobile platform and someone else is playing on a PC platform, the same game is being played online. So just imagine if any one of them has a problem in transfer speed, so any one of them has a problem with the storage speed, the whole experience is spoiled. And this, this is exactly where Seagate features. It's uh, extremely uh, exciting range of products, not only in external drives, but also in internal drives. Talking about external drives, of course, if I may be allowed to speak about the product in one single sitting, is that yes, we have a, a very close tie up with Xbox and PlayStation. And as a matter of fact, if Faisal will uh, uh, share with you that we have just done a, a very recent launch of The Last of Us Part Two, uh, absolutely uh, P uh, PlayStation 4 licensed on the uh, beautiful, and uh, it's a dream for any gamer. It's a dream. Believe me, having the logo uh, etched on your HDD and it's a limited edition, uh, it, it's a show of symbol. Uh, so that's on the console side. On the PC side, we have got some amazing uh, SSDs uh, at uh, transfer speeds of 5,000 uh, Mbps. I mean, insane, really. I, uh, I can't, I mean, I'm getting excited when I talk about them. So we, uh, we, have, we have covered it all for every aspect of this cross-platform. And uh, what else more you want? And we are still innovating. We have got... Uh, tremendous technological R&D investments every year and gaming, the only one thing that we, the only constant that we have in gaming is change and you expect more and more. And with that, uh, probably I uh, can conclude this uh, feature of Seagate. And Faisal? Hey, um, I also give a brief introduction to GK. And GK is like one of the top retailers in terms of gaming in the Middle East. We're located in um, Emirates, uh, Kuwait, Oman, Bahrain, and Qatar. And um, we're also looking forward to expand. So far, we have 24 operational retailers. And um, it's really great uh, uh, time for us in gaming right now, especially with the pandemic happening. Uh, with regards to Seagate. Seagate is a very interesting partner for us. Um, it's very strategic, especially right now. Uh, gaming industry is growing. And when the gaming industry grows, uh, there's a lot of gamers playing the games. And when we started, the game didn't require that much data. But as we go now and time goes by, the requirement of storage data is becoming more and more important to the gamers. So gradually, the data capacity just keeps on increasing. And uh, unfortunately, with the consoles, it's limited. Like, uh, it's uh, 500 GB or 1 TB. And now this is where Seagate comes in and plays a very big role, which is gives the opportunity for gamers to power up the gaming experience. And that perspective, that means they don't have to worry about data. And I believe Seagate is the only one that has the licensing from PlayStation. That means... PlayStation and Seagate, they work together to make the most efficient hard disk or a game drive for the gamers to use. So the data is very uh, 
transfer is very seamless when game is played and um, it's very convenient for them. They can have 50 games at one time. For a gamer, that's something that they can't imagine, you know. Uh, but right now, this is very possible. Let's see again. And uh, they also have one for uh, Xbox and they have several ones for the PC gaming. And all of them have a specified feature. So there is a specific hard disk that works for gaming. And there's another specific hard disk, I believe, that works for graphic designer. And there's a specific hard disk for those who love editing and those sort of uh, genre. And um, lately, the big highlight, I would say, is that we have an exclusive Last of Us game drive. This is like the exclusive uh, PlayStation uh, hard drive by Seagate, which is amazing. Everybody's looking forward to it. Uh, the game has one of the best ratings for PlayStation. So, yeah. So that's pretty much it for Seagate, I believe. I think uh, I use Seagate. Uh, I've been downloading my, all my games. I downloaded The Last of Us on my Seagate hard drive because it was like my my PlayStation is full with all the updates from Fortnite to Call of Duty to all the other games. Like you have Call of Duty coming to you with over 100 GB of updates, uh, over update yeah. and update and update. So you need you need something like Seagate because without it you won't be able to play or you will have to delete your own uh, i'm not going to talk only about the content creator i'm going to talk as a gamer you will have to delete other games and i i have done that before and and as a content creator i capture a lot of my footage also sometimes on my playstation not using other like uh, external like devices i will just capture everything on my playstation so so i want to have that space i want to have that one terabyte full of like capture content and I want to have on my Seagate, I want to have my own gaming, like uh, all my all my video games. That's what I've been doing. Yeah, here maybe it's also worth to mention um, the, we have been receiving questions about what is the difference between a gaming drive and uh, a, a normal external drive. So actually here um, some, you know, very specific highlights come in. For example, Faisal was mentioning about uh, the PlayStation Drive, and as you can see, it's we have the Last of Us customers drive, which means that we are working together hand on hand with PlayStation and also the game publishers here. And uh, probably soon in the market, uh, you will see Cyberpunk customized uh, drives as well. Right. which is also showing that yes. it's uh, it's not uh, you know very, uh, limited to a game but it's also you know you know you know um, hugging uh, each gamer let's say and uh, so coming to the difference for example uh, when i talk about uh, seagate uh, playstation drive it's uh, the only sony licensed drive on the world so it doesn't have any competition uh, it's one and only, actually, of its kind. And this is, uh, I think, worth mentioning. And also, um, the, the difference, the main, the, one of the other main differences is its technology. So it's plug and play, which means you don't need to waste time, uh, you know, downloading and uh, merging with your uh, console, but it's just uh, you take your drive and go to your friend, uh, and you can even play. Uh, from the drive, you don't need to download it to the, to the console, and there is no uh, performance degrees on that. So I don't know, Rajesh, maybe you have some more points to add on this, or uh, this is uh, what came to my mind <laughs> as a worth mentioning. Uh, no, you're right, Adel. I mean, console is particularly with reference to Middle East. I think traditionally, uh, console was uh, dominating the the gaming platform. But off late, you see over a, probably maybe I could say in maybe in a span of about a decade, the PC online gaming has uh, scaled up so much, and you have zillions of games coming up, and even we have a streaming platform for, for the gamers. And um, it, the challenge in PC gaming again, again is the is the transfer speed and that's where seagate features into the ssds and you know the ssds are, are the uh, fast-paced products so we have the fire cuda 
the 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 fire could uh, um, uh, SSDs with uh, with a speed of uh, almost close to 5,000 Mbps. And uh, when you play um, uh, a game like the World War II, and with all that uh, kind of uh, high level of uh, computer graphic interfaces going on, you need that kind of uh, uh, a hardware to support the transfer speed. So you are right. Not only consoles, uh, but as well as uh, uh, the 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 PC gaming online platform. So yeah, we we have covered it all. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ahmed, I really from like... your experience, uh, because you're a gamer and you're a content creator, uh, and I'm sure. I mean, you have the choice, but I believe you want something that is more reliable. And as you said, that can that. How do you think Seagate is really answering to your needs and requirements and uh, and making your activity and work and experience also uh, easier, you know? But there, because in the end, that's it. Uh, we, uh, we, we, are on the end user, uh, we are on the end user side, right? True. It's true. As, as I said, uh, I've, I've been talking as a gamer, like, uh, for the past couple of years, I've been using Seagate with me because I travel around. So sometimes I don't take and take with me like my PlayStation. I'll just take with me my drive, just log in from my own account on another PlayStation. I'll just play. It happened with Destiny before. I used to play a lot of Destiny. So I used to just take my hard drive with me and just like plug it somewhere else. And I just like take a PlayStation from a friend of mine whenever I'm traveling and just play with it. Uh, the, the beauty of plug and play is that you have everything in that. So, so it turns your digital games to physical. And and I think that's the thing that that we were missing is the is the link between having your digital games with you all the time because what happened if your console something ha bad happened to it like you will need to download and do stuff and that but with that you don't need to format your 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 hard drive because you have it as external hard drive and and I think that's the beauty with uh, with having something like uh, the the plug and play from Seagate. Uh, Idil and uh... And uh, Rajesh, you know, as you know, DGC is, is also a developers conference. So we have a lot of developers that are here and industry professionals and artists and coders and so many, you know, professions that are related to making the games. Uh, I wanted to ask you about how also can they benefit from Seagate in that sense? Idil, you want to go for it? Yeah, sure. I mean, um, just uh, I, I tried to show you, uh, and sorry for the noise I break, but uh, before I switch into that, let me also, we mentioned about uh, PlayStation, but here I want to uh, show the Xbox drives as well. And as you can see, uh, I don't know if, it's, if it is clear, but this yeah, is the Star the, Wars. The, yeah, the Star Wars team. So it's, as I was mentioning about Last of Us and Cyberpunk, I really wanted to show this beast as well. <laughs> um, so it's, um, well, as you said, uh, Habib, so and in the beginning of my, uh, you know, introduction, I was mentioning that we, we have products for the full range. So for the professional side, uh, as you mentioned, for all the artists, uh, filmmakers, content creators. Uh, on the internal PC side, we are uh, pushing our, our Iron Wolf drives. But uh, we have another call, uh, a brand called Lassie. And uh, it's uh, one of our, how to say, um, I mean, it's a beautiful product for all the uh, professional consumers that we call. And uh, for all the photographers and uh, studios uh, who are managing uh, video production in behind at the backstage, uh, we have uh, all the product range um, and with huge capacities, I must say, uh, for the external drive solution as uh, within Lassie brand. So, if uh, so, I would suggest here again uh, we have a, a separate uh, website for Lassie. And for the people, for the professionals who wonder about the brand, I strongly suggest that uh, they can check out the website 
so um, basically, if I give um, some, how to say, a very direct uh, idea on what the product uh, is giving uh, as a benefit, for example, uh, the new Lessy uh, SSDs that, that we have launched can carry uh, a two tons of truck on itself without getting damaged. So this means that uh, you know there are lots of people uh, whose who uh, whose profession is actually photography um, and uh, a lot of YouTube content creators now also. They're traveling all around the world before the corona issues, and uh, they are shooting their videos in some environments which are uh, not there, not like their houses. There is water there, and there are some, you know, conditions are hard, and uh, all all these product ranges are also uh, so strong that uh, they can survive with with their all content. So probably Ahmed can comment here, but uh, the content itself is the most precious thing for a content True. creator. So if something happens to that data, I cannot imagine how they feel actually. So uh, maybe we can talk about that part because we have also a technology called Rescue where we are saving the data, uh, we are recovering the data. So uh, for sure, uh, for uh, you, thanks for mentioning, by the way, uh, as we have these solutions for gamers, on the other side, for all the social media content creators and professional creators, uh, I believe uh, their data is their life. Uh, True. So I'm thinking that it's the health is the most important thing. Maybe that money would be the second thing. And the third thing should be data because it's their life. It's how they are, how to say, uh, managing their profession. So maybe Ahmed, you can mention here about how important your data is and it, it is uh, the like, protection. I, I'm sure like as a content creator, like uh, you will end up with a lot of like, uh, like small cards, the SD cards, then you need to copy and transfer all your files, empty all your cards and all of that. So you'll need something uh, to, to take with you uh, wherever you travel, wherever you go, maybe share it with your editors, uh, maybe to have it as a backup because sometimes you, uh, you will record like around uh, 60 hours of footage and then uh, you want to just keep them behind uh, and, and have them as a behind the scene maybe later on or you want to use them so, uh, somewhere in the like in the future so you just want to have something with you that will stay with you uh, it's the same thing with gaming you don't want to delete something so you want to have everything with you and i feel like with with the technology evolving with everything evolving in our life it's it's easier for us to keep now as much as we can uh, whether it's on the cloud whether it is on uh, the, the external hard drive and I, I i feel as a content creator is you want to just keep it in in so many different places so it will be easier for you and for your editors for your team to 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 work on your content to work on your footage uh, let's take it back a little bit to to the gaming and let's talk about uh, the biggest thing that happened to gaming in the in the in the past couple of uh, weeks, which is the reveal of the PlayStation Five and also the Xbox Series X, uh, where do we like? Where do you see uh, Seagate going with, with the next generation? What are you guys hoping for the next generation, and what are you preparing for the next generation? Uh, I may I may add over here, uh, Hemat, is that talking about the next generation, as I had started my uh, discussion, is that we uh, Seagate is always working uh, with the console manufacturers, Xbox and PlayStation, at the very initial product development stage. So obviously, we have um, a, a much advanced knowledge, uh, which of course uh, there's a level of confidentiality there, which many of us don't even know. We have uh, yes. uh, so from uh, from the next generation point 
point of view, I'm sure uh, Seagate with its uh, uh, 40 years of uh, legacy of uh, strong technological advancement is something that uh, Sony and Xbox will love to work with. And I'm sure they are already working with it. As a matter of fact, even our current uh, PS4 license drives and the Xbox license drives are even compatible with the, with the new PS5 and the Xbox uh, One X coming up. Uh, but obviously, customers want evaluation. As I said, the only constant is change. Uh, Seagate is already must be targeting uh, around that. At the moment, we uh, cannot divulge those facts. But uh, just specifically answering a question, definitely we must be already at a very advanced stage of discussion with uh, uh, these uh, uh, gaming manufacturers. Would we see the extended SSD like to match the speed of the SSD on the PlayStation? Uh, is that the future for Seagate to take that technology that you already have and just try to push it for the next console, like for the next uh, generation of consoles? So certainly, I mean, it, 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 is a, it is a raw fact that when you're talking about uh, uh, 4K videos and maybe very soon 8K videos and with the level of uh, CGI's that you have and all the gaming developers that they are incorporating, uh, the artificial intelligence is going into the, uh, the game software wherein you have a literal, maybe you have another Ahmed playing inside a, inside a game, it's online gaming. So obviously with that amount of content, you got to have uh, be ready for uh, that insane amount of speed. As a matter of fact, I think Seagate through the Fire Cuda uh, 520, which has got around uh, the read and write speed of 5,000 Mbps by 4,000 Mbps, I, th I think there is uh, yet anybody to come close to it. So we are already in that uh, next generation um, uh, stage to be ready to capture that amount of transfer data. And yes, why not? As SSDs is more and more uh, evolving, um, uh, anything is possible and i said uh, in in the line of technology uh, possibility is the is the only go to go to word uh, and, and it's good to hear that whatever we have as as a gamer from seagate like uh, whether it's on xbox or, or on playstation i can take it with me and just use it on my uh, next generation it's uh, it does something i feel i feel like will make other gamers now that, that think of upgrading and going for the next generation uh, and wanted to get like an, uh, an external hard drive will be like uh, let's say they, they will be able to buy their uh, external hard drive right now and then take it with them to the next generation. Absolutely, uh, you said it, right. Uh, let's talk more about uh, what makes Seagate like care about the gamer. I feel like it's, it's a relationship that goes both ways, right? Gamers trust Seagate because Seagate do good products and uh, Seagate do these products because they care about gamers. Uh, correctly. So, yes, we work very closely, not only with our uh, manufacturers who are making the console games or the PC games, but yes, you are right. We care for the gamers in itself because as I had started off the conversation, we have the pro gamers and the casual gamers. And the pro gamers are a league apart. And uh, you have got the esports, wherein uh, probably it's it's a profession. Uh, earlier, I remember uh, uh, I belong to the old school. We used to have three professions. You are either an engineer or a doctor or a businessman. But today, sure. if someone says that I'm a gamer, it's no yeah. longer a surprise because bro, probably they earn seven figure salaries today. So so we have two uh, clear segments of consumers today. Uh, how Seagate uh, uh, works with these consumers is as far as the pro uh, gamers are concerned, as, I've, as uh, I have already informed, we've got a, a complete range of products to match up to the demand, which is uh, extreme high level of transfer speed and uh, able to take uh, an extremely low level of uh, uh, latency so that they are not, they, they have an extremely great experience. But again, those are expensive. But how about those casual gamers who also want to be there? So we have got a mid-level and affordable SSDs, which are the SATA SSDs. SATA SSDs, of course, uh, as the, the interface goes, compromises on the speed. But casual gamers don't really are not that advanced. So those, are, those SSDs are affordable. So we are not 
striking them off completely. So we got the fire code 120 uh, SSDs, which fit into the bracket. And then we have got the gamers who are laptop gamers. So you know, you are, you've got lots of laptops, uh, ASUS, for example. So, but again, a laptop has a maximum of one terabyte of capacity. Uh, we have got a, a fire, uh, uh, the Seagate uh, gaming dock, an absolutely brand new product with Thunderbolt interfaces, which clearly uh, takes care about that uh, immense amount of transfer speed and multiple interfaces. So you can connect a keyboard, you can connect a mouse. It's even got an ethernet port. So you can connect a laptop to a high traffic, uh, I mean, high uh, volume uh, ethernet cable. So that gaming experience can come even to your laptop. So if so, answering your question, we have got it covered all so that everybody is happy. And uh, of course, a gamer like me who is happy with a Pac-Man uh, playing on a computer is uh, more than happy. <laughs> so <laughs> yes, we got it covered all, uh, Emma. Uh, that's good to hear. That's good to hear. Habib, back to you. So my my team uh, is now saying that we are uh, out of time, and as you know, we are live, so we have we have a, 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 another session waiting for us. Thank you, Seagate, for everything you're doing for the gamers, for the content creators, and uh, thank you, Ahmad, for joining us from home. I, I know that you you did you were not in. <laughs> Feeling very well, but you still made it. Thank you for being here. And uh, as I said, it's just for the experience. I wanted to to end yeah. my DGC experience by having side, that yeah. Zoom call. <laughs> but Ahmad, you're always on the other side. <laughs> <That's great. laughs> so you are on the other side, and Seagate takes everything you do on the inside, on their data, <laughs> on their cloud. And, uh, and we've all had that terrible experience of, you know, losing our data or our hard drive or our hard disk crashing. And really, it's, it's really, it's not only frustrating, it's just that all your work is gone, all your memories are gone, everything you have done is gone. And there's, it's very hard for, uh, for us to uh, get that back. But Seagate apparently found also a way to do it and to have more security on this. So. Let's keep on creating. Let's keep on having uh, more uh, uh, also innovation from Seagate. And let's keep on getting the best experience to the gamers and powering up the experience. It's, uh, it's just what we need, actually. Thank you very much. And I uh, was very happy to host you in DGC Live. And we hope to see you again very soon. Yeah, thank, thank you, you Ahmed. Uh, thank you, Habib. Yeah. Thank you all. Really thank you, Habib yeah. and Ahmed. Cheers. Uh, and by the way, I just forgot to say something, is that Ahmad will be doing something on his channel for and giving away. What will you be giving away? <laughs> the last of us, uh, it hard drive for PlayStation. Limited edition. So, and this is exclusive to, to Ahmad and his, uh, his followers. And, th and thank you, Geeky, for, uh, for this and Seagate as well. Yes, we and, would like uh, to... Yeah, when thanks, when you know the winners, let us support. know, and we will be more than happy to, to announce it also. Goodbye. <laughs>
uh, about the actual gamification uh, and what we call serious gaming, which is the application of game design and development within the education. So in order to reform education through game. Uh, so these are the two different aspects. They're completely different angles uh, of the same subject, but they fall under the uh, umbrella of um, education and gaming, as, as I believe. And uh, I think also, judging from the logistics, we're going to have in two stages the session. One is with our uh, panelists right now. Ahmad is from SAE. Uh, and as you introduced the other two uh, gentlemen uh, Robert and Arif. Online, yes. Robert and Robert Arif. from Kids Clever and, and Arif then, from MBC. And I think uh, stage two, uh, we will uh, be having a uh, another uh, yeah. dialogue with uh, with, a, with a, another yes. panelist. Uh, of course, will be joining we, we are going to have more sessions on education and games. Uh, so for today, yeah. Uh, so for for yeah. for me for today, my, my first uh, uh, I think uh, area that we and obviously then most of our panelists have have very good experience in starting up uh, mm. education uh, game uh, games in the region. So I wanted to to get a feel of what do they consider uh, the uh, what is intriguing about the regional market for for the gaming industry. What makes them get into it, invest in it. And at the same time, what they consider to be the biggest barriers to entry. Uh, so mm -hmm. if you can maybe touch some light upon this, and maybe, Robert, you can kick us off uh, with, this, uh, with this discussion, and then everybody will, uh, will have a say on that point. And then that will lead us to maybe, hopefully, what the other points we'll be discussing. Robert, you want to shed some okay. light on, on the biggest barriers to entry and, or what, what got you into it in the first place? OK. Thanks, Fadi. Thanks, Harid. Thanks, everybody. Um, I'd like to talk, well, first of all, in the Arab market for, uh, for uh, learning, digital learning content, the market is, is, uh, is still the virgin, so to speak. There's, there's not enough content uh, around today across, uh, you know, across all ages. Um, also, we feel that interactive learning or um, how do you say, uh, achievement-based learning, it's the future of learning. We see today that there's a lot of, in learning you have a lot of, uh, how do you say, emphasis on uh, uh, um, memory, memorizing content, uh, learning to remember history, uh, books, etc. We see the world today uh, turning towards uh, goal-based uh, uh, learning and achievement-based learning. So. Uh, and of, of course, in the digital, and that and that moves uh, that that a lot of that is is happening in the digital realm. So, um, so there are two points in mainly for the Arab market is that there's a there's not enough learning content, uh, modern contemporary digital learning content, and also with an emphasis towards uh, achievement based learning or goal goal based task based uh, learning. There is uh, this is the future of learning we believe. So that's why we've moved into this space. So that's the opportunity, in terms yeah, of the barriers true. that you've seen so far. Excuse me. The biggest barriers to, to entry. The barriers. The okay. So the barriers. <clears throat> so you have to, uh, if you're a startup, you need to be quite resourceful, resourceful in terms of talent. You mentioned that at the beginning. So you need coders and uh, and uh, artists and uh, uh, voiceovers and singers and or maybe animators and so on. So it's you know you've got the multimedia. Um, uh, you need a multimedia uh, I say team who's able to put, uh, to come together to produce all of that and uh, then once you have all the, all of that ready then you've got to uh, uh, discover your right channels because the channels for uh, ed edutainment or educational type content are many and to monetize straight away finding those channels aren't easy it takes you a lot of time um, so uh, that's a, the, you know the, there's two steps. So you need the right team, and of course you need to uh, find out which of the monetization or monetization channels you will be focusing on. You can't focus on them all as a startup. You need a lot. You need a lot of money and resources to do that. So you've got to pick pick yours. Will, will you be working for government producing uh, classroom content? Will you be, let's say, uh, working, uh, providing the content yourself directly to consumers? Will you go for edutainment, uh, i.e., apps and so on in the market? Those three, so those three different uh, channels are, are, are entirely different. 
for you to have the resources as a developer to uh, to uh, enter these markets, you need uh, you need to be you need a lot of money basically. So you need to pick wisely, get as much information you can as from uh, from your channels as possible, and uh, and uh, get uh, you know uh, arrive at a monetization as quickly as possible, so that you can prosper and grow your company. That's good. And uh, Arif, I, I know we've been chatting around uh, this topic uh, earlier. And while Robert covered very well the opportunity and barriers specifically within the um, education-related gaming uh, part of the industry, I, I, I know you have some uh, views about opportunities as well as barriers when it comes to the overall gaming industry as a whole, uh, ed education gaming being part of it. Uh, so you want to shed some light on that as well? Sure. I think uh, Robert covered it very nicely. Uh, the two major points that uh, he made was the rush to monetize. Um, and I think this is, uh, I, I'll only add one point to this particular point, uh, which is the culture that we live in. You know, the parents always want you to go to work quickly, uh, start making money quickly, start uh, growing up the ladder in corporate very quickly, which is also not helping in the sense that you need to be making uh, very good money from the beginning uh, to, uh, to, to make a successful game. But you come and see that there are a lot of independent uh, publishers of games, and there are a lot of other publishers of games that are independent. The reason they're not developing AAA games is, one, the need to monetize, as Robert was mentioning. Uh, two, because there's not enough collaboration, and this takes a lot of investment. This takes about two or three years before you can launch that game of being offline, before you can actually launch a AAA game, uh, which is why we still import our games from, uh, from China, from, from the US, and we Arabize them. And when we Arabize them, they do super well. So there is still this gap that exists between uh, stopping the, not necessarily stopping the import, but stopping this practice of uh, uh, Arabizing international games and realizing that realizing that you can actually do it ourselves in this region and publish it under our banner. Yeah, and I, and I think this uh, this applies. Actually, it has a much wider scope related to the culture uh, that that prevails uh, in most of the uh, so to speak third world uh, countries and the Arab world is one of them. Is we we tend to grow to become more consumers. Uh, so we're a consumer society rather than creators of knowledge. And this is what I think what, what you're driving at is that transition from consuming to creating knowledge does take time. Right. So that means every game you want to create, you have to take an entrepreneurial appro approach, entrepreneurial approach to, right. to every single game creation. Uh, and I think both of you touched upon a, an important aspect of it, which is talent and the availability of that talent from both aspects. One is from that talent skills readiness, uh, so readiness of the talent from, from the skill sets, and I think this, this is a good segue to get to Ahmed's view on this, as well as the, uh, the availability of talent taking on this challenge due to the cultural uh, taboos or barriers of, or, of uh, entry or making money fast. So study business, work uh, in a bank, uh, get, get employed quickly, that's your route when you want to choose your career versus you no know, suffer for a few years, put that. You know, so that's, that's, again, part of the cultural uh, uh, resistance we get. So maybe it's a good segue to, with, with Ahmed to shed some light on the overall, how do we educate talent? How do we groom talent? How do we make sure talent is ready from a skill set perspective, as well as how do we overcome cultural barriers? Uh, so I know at SAE, uh, where, where you lead uh, uh, the games development uh, division, uh, you come across a lot of these challenges. So yeah. maybe we can shed um, some light on that. Yes, well, I mean, as a, as a, as a head of the games development uh, department, I, I actually see a lot of talents in the region. A lot of, I even see a lot of people who ha are multi-talented. So people who can do 3D modeling and do programming at the same time. Do people who are interested in music and can do programming. And this kind of people are uh, quite rare and, and they are a great material for uh, game development. Um, the only main issues that I find is kind of the experience because all of them when they graduate um, they are quite young and they are they have good knowledge a good amount of knowledge they have good amount of skills but then they don't have the the years-long experience that you usually would get or you would find somewhere else 
uh, in the region. So uh, this is this is actually something that we, uh, as a community or as people who are interested in the industry and the growing the industry in this region, we should try to focus on. Um, and I, I can see that there are multiple sources of information. So if, if there is someone who has talent who is interested in game development, he can have a lot of uh, ways where he can make himself prepared and ready uh, for this industry. Uh, one of them, of course, is just learning online, self-taught. But that's, that doesn't uh, guarantee to have uh, a whole uh, flow of sequence or cover all the topics that you, uh, that you need. So there is another option, which is university, like, uh, like ourselves. Uh, there is uh, other fields as well that you can start from. And the one thing about the game development is that it's actually, it can incorporate a lot of fields. So a lot of people who start with graphic design and they can we try always to uh, make to improve to uh, connect with the industry uh, stakeholders in the region uh, starting from uh, UAE and maybe we can um, try to reach the DC countries all the DC countries all the Middle East countries uh, to basically uh, grow a community and then focus on connecting the people with experience to the uh, fresh skills the fresh talented people who exist but don't find a lot of people who can guide them. Um, so this is, this is uh, I believe, an opportunity because, as you said, Fadi, it's, there is a lot of consumers here, a lot of consumers in the region. We consume a lot of games. We, we play a lot of games. We all love them. And we all are ready to pay to, uh, to get a game or to, to pay more in, inside the game. That's, that's, that's great, but then we don't really produce anything out of this love and out of this passion that we have. It's, it's good. I think uh, on this point, so if I were to summarize what, what probably uh, uh, what you're saying in one sentence is the biggest, one of the biggest obstacles you see as you groom talent and upskill them is to accompany that grooming and upskilling with practical application of the knowledge that they are learning. And maybe, uh, maybe it's, a, it's a good, uh, again, a segue here to, with Robert, you can tell us, because I think this is one of the elements you picked on to, uh, to launch uh, Global Share. Uh, where it actually creates a platform to connect, connecting talent with, with projects where, where their talents are needed, if I understand it correctly. So wanna maybe uh, uh, tell us a little bit more about this, uh, this challenge and how we think we are addressing it in the region. Okay. Yeah, so um, there, you know, helping students get from the classroom into jobs uh, in the gaming industry there is a there is a, a bridge gap missing, definitely, uh, and uh, in fact, I'm I'm aware there's a there's a number of companies emerging which are helping students make that transition from university to jobs, especially in the, especially in the IT industry, but not such for the gaming industry. It would be worth looking at, I think. So yeah, I think uh, there you know the. Uh, DGC, thanks to DGC, there is a, now a game community in the Middle East. And I think uh, community is really everything when it comes to working with one another. So we, knowing and, and contacting and meet and networking is, uh, is, is vital. So uh, I think internships would help students get from the classroom into, into the correct jobs. So if uh, DGC could help us uh, link up with students or SEA institutes, uh, companies like us, link up with students for internships. That way we can, uh, we can help grow both the companies and uh, help the students uh, transition from the classroom to the, uh, to the to, uh, you know, commercial uh, experiences. Uh, on another note, we have a platform uh, as well called Globashare. Uh, it's one of our companies. We're a marketplace for selling work skills and knowledge and IP. And uh, your students on SEA, uh, uh, SEA are welcome to join our platform uh, to, uh, to offer their uh, uh, knowledge skills and uh, personal IP for sale. And we also find buyers for, for them. So uh, we'd, we're, we're playing a, a part in that, uh, in that bridge as well. That's great. Uh, you know, to say something uh, actually, we've been hearing <coughs> the same thing uh, over the past three days, which is how to shed more light on what's happening in the gaming industry in our region. Of course, DGC is such a platform, but then again, the frequency of the show and how it, uh, it cannot happen every day. But 
we don't know what's happening all the time in our region in the gaming industry. We don't know the needs of this company in this country, this uh, institution here, or this organization there, or this new studio coming in maybe to, uh, to establish here. So uh, what, what Robbie just said, and I've, I think what we've, been, what we've been hearing a lot during the, these three days, is that putting more light, communicating more, and understanding more who is who in the industry and what are the needs here and there is very important. Now, for example, one, of course, one, uh, one solution would be Global Share, one another solution would be to keep on networking on the DGC platform, uh, ha having more DGCs, having more media, having more communication, having more uh, communication between the people that meet each other and sharing more knowledge uh, and we have seen that model succeed in other parts of the world. Uh, we have exactly. seen it succeed in many exactly, parts yeah. of the world uh, because of the community. In the end, the community is the base of an ecosystem. Yeah. And so we need a tightly knit community. They need a uh, community uh, that needs to communicate more. Yes. You know, that, that's the whole point. And then we know more, and then we there is more news. There is more. Even at DGC, sometimes. I learned after a few months that this deal was signed during DGC, you know, uh, and, and I don't know, I, I know about it after, you know, which, which if we know it at the same time, we have all the setup to, to blow it up and just make it news, you know. Exactly. So, yeah, I believe what, what Robert is saying is, is this uh, also, and I think what you guys are saying as well. Uh, Arif, uh, uh, maybe Fadi, you had one more question because yes, because uh, I think we need to, to wrap up. Uh, this is we're we're wrapping up part one. Part one, and then we will we'll have, we'll have we another, have a part two. Yeah, part two. Uh, okay. So I just wanted one one area that I think we haven't touched upon that does I think directly link to growing the gaming market in our region is related to IP uh, and copyrights, and I think. You know, uh, one of the biggest barriers across any content uh, published, whether it is software industry in the in the past, you know, in general, the software development, uh, in uh, in terms of even uh, uh, content publishing as a whole, uh, books, what have you, is uh, in in most of the countries in the Arab world or in the in the MENA region, is the disregard to IP and copyright, and that always creates a barrier to growing the market. Uh, any thought? Any last thoughts on this? Very quickly before we wrap up, and I can summarize what we've uh, what we've talked about today. Uh, yeah, I can pop in on that if you like. Yeah, please go ahead, Robert. Yeah, uh, following what uh, Arif said and what you said now about uh, importing content, um, the in the Arab market um, there is it seems to be a lack of confidence in producing local IP. Um, I think the teachers have to, of, of students, have to put more emphasis on critical thought or on, uh, um, how do you say, uh, learning about, uh, you know, uh, other IP throughout the world and the history of art and the history of communication. If, you, if we share and impart this knowledge more, the lo we in the Arab market will become more critical of ourselves and be able to produce more original content. We lack confidence in this market. Maybe it's because we haven't been doing it for too long. But uh, with emphasis on critical, uh, uh, on, on criti on critical thought, uh, we, we will have the confidence to achieve and create our own IP. This is very important. Uh, IP uh, is the basis of wealth in the world at the moment. If you talk to Netflix, they produce their own content now. They see that because of the uh, many other um, companies that are emerging offering video that they have to produce their own IP to stay in business. If you talk to games, uh, traditional toy companies, they, they, their emphasis is on owning the characters and their brands and uh, outsourcing manufacturing and merchandising to other companies. So the value of, of of the future of work is in the creation of IP and uh, the local region must look very seriously at, at this if it is to compete or stand a chance of competing at all in the future of work. Yeah, 
Yeah, that's good. I mean, I probably uh, what, what I was referring to more about not the not the motivation to to have the to understand the value of IP and uh, creating content, but how to protect it. And I think the lack of confidence in their ability to protect their IP in a lot of the countries. I mean, some we've gone a long way. If I if I look at back the back the last 15 years of how countries around the region have dealt with IP protection and the seriousness of it, I think we've gone far miles miles from where we were 10 or 15 years ago but i think you know i uh, copyright laws have been uh, been in place for a long time in many of the countries but have now been enforced in most of the countries so that i think uh, what, as this goes in parallel it will create more confidence in in investment also because i think one of the areas you've mentioned is lack of good investment in creating content because that requires i think uh, Arif, you touched upon this uh, subject specifically uh, is uh, to create these triple A games, there needs to be backing behind it, investment, and investment is usually uh, uh, very, uh, very c cautious about. Yeah, no, on that I'd like point. to add one point. Yeah, yeah, yeah go ahead, Arif. Uh, when it comes to IP, especially in this region that generally lags a little behind uh, the rest of the world, you can't find uh, uh, broadcasting stations like ourselves, like NBC, for example. And I'm not speaking on behalf of NBC, I'm just giving it as an example. But you will find that as uh, uh, the audience or the mass tends towards the apps and the games and all of that, there will be a higher appetite for companies like NBC to license out that IP, to create that protective bubble, if you want, to the developer to come and develop these games for, uh, uh, for the audience that exists here. It would be... It could be, I'm not saying it would, it could be uh, a revenue share model or it could be something where we license out elements of a particular game show for the audience to play offline when it's not on TV. So that goes both ways. There is a lack of, prote of protection in general when it comes to IP, not just in this region, but in the entire world. But it also works both ways if the ecosystem finds a way of collaborating with each other. Yeah. Because again, it is an ecosystem and each one has to do their part. So there is within this huge eco ecosystem, as it continues to grow, you will find all the elements that you need to succeed. Yes, and there are proven workarounds as well for, for protecting IPs in different other industries other than gaming. Good. I think we've, we've reached the, the time. We need for, to wrap it up. So, uh, for part one. I, which yes, was, uh, which and I, I want to thank yeah. uh, Robert, uh, Arif, and Ahmad thank for you. their uh, contribution. Uh, very valuable. Um, and I think part two will... Uh, part two will, will focus more on esports, esports academies, and uh, education in esports, which is... Yes, and then thing. at the end of part two, we can wrap everything uh, up sure. and create for a summary. Sure. Great, thank you. For, thank you. Thank you, everyone, thank you. for thank your you. participation. Thank you all. So we're back with a really interesting uh, discussion now uh, with Dr. Sana Farid and Ahmad. Uh, both of them are part of the IN5 cluster here in Dubai, and uh, they are playing uh, part of this cluster, a great role in uh, many different areas that are relevant not only to the gaming industry, but to technology and creativity in, in, uh, in general. So I will let you just briefly introduce yourselves and then we can pick up the discussion over the ecosystem, facilities, the opportunities that are presented to uh, young talents in Dubai. Dr. Sana? I'll, I'll, I'll ask Dr. Sana first, ladies first, so let's go. Thank you, Habib. Uh, I'm a general surgeon by profession, and I widened my expertise to involve in immersive training for healthcare industry. This is how I started. So it, what that means is that I started working on using immersive technologies, that is including virtual reality, augmented reality, game-based learning for the purpose of training. This has helped us, or in general, these technologies are helping us to reach to a larger number of learners across any industry and help them train better in an interactive environment. 
So eventually they will be learning faster, learning more practically. These are the es essential things that are needed in any training environment. So end of the day, we will have better results and better uh, services. Ahmed, from your end. Yep, first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, my story is a, is a tad bit different. I'm, uh, I'm actually a civil engineer who switched into game development eventually. And uh, since we're speaking about generally the ecosystem here in the UAE, like it's, it's basically the best way to mention it. It's like a desert with a really nice oasis in the center of it. There is a lot of potential, but it's all hidden. And I definitely believe that if it is supported correctly, if it is taught the right path correctly and it's guided, we can have a huge future for it, definitely. Uh, but both of you are part of a cluster that is offering a lot for the young talents. And uh, so this is unique in the region for uh, to be able to have uh, a platform, a cluster, and an ecosystem of different talents that allow you to grow your company, your ideas, and also your go-to-market strategy. Uh, so how do you feel, uh, as you said, being in that oasis, did that help you move faster? Did that help you uh, also have better chances to go from your idea stage to an execution and having a startup? Uh, Dr. Sana, I believe uh, you are also handling many uh, other aspects of development related to VR and uh, how, do you, how did the, the, the cluster, the ecosystem, facilitate things for you and your, uh, the other companies you are dealing with? Okay, a very good question and very important. It's actually uh, an essential question when it comes about the way we work and how do we continue being productive. Uh, myself and Ahmed, we are both uh, examples of people who are coming from very different industries. One is from healthcare and one is an engineer. Whenever we have an idea which is coming out of passion, it's definitely addressed to some of the challenges that are already there. Uh, many of the challenges are from a long, long time. And very often the solution for that is always immersive or interactive or modern technology technology of the fourth industrial revolution. And this is what uh, entrepreneurs are working on, especially entrepreneurs and startups, because they come out of the regular conventional job system and they want to do something on their own. How are they going to get connected with industries, with governments, with uh, companies around the world? This is the job of the accelerator. Uh, how we are doing it at N5, or the kind of support that we're receiving is that we have an extensive network of events, of activities, of meetups, of uh, um, counselors and advisors who are there to support us every step of the way. Uh, whether it's con con uh, concerned with financials, with uh, product-related uh, challenges. So this is how um, business accelerators collaborate with startups and entrepreneurs to bring up an innovative idea. And thankfully, uh, Ahmed stated very beautifully that this is kind of an oasis. We have seen multiple uh, success businesses in the past few years coming out of here. So it, it shows a lot of hope for all of us who are uh, becoming entrepreneurs. So Ahmed, you are a gaming studio part of N5 today. Uh, yeah. When you uh, uh, applied for the, for the residency at N5, uh, did they welcome the idea that you're a game studio? And how are they able to today uh, help you with uh, reaching your objectives as a game studio? Be I'm saying this, you know, uh, because I know that they are dedicated to startups and they are doing a great job, but gaming is not an easy, uh, type of startups, you know, it's like sometimes yeah, as they yeah, say, it's like digging for oil. You never know if you're going to find some, you know, so can Basically. you tell us more about your experience and, and how it was? Well, honestly speaking from my personal experience with N5, what I really like about them is that they have a really nice filtration process 
where I wouldn't say the good ideas and the bad ideas are filtered, but the well-structured ideas and the still growing ideas get filtered before you are entering, before you enter the incubation process. Just to put it for example, my summarizing my journey, started as a civil engineer, worked a uh, civil engineer for four or five years. During that time, I started learning game developing it and growing it. And something clicked and I knew that this is what I want to do. So during these, this period of years, I started to grow my talent and my resources and my knowledge and all these things. Now, let's jump a year and a half ago, for, for example, I applied for N5 and I got rejected. That's the first time. And then I applied again after a couple of months and got rejected. At, and when that happens, you naturally, as a human, you feel angry and frustrated. Like, no, they didn't know what they're doing. Why did they reject me? They don't believe in gaming. But after a while, after I like reconsidered and thought about it again and again, my plan had a problem with it. Because as you said, gaming is basically <laughs> like a hit, searching for gold. And here in the Middle East, it's like, I, I don't know how to put it, but like searching for gold in the ocean. <laughs> because it's a very new field that not a lot of people know about. Not a lot of companies know about. Incubator are still a bit hesitant when it comes to gaming companies. And that's why what I did was convert my ideas from, uh, from just saying that I'm a game development studio to becoming a virtual reality and game development studio. This way, I incorporated my idea and my company in something that is a bit more well-structured when it comes to virtual reality uh, experiences and virtual reality training, and game development is attached to it. This way, my idea of game development didn't uh, stop from being like a gold search in the ocean and turned into something with a bit of a pavement. We will understand VR and training and simulations and these type of things. And if you think about it, virtual reality and game development are literally like, like this. They're intertwined completely. Because the, the only difference between a virtual reality game and a virtual reality experience training simulator is the how the content is arranged. But how it's made, it's almost the same concept. I'm no. really interested uh, to know more about the type of content you are producing and uh, is it more around gamifications or is it location-based entertainment? Uh, how are you using VR in games? It is actually a mixture right now what I'm doing in my company. I have like, you can call it like two branches. The first branch is the international branch where I focus more on uh, entertainment, like... The best way to put it, I focus more on uh, well-built content for entertainment. Uh, by this, I mean something that when the player plays, they can experience something. They can experience enjoyment, sadness. They can experience the story. So what I build in that branch of the company is games that are supposed to be released to the international market. One of the, one of the two big uh, titles I'm working on is called Bloodhound. And uh, the other title is called Shadow Dreams. One of them is a VR uh, game. The other branch of the company, which is more for local content and uh, simulations and training, is basically virtual reality that is used for the good of the client that hires me. For example, I did a project for Dubai Shopping Festival in Emirates Mall like, at the end of last year, where basically the customers come in, if they have a voucher, they try the game, and if they win, they get another voucher. They play a virtual reality game where they have to grab like shopping bags and stuff like that and get... Uh, some sort of like experience and coupons, blah, blah, blah. But uh, so basically this is how virtual reality is mixed with game development to create a company that does both at the same time, which is in my opinion, very possible. And I believe Dr. Sana, you are pretty much involved as well in gamification uh, using VR. And also in, edu in educational VR using edutainment and also integrated games into, into, uh, into VR. Uh, how do you see the response of the market towards these new ideas that you are actually offering? So as per uh, my work, I would say we are focusing more on serious gaming and game-based learning. As a company or as an entrepreneur, we have focused our um, direction towards using interactive immersive technologies including gaming including virtual reality towards education and training as i mentioned so for that of course this is something that most of the people are seeing for the first time around the world not just here 
except some of the gamers uh, in this field have already have experience about it. But the majority, if we talk about corporate, if we talk about the school system, the universities, for them, it's a first time experience. So just like any other thing in, in life or in the world, the first time you experience something, there is a lot of hesitance, reluctancy, especially when we're talking about education or healthcare. People are not open to the idea of experiencing something new when it's related to their healthcare or education. So the first step is always building awareness. And this is something that we actually spent about two years time only on building awareness. Building awareness means just like um, a, a nice example shared by Ahmed now, having an easy experience somewhere in the mall. It could be a game. Uh, we have done similar experiments earlier, but it was involving some educational elements. For example, performing a CPR to save a life, which is done in a public area, in airports, in shopping malls, or even in the primary healthcare center, where people are actually spending a lot of time in the waiting area. People are spending time being idle or just roaming around giving them a small hint of a taste of an immersive experience lets them believe that this technology can be used for something uh, beneficial or educational. And then slowly, it's the snowball effect that uh, they are more open to the idea. The next time when they hear about it in the news or they hear about it from different conferences, their mind opens a bit more. So it has been a journey. I think we have been in... Uh, very actively using VR and AR since about four to five years or six years now. So people today, compared to, let's say, three years back, they're more open to the idea. The only thing that they need to have uh, the questions answered correctly when it's related to wearable devices. They are concerned about the health and safety. And, and, and nowadays time, they're concerned about the hygiene and the sanitation of the devices that they're using, especially if they're wearable. So once you answer all these questions correctly, the response is amazing. So I'm, I'm very interested to know also, uh, like about again, once you have all of this established, how is, is IN5 also helping you uh, expand or reach uh, into the client base? and grow your business? So in five being um, an accelerator and integrator, I also call them a supporter. In five uh, is always connected with both ends. One is the startups. On the other hand, they're connected with organizations that includes government and private. So they're in constant awareness of what are the opportunities. Uh, opportunities can come in multiple shapes, whether it's, uh, let's say, a competition rising up, or it's um, a requirement from a certain entity, or if it's a conference or um, a seminar type of a thing. So whenever there is a, such type of an opportunity at N5, it opens the door for all of the startups and we get to know about them. And this is, again, where the filtration process happens when IN5 identifies that startup ABC or startup XYZ could be potentially uh, beneficial in this type of a project, that is when they do the linking. So previously, we have had some amazing uh, programs related to space uh, education. We've had some programs related to healthcare. And it's also the other way around. Us as startups, if we identify a certain area that we need help in, for example, I have a program and I need some connections or some introduction in hospitals or Ministry of Health, I can go back to my uh, supporters at N5 and tell them my requirements. And it's just a lot of uh, support that we receive from them. So we, we have a constant feeling that we're not alone. If I need some help, probably they can help me. That's, uh, that's really uh, interesting because you got, you, both of your companies uh, are doing projects and doing well. And uh, it's, it's a really great opportunity for the young generation in the UAE also to uh, make their dreams come true and uh, to use all of these facilities that exist and support systems 
as you are saying, in accelerators. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's really a great advantage. Uh, and uh, we know also that our uh, communities here and society is pretty much tech savvy and ap appreciating of everything that is in innovation and futuristic uh, plans and uh, aspects. I would want to conclude with uh, one more question. Uh, you are now the next ones who will be maybe investing in the next company or maybe uh, mentoring the next uh, generations as well. So how do you see this, this role, uh, this empowerment, and do you believe that this will also help uh, to grow our fields, whether it is VR, gaming, uh, or, or a mix of both with gamification, serious games, and other applications? How do you see yourself positioned today to maybe help others as well? Yeah, if I may add, uh, when it comes to uh, the question about N5 and how they helped us, uh, just one point. Uh, Dr. Sana said this, that this is not a hobby anymore. And for us to transition from a hobbyist to a professionalist, we need an infrastructure for the company. We need an infrastructure for who we are. I can't introduce myself as a game developer if I'm out of a job and I don't have, I'm on a visit visa, for example, without health insurance, which was the case for quite a while. So it, it helps us. Uh, build that infrastructure that we can grow on. Now, just to note that we are, or the entrepreneurs are going to have to do the heavy lifting. That's 100% for sure in all the industries and all the incubators everywhere. You are going to do the heavy lifting of working and growing your idea. That's, that's, that's 100%. But when it comes to them, they help with the infrastructure. They help with the facilities. Uh, for example, when speaking about... Sorry about that. Uh -huh. Uh, when we're speaking about uh, the game development industry and how they are helping me, for example, right now my office is located in the N5 Media Building. Right there, there are uh, about two or three audio recording rooms. There's a green room, there's a large studio room where I do my motion capture recording, where I do my voice acting, where I bring my actors, my clients, to whoever it is. I can show them all of these facilities as if they are mine. So that boosts my credibility a lot compared to a developer who works in the bedroom. So that's, that's how they help. And when it comes to your second question, uh, how do we see the future? How do we see this, this whole infrastructure, this whole ecosystem growing with us in it? I believe that there's going to be a huge change in the future. Right now, for example, I'm, uh, I have a part-time job where I teach game design to uh, bachelor, uh, bachelor degree students with game development in the SAE Institute of Dubai. And I can see there's a lot of bright minds that are actually majoring in game development. This almost didn't exist a few years ago. So with us helping people out, paving the path by digging through, making the mistakes and learning from these mistakes, if we share our knowledge, the future is very bright for the game development industry here in the UAE. If we stick together and grow together. That's my... That's, that's my the statement. ecosystem mentality, I believe, and the real entrepreneurship mentality. And you were mentioning SAE. SAE are also our partner in this conference. And also with N5, we did uh, uh, participate to the, to the prizes of the N5 and SAE Institute uh, Game Jam that happened here in the UAE. Yeah, yeah I, I was there, I remember. Is, this is how we all work together. And with SAE, we're also working closely in terms of the coding and uh, game and other competitions as well. Uh, so I believe that uh, Dr. Sana, maybe also, I know that you're pretty much involved with the community. Uh, how do you see your role now that you have realized part of your dream, you have your own uh, activities? How do you see your role in mentoring now uh, the rest uh, of the, gener the generation coming uh, and helping them reach their own dreams as well? Yes, yeah, so since I have uh, belonging to a, a very different uh, career path and I have emerged to a completely different uh, path, I really consider it my responsibility to share the message because I personally have shared a lot of, uh, have had uh, a lot of challenges in the beginning that hindered my progress. However, you need to understand how to overcome and move forward. Why do we even need to talk about moving forward and talking about new technologies? Because the world is changing. Now, we have all seen this in the past six months, but in general, we 
all realize that the world is literally changing. We have a lot of artificial intelligence now and people are literally threatened by what is going to happen to the future of jobs in every industry, whether they're teachers, bankers, uh, shopkeepers, etc., retail industry, um, gaming uh, industry, etc. So for me, the, the best message for any, um, any youngster or any person who wants to work is to keep their mind open. Keep their mind open to whatever the change is happening. I have seen a potential in immersive technologies. I opened my mind and collaborated with some people to establish this company. However, in the future, when we have a different uh, technology, something that we might not even know about today, I think we all should just be very open-minded and embrace the change that the world is giving us. Um, we cannot always, I hear a lot of people complaining about technology, you know, complaining about their kids always playing and so on. Well, I always try to take the best out of everything because you do see a positive thing out of everything. It's just how you shape it. So I think the message uh, for me is there are always people who are ready to support you, to mentor you. You will not be able to find them if you don't take a step forward. Take one step forward and you will see many doors open for you. And uh, just to stay positive and stay um, motivated to your goal and dedicated to achieve what you want to achieve. I do agree with both of you. And uh, we have played also that role at DGC in uh, creating a platform to, to, for this step forward, you know, also as well. And, uh, and during uh, DGC Live, we are giving free access to all the developers, so to the B2B meeting platform, so that they can actually uh, go and create a profile, put demos over there, and get in touch with, uh, with other companies. And, uh, and this also is a, it, it can help also in, uh, in uh, ha having their business grow. And uh, I believe sharing expertise also through these these conferences and talks also and uh, shedding the light on the companies also help in, in that sense. We thank you very much. We are uh, out, of, uh, out of time. Uh, it was really exciting to talk You're to both of welcome. you. And uh, we hope to, to see you again very soon and good luck with your future projects. And we hope to hear about it uh, also very soon. <laughs>
will there be one big company who owns everything or there will be multiple different companies how it will be distributed i do not know answers to those questions i believe if all goes well it will look more like the internet today where, it, where there are shared set of protocols and standards but everyone can build their own piece and users have a lot of ability to choose it's clear it's very very clear that today we are in a very early stage when when i think of a metaverse i think of a three main components i i think of an idea that there are other people there are other people you are interacting with as opposed to ai characters that are part of the narrative so essentially it is a social product the other part of the metaverse that's compelling is that people would be willing to add and create a lot of different types of content there and third the big part it is just the concept of a persistent identity you carry around part of the metaverse idea is that you spend as much time there as in real life so as i said before we are far from the metaverse vision that i described earlier but it's still very important to understand where can we see the next set of social products one of the easiest ways to pick out the next set of social products is to look what young people are using and it's gaming people are playing games more than ever given the social nature of games today the next generation of games will be much much bigger than anything we've seen yet while the current successes like Roblox and Fortnite can reach 100 million monthly active users those new MMOs will be able to strive for say, Facebook scale because games are becoming the way kids communicate these days games are the new social networks kids under 13 are spending more time playing and socializing in Roblox than on Facebook YouTube Netflix combined just think about it for a moment. Fortnite has similar statistics and even larger user base compared to Roblox. When playing Fortnite, you will realize quite quickly that those kids are not that concerned about the game at all. They seem more preoccupied with catching up or sharing the latest about their day. Those platforms have become a digital hangout places for the new generation much like basketball courts and skate parks were for the previous ones hanging out on a basketball court was never only about the game i remember spending hours on a basketball court with my friends just talking it was always about spending time with my friends and socializing some having some sort of activity to gather around today my 11 year old niece doesn't meet up with her friends on a basketball court but she does it online in a fortnite server also she has friends worldwide from canada russia and so on when i was her age i was lucky if i managed to make a friend with a kid across my street games are connecting people across the world and providing a safe place to hang out and socialize you quickly see that if you are a kid one of the one of the first things you do is spend all your time playing games with your friends you use it like a social network you hang out with your friends there you talk with them there you build your persistent identity there you might play fortnite minecraft fortnite uh, roblox and all of those other games for years before you're allowed to have a social network account even though that's really your social network 
there are many games right now that are metaverse aspirants and they're usually you know that the basis is usually shooter but the typical shooter like call of duty is highly directed experience every map is tense it's claustrophobic and is usually designed to funnel players towards each other call of duty is a machine of a conflict it's a competitive in its nature that's why a lot of people are spending their time there but what's really really cool is what we saw with Animal Crossing this year in particular. There are many, many different kinds of non-competitive games that are social and cooperative and people love them. There's, there's, there's a huge market for that. People will spend hundreds or even thousands of hours on those games. So as games are becoming social networks, what we've noticed similarly to traditional networks, traditional social networks, is that players want to collaboratively build the experience themselves as well. They want to be co-creators. The best social platforms usually find a good balance between content creation and content consumption. For example, Fortnite creative mode. It allows players to go and create their own maps, collaborate with others while building those maps. Eventually, you can share those new maps with your friends and you can play in those maps, meaning you can consume your own content. They have created a persistent virtual world that is always under construction. It's similar to traditional social networks like Facebook or Twitter that you're constantly refreshing because there's always new content for you to see that's made by other users and your friends. By empowering your players to create their own content in the form of mods, maps, items, game modes, or whatever, you can scale your game much faster and you can do it cost efficiently. So, Rather than building everything in-house, turn the keys to the community. UGG also has a potential to help your game go viral. For example, this Minecraft parody video, it has, more, it has close to 240 million views. That's insane reach. As a co-creator of the game, users are sharing their own content with the others in their community in the forms of videos and pictures because they are part of the creation process so they care about the success of the game as much as you do. And this is also changing the discovery of games. More and more influencers on YouTube or Twitch and early users on Twitter, Discord, Reddit are actually driving the game discovery meaning by cultivating key influencers and early adopter communities, developers will be able to self-publish instead of relying on conventional marketing tactics. And I think this is very, very interesting for developers given how traditional game publishing models usually go. And as a final, and third uh, component as games as social networks, I'd love to talk about identity. Because identity, and for a long time in, in general, people used to ask things like, why do we need a Facebook profile? Why do we need a website? And eventually people realized that they did need one. A lot of people right now maybe don't feel like they need a Fortnite profile but give it three to five years and all of a sudden, maybe everyone has one. Maybe it becomes as important as having a social network profile. If the historical trends persist, that's what's going to happen. Because just as your identity and the web today is tied to your Facebook or LinkedIn profile picture, identity in games like Fortnite, Roblox is three-dimensional and it's tied to your avatar. 
even the social nature of games, people want to differentiate themselves from others. And they do that by personalizing their avatars. Emerging technologies are not only changing the way we communicate and interact with each other, but they're also changing the concept of our online identities. Avatars are going to be the way we represent ourselves in the future. Avatars are the new form of identity. With the platforms and tools available today, never before have we had this much power to stretch, tear and mold our identities so easily. We have complete freedom to choose our visual representation. You can be a monster, you can be a car, or you can be yourself. You have all the tools available today to choose your visual representation. After spending years in the space talking about the topic, I found that people support two completely different philosophies when it comes to our online identities. It's either full anonymity or real life identity. Those are two complete opposites. And I believe, given the social nature of games, where people from all over the world create life lifelong friendships, a critical mass of users wants those online interactions supported by authentic identities. Connecting with others is part of the human nature. Does it believe majority of our avatars in the future will be connected with our real world identities the same way as platforms like Facebook and Google have created the real name policy for the web we are all using today? And that's what we at Wolf 3D are also focusing on by building a technology that allows anyone to create a unique 3D avatar of themselves based on a selfie. Our goal is to provide a persistent identity that travels with you across your virtual world experiences. From your late night meeting in your favorite social app to an early shooter with your friends, you will have one persistent identity. Based on a 2D image, our technology allows us to create a 3D avatar that looks like the person in under five seconds. That's really how easy it is. We have worked very, very hard to make it accessible for anyone in the world. We spent years perfecting the product. We started by building full body scanners where we captured people from head to toe, only to realize that people are self-conscious about their bodies. We had this very same scanner in shopping malls and almost daily, someone asked us, can we take their face and put it on a game character body? Thus, we realized that we had built the product nobody really wanted, and we had to pivot and change the product. As the second phase, we built this, an automatic face scanner that looked like a photo booth, or actually worked like the photo booth. We, we managed to build a network of those booths all around the world in different high foot traffic locations. And eventually, we realized that hardware is hard, and we cannot reach billions of people with this approach. But that being said, we managed to collect a massive database of face scans, and this allowed us to build a deep learning solution we have today. A software solution that only requires one selfie to make a high quality rig avatar of a person all automatically. Today, our goal is to partner with as many gaming companies as possible. 
to help us make a step closer to this metaverse reality and provide persistent identity for the users they've been asking. Because today, we are not living in a virtual world, but rather different kinds of virtual worlds. Your Fortnite avatar cannot visit the Eiffel Tower in Minecraft, and your Minecraft avatar cannot sell its rare horse armor in, in the Roblox environment. As avatars are an extension of ourselves, moving from Fortnite to Roblox seems impossible. You either have to surrender the skills along with all of your worldly possessions, or you just can't do it. All of those problems create opportunities, and together as a community, those can be solved. And this is what really excites me to be able to be part of solving this problem. Eventually, these will be the good old days of the metaverse. In years from now, we are on our way to the metropolis. We'll look back at 2020s and wonder what life was like without the metaverse. You could argue that how many years it would take. You could argue who are the winners and who are the losers. But you can't argue the inevitability. Thank you. An inspiring business hub where over 20,000 talented minds are positioning Dubai as the engine of innovation by pushing the limits of creativity every day. Home to over 2,000 media companies from around the globe, Dubai Media City is a vibrant community offering business, entertainment, and lifestyle, enabling our partners to lead with creativity that resonates. Redefining the future of media innovation. Dubai Media City.
today's mobile world, attracting users is becoming increasingly challenging. To better bridge the gap between brands and consumers, TikTok pioneered a new and unique way to engage users, branded hashtag challenge. The branded hashtag challenge taps into users' passion for creation and expression by inviting them to join in on a collective movement. TikTok empowers users to become co-creators while interacting with branded content. The branded hashtag challenge is a fun and easy way for brands to collaborate and seamlessly integrate within TikTok community. Every day, there's millions of hashtag challenges taking place on TikTok. Alongside some of the hottest trends in dance, comedy, fashion, food, and more. Users can discover the latest hashtag challenge on TikTok's discovery page. And popular challenge videos will be easy to find in users' For You feed. And they easily participate in the hashtag challenge by clicking Shoot button. In fact, over 50% creators have participated in a hashtag challenge with an average engagement rate of 8.5%, generating huge brand buzz and affinity. Besides a highly customized theme accompanied by challenge rules that suits your campaign objective, you can enhance your hashtag challenge by adding branded effects and music. TikTok also has a rich ecosystem of influencers who help show users how to do the branded challenge and encourage creators to get involved. The branded hashtag challenge can lead to different landing pages and drop conversions. We encourage you to support your challenge with brand takeovers and in-feed ads. These placements serve as full-screen traffic drivers to boost the awareness of your challenge and maximize the number of people who click into the challenge page. How to measure effectiveness? Instead of measuring campaign exposure and engagements simply through members, you can access brand metrics through our Brand Lift study. And the branded hashtag challenges have shown to help brands deliver higher engagement rates and drive brand metrics, such as ad recall, brand awareness, favorability, association, and purchase intent. So what are you waiting for? Join in the conversation today. Looking for a better way to get up out of bed instead of getting on the internet and checking a new hit me get up. It is! No last breath available to save him is the choke! And Tekken Master advances! Tekken Master has And Tekken Master going up 1 0. Oh. And we did it all way, chrome music. I said my skin. Like he means to go on there. That's a mistake. That's a mistake. It's going to be a goal for Rami Saeed. One of the last 30 minutes of the Oh, it's beautiful. Down. Got that ball. 
Bob Barker suit game and Plinko in my style. Money, stay on my craft and stick around for those pounds. But I do that to pass the torch and put on for my town. Trust me, on my eye and Nasser Esports win out map number two. Esports convincingly taking out the win. 20,000 USD richer, man. That is insane. Oh, Spread it across the country. Getting on the internet and checking a new hit me get up. It is no last breath available to save him. It is the choke. And Tekken Master advances. Tekken Master has. And Tekken Master going up 1 0. Oh. And we did it all with chrome music. I said my skin. Lucky me to go there. That's a mistake. That's it. It's going to be a goal for Rami Saeed. One of the first minutes of the Oh, it's beautiful. Down. Got that Bob Barker soup game and Plinko in my style. Money, stay on my craft and stick around for those pounds. But I do that to pass the torch and put on for my town. Trust me, on my eye and Nasser Esports win out map number two. Esports convincingly taking out the win. 20,000 USD richer, man. That is insane. Oh, it's a the people. We give it to Big the people. Boy. Spread it across the country.
today's mobile world, attracting users is becoming increasingly challenging. To better bridge the gap between brands and consumers, TikTok pioneered a new and unique way to engage users, branded hashtag challenge. The Branded Hashtag Challenge taps into users' passion for creation and expression by inviting them to join in on a collective movement. TikTok empowers users to become co-creators while interacting with branded content. The Branded Hashtag Challenge is a fun and easy way for brands to collaborate and seamlessly integrate within TikTok community. Every day there's millions of hashtag challenges taking place on TikTok. Alongside some of the hottest trends in dance, comedy, fashion, food, and more. Users can discover the latest hashtag challenge on TikTok's discovery page. And popular challenge videos will be easy to find in users' For You feed. And they easily participate in the hashtag challenge by clicking Shoot button. In fact, over 50% creators have participated in a hashtag challenge with an average engagement rate of 8.5%, generating huge brand buzz and affinity. Besides a highly customized theme accompanied by challenge rules that suits your campaign objective, you can enhance your hashtag challenge by adding branded effects and music. TikTok also has a rich ecosystem of influencers who help show users how to do the branded challenge and encourage creators to get involved. The branded hashtag challenge can lead to different landing pages and drive conversions. We encourage you to support your challenge with brand takeovers and in-feed ads. These placements serve as full-screen traffic drivers to boost the awareness of your challenge and maximize the number of people who click into the challenge page. How to measure effectiveness? Instead of measuring campaign exposure and engagements simply through members, you can access brand metrics through our brand lift study. And the branded hashtag challenges have shown to help brands deliver higher engagement rates and drive brand metrics, such as ad recall, brand awareness, favorability, association, and purchase intent. So what are you waiting for? Join in the conversation today. For a better way to get up out of bed instead of getting on the internet and checking a new hit me get up. It is no last breath available to save him. It's the choke and Tekken Master at this. Tekken Master has it. And Tekken Master going up 1 0. Oh. And we did it all way. Chrome music. I said my God's lucky me to go on there. That's a mistake. That's it. It's going to be a goal for Rami Saeed. One of the first minutes. Oh, it's beautiful. Down. Got that Bob Barker soup game and Plinko in my style. Money, stay on my craft and stick around for those pounds. But I do that to pass the torch and put on for my town. Trust me, on my eye and Master Esports win out map number two. Sports convincingly taking out the win. 20,000 USD richer, man. That is insane. Oh, it's a big Spread it across the country. Go back. This is a moment. Tonight is a night. Live 
inspiring business hub where over 20,000 talented minds are positioning Dubai as the engine of innovation by pushing the limits of creativity every day. Home to over 2,000 media companies from around the globe, Dubai Media City is a vibrant community offering business, entertainment, and lifestyle, enabling our partners to lead with creativity that resonates. Redefining the future of media innovation. Dubai Media City.
Deep in the darkest regions, wrapped in a cloak of light. My mind is in focus, eyes I'm trying to get my opens right. Throw my doubts aside, I climb the mountainside. And when I reach the peak, the view will see what I'll be flying. Feel the pressure, but it's relative to the man I measured. No time for hesitation, finally time to step up. And when you're feeling deep in your bones, and your soul, you're fed up. You're close to the glass ceiling, keep your head up. See your dreams as a goal, that's how I'm seeing mine. Achieve my full potential, let all of the demons pre my shine. Looking for a better way to get up out of bed instead of getting on the internet and checking a new hit. It is! No last breath available to save him is the choke! And Tekken Master advances! That Tekken Master has it! And Tekken Master going up 1 0. Oh. And we did it all way, pro music. I said my skin. Lucky me to go on there. That's a mistake. That's it. It's going to be a goal for Rami Saeed. One of the last 30 minutes of the Oh, it's beautiful! Down. Got that 
Fat Bob Barker, suit game and Plinko in my style. Money, stay on my craft and stick around for those pounds. But I do that to pass the torch and put on for my town. Trust me, on my eye and Master Esports win out map number two. Sports convincingly taking out the win. 20,000 USD richer, man. That is insane. Oh, Spread it across the country. In today's mobile world, attracting users is becoming increasingly challenging. To better bridge the gap between brands and consumers, TikTok pioneered a new and unique way to engage users, Branded Hashtag Challenge. The Branded Hashtag Challenge taps into users' passion for creation and expression by inviting them to join in on a collective movement. TikTok empowers users to become co-creators while interacting with branded content. The branded hashtag challenge is a fun and easy way for brands to collaborate and seamlessly integrate within TikTok community. Every day there's millions of hashtag challenges taking place on TikTok. Alongside some of the hottest trends in dance, comedy, fashion, food, and more. Users can discover the latest hashtag challenge on TikTok's discovery page. And popular challenge videos will be easy to find in users' For You feed. And they easily participate in the hashtag challenge by clicking Shoot button. In fact, over 50% creators have participated in a hashtag challenge. With an average engagement rate of 8.5%, generating huge brand buzz and affinity. Besides a highly customized theme accompanied by challenge rules that suits your campaign objective, you can enhance your hashtag challenge by adding branded effects and music. TikTok also has a rich ecosystem of influencers who help show users how to do the branded challenge and encourage creators to get involved. The branded hashtag challenge can lead to different landing pages and drive conversions. We encourage you to support your challenge with brand takeovers and in-feed ads. These placements serve as full-screen traffic drivers to boost the awareness of your challenge and maximize the number of people who click into the challenge page. How to measure effectiveness? Instead of measuring campaign exposure and engagements simply through members, you can access brand metrics through our Brand Lift Study and the branded hashtag challenges have shown to help brands deliver higher engagement rates 
and drive brand metrics, such as ad recall, brand awareness, favorability, association, and purchase intent. So what are you waiting for? Join in the conversation today. For a better way to get up out of bed instead of getting on the internet and checking a new hit me get up. It is no last breath available to save him. It is the choke and Tekken Master advances. Tekken Master has. And Tekken Master going up 1 0. Oh. And we did it all way. Chrome music. I said, Lucky me to go on there. That's going to be a goal for Rami Saeed. One of the first minutes of the fight. Oh, it's beautiful. That Bob Barker suit game and plinko with my style. Money, stay on my craft and stick around for those pounds. But I do that to pass the torch and put on for my town. Trust me, on my eye and Master Esports win out map number two. Sports convincingly taking out the win. 20,000 USD richer, man. That's insane. Oh, the We give that to the people. Of 
inspiring business hub where over 20,000 talented minds are positioning Dubai as the engine of innovation by pushing the limits of creativity every day. Home to over 2,000 media companies from around the globe, Dubai Media City is a vibrant community offering business, entertainment, and lifestyle, enabling our partners to lead with creativity that resonates. Redefining the future of media innovation. Dubai Media City.
In today's mobile world, attracting users is becoming increasingly challenging. To better bridge the gap between brands and consumers, TikTok pioneered a new and unique way to engage users, Branded Hashtag Challenge. The Branded Hashtag Challenge taps into users' passion for creation and expression by inviting them to join in on a collective movement. TikTok empowers users to become co-creators while interacting with branded content. The Branded Hashtag Challenge is a fun and easy way for brands to collaborate and seamlessly integrate within TikTok community. Every day there's millions of hashtag challenges taking place on TikTok. Alongside some of the hottest trends in dance, comedy, fashion, food, and more. Users can discover the latest hashtag challenge on TikTok's discovery page. And popular challenge videos will be easy to find in users' For You feed. And they easily participate in the hashtag challenge by clicking Shoot button. In fact, over 50% creators have participated in a hashtag challenge. With an average engagement rate of 8.5%, generating huge brand buzz and affinity. Besides a highly customized theme accompanied by challenge rules that suits your campaign objective, you can enhance your hashtag challenge by adding branded effects and music. TikTok also has a rich ecosystem of influencers who help show users how to do the branded challenge and encourage creators to get involved. The branded hashtag challenge can lead to different landing pages and drive conversions. We encourage you to support your challenge with brand takeovers and in-feed ads. These placements serve as full-screen traffic drivers to boost the awareness of your challenge and maximize the number of people who click into the challenge page. How to measure effectiveness? Instead of measuring campaign exposure and engagements simply through members, you can access brand metrics through our Brand Lift Study. And the branded hashtag challenges have shown to help brands deliver higher engagement rates and drive brand metrics, such as ad recall, brand awareness, favorability, association, and purchase intent. So what are you waiting for? Join in the conversation today. Get up out of bed instead of getting on the internet and checking a new hit me get up. It is no last breath available to save him. It's the choke and Tekken Master advances. Tekken Master has And Tekken Master going up 1 0. Oh. And we did it all way. Chrome music. I said my God's lucky me to go there. Nice. That's a mistake. That's it. It's going to be a goal for Rami Saeed. One of the first minutes of the Oh, it's beautiful. Down. Got 
got that Bob Barker suit game and Plinko in my style. Money, stay on my craft and stick around for those pounds. But I do that to pass the torch and put on for my town. Trust me, on my eye and Nasser Esports win out map number two. Esports convincingly taking out the win. 20,000 USD richer, man. That is insane. Oh, the 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 we give it to the people. Spread it across the country. Spread it across the country. This is a An inspiring business hub where over 20,000 talented minds are positioning Dubai as the engine of innovation by pushing the limits of creativity every day. Home to over 2,000 media companies from around the globe, Dubai Media City is a vibrant community offering business, entertainment, and lifestyle, enabling our partners to lead with creativity that resonates. Redefining the future of media innovation. Dubai Media City.
came from the darkest regions, wrapped in a cloak of light. My mind is so focused, hides, I'm trying to get my opens right. Throw my doubts aside, I climb the mountainside. And when I reach the peak, the view will see where I'll be flying. Feel the pressure, but it's relative to the man I measured. No time for hesitation, finally time to step up. And when you're feeling deep in your bones, and it's when you're fed up. You're close to the glass ceiling, keep your head up. See your dreams as a goal, the time to see your mind achieve my full potential. Let all of the demons pre my shine.
today's mobile world. Attracting users is becoming increasingly challenging. To better bridge the gap between brands and consumers, TikTok pioneered a new and unique way to engage users, Branded Hashtag Challenge. The Branded Hashtag Challenge taps into users' passion for creation and expression by inviting them to join in on a collective movement. TikTok empowers users to become co-creators while interacting with branded content. The Branded Hashtag Challenge is a fun and easy way for brands to collaborate and seamlessly integrate within TikTok community. Every day there's millions of hashtag challenges taking place on TikTok. Alongside some of the hottest trends in dance, comedy, fashion, food, and more. Users can discover the latest hashtag challenge on TikTok's discovery page. And popular challenge videos will be easy to find in users' For You feed. And they easily participate in the hashtag challenge by clicking Shoot button. In fact, over 50% creators have participated in a hashtag challenge. With an average engagement rate of 8.5%, generating huge brand buzz and affinity. Besides a highly customized theme accompanied by challenge rules that suits your campaign objective, you can enhance your hashtag challenge by adding branded effects and music. TikTok also has a rich ecosystem of influencers who help show users how to do the branded challenge and encourage creators to get involved. The branded hashtag challenge can lead to different landing pages and drive conversions. We encourage you to support your challenge with brand takeovers and in-feed ads. These placements serve as full-screen traffic drivers to boost the awareness of your challenge and maximize the number of people who click into the challenge page. How to measure effectiveness? Instead of measuring campaign exposure and engagements simply through members, you can access brand metrics through our brand lift study. And the branded hashtag challenges have shown to help brands deliver higher engagement rates and drive brand metrics, such as ad recall, brand awareness, favorability, association, and purchase intent. So what are you waiting for? Join in the conversation today. For a better way to get up out of bed instead of getting on the internet and checking a new hit me get up. It is no last breath available to save him. It is the choke and Tekken Master advances. That's Tekken Master has. And Tekken Master going up 1 0. Oh. And we did it all way. Chrome music. I said my skin. Lucky me to go on there. Oh, it's going to be a goal for Rami Saeed. One of the 30 minutes of the goal. Oh, it's beautiful. Down. Got that Bob Barker suit game and Plinko in my style. Money, stay on my craft and stick around for those pounds. But I do that to pass the torch and put on for my town. Trust me, on my eye and Master Esports win out map number two. Sports convincingly taking out the win. 20,000 USD for Richard, man. That is insane. Oh, it's a black Beautiful stuff. We give that to the people. Spread it across.
Now we are back with the uh, with the panel on uh, esports, yeah, and uh, on team management and team focus, and we have with us today uh, six really veterans of the game industry, although they are all young, yeah, but that's normal in mm -hmm. esports, and uh, and team owners, and uh, uh, also we have Luciano from Riot Games who also used to be in a team as well. So, uh, welcome guys, welcome to DGC Live. Thank you for having Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> Mi Mikhailov. As you, as it's, you it's complicated, it's Bulgarian, <laughs> you know. The, uh, <laughs> the team manager um, of Rogue Sports Europe. We have Klaus Kajetsky. Yeah, Kajetsky, it's good. CEO of Yala Esport. Um, we have Yusuf Mossen, founder and managing yep. partner, Anubis Gaming. Perfect pronunciation. <laughs> Mohamed Murad, <laughs> founder of Team Nigma. And of course, we have Luciano Rahal, who is a PR and communications manager for Riot Games here in the Middle East. The subject today is uh, team management and team focus. Uh, so all of you guys deal every day with uh, with your own teams, and uh, of course, first of all, we want to learn more about what is team management for an for an esport franchise, mm. and all of you also are doing this from different parts of the world. So maybe it uh, it it's it's being done at a at a different level and with also different uh, difficulties mm. opportunities. Uh, I will start with uh, with Thomas from Rogue. Hello, hello. Um, so, what is what is team management? To put it that way, is everything that you would think that could be done around the team. That's team management, <laughs> basically. You have from housing for the players, you have internet, you have their salaries, their contracts. Um, the communication between them and Riot, how is it going um, each week to the studio, how is the coaching staff working, what does the coaching staff need, what does the players need, where the player, players practice, what's the office, what do they eat, um, and you can continue. The list is, is pretty pretty big of, of what you have. Um, mine is a little bit more specific, like um, you introduced me as a team manager. I'm actually the general manager for the organization here in Europe and the, the office in Europe. Um, so I've lived up a little bit after Rocket uh, and team management. <laughs> uh, but um, everything that you can think of that a player, coach or staff around the team needs, that's a job, at least at the part of communication or getting it or finding the person that is going to do it or, or get it done. Um, that's basically the, what the team manager is. You're a glorified babysitter, in other words. Yeah, exactly. I'm sure. I'm yeah. sure all of you, uh, do, do you all share? Uh, that's same, a good one. The same feeling about team management, the glorified babysitter. <laughs> yeah, pretty me? much it. <laughs> pretty much it. Yeah, uh, team manager is a glorified babysitter. It's a it's a babysitter that has accomplished three or four PhDs, basically. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> well, so I was hey, going to say, um, maybe Klaus, you can answer this one. Is there anything different about team management in esports than over, say, um, a traditional sport like football? Are there any intricacies that are unique? Um, well, I mean, obviously there is the, the differences, but but there is also... A lot of similarities, I would say. Um, you know, like these days, we 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 have the almost same structure. Of, uh, we have you know nutritional coaches. We have you know people that take care of the the mental health. I, I would think one of the big um, things is that generally in esports the the players are a lot younger so they come in in the in the circus so to say already at maybe 15 or 16 even, um, and that's that's obviously like. You know, when I try to think myself when I'm 16 and then I try to like kind of put myself sometimes into our, our players like situation, like 
they need to make pretty big decisions at the age of 16. And, and we kind of assume that, that they are ready to make these decisions. So sometimes, you know, like I need to take a, a step back and really kind of give them the space and, and uh, talk with their parents and, and these kind of things. So, but I mean, there is the similarities and, uh, and differences to, to give a short answer. The, the, sorry, sorry, sorry to jump in. Uh, the big thing for me that I like giving as an example for um, comparing sports to, to esports player wise is in sports, you have all those training camps and everything from the kids starting at two, three, four, five years old. While over here, so all the, they, they already, when you, when they come to the professional level, when they start playing, when they're 16, 17, 18, when they start playing on the second team, the first team of football clubs, let's say, and so on, they already have the habits. They have all this rhythm uh, and um, construction around them built into them for 10 to 15 years before they actually reach that level. While in esports, most of the time right now, because we don't have any of those, most of the times you have their last year in high school. They've never had a job, most of them, and everything. They've played games at home, and they instantly come into, into being a professional. So one day you're at home playing the video games. The next day you, you're instantly in front of millions of people playing the, the game. So there's not that transition and um, a customization of what to expect and how to be. Yeah, so, it can literally happen overnight. Like. Yeah, yeah, and that leads to a lot of the players being put in a situation that is overwhelming, because it's being a 17 years old playing in front of millions of people. You do one mistake in your career is over. The pressure is immense. And I, the, the other day I said it, I think in a podcast or something. It's people saying. Um, they just come and play video games was the hard part of it. There's a lot of it. There's really a lot of it, especially mental pressure on them. Yeah, plus one on Thomas, uh, if, I, if I can add here. Definitely agree with you. Um, I think the main difference is uh, you are kind of molded in traditional sports to, to where you end up becoming within your career. While in esports, uh, you know, you lack the structure, you lack the mental power, you like, you, you just lack preparation in general. So you just jump in, and 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 you're like there, and people expect things from you, and 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 you don't even know how to read a contract yet. So so overall, it's it's just the lack of preparation for 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 most of these kids jumping into it. So going back to the first question, with this is one of the main things and the main difficulties within team management is no longer being a team manager from a professional point of view, but being more of a role model, a father figure, or older brother, or best yeah. friend, you know, just put them on the right yeah. track, lead them to, you know, help them make the right decisions and, and, and get them, you know, it's hard because you have to basically do that 10, 15 years preparation that traditional sports players have had in, in a week and get them ready so that they're not overwhelmed or, or, or drowned. The, wor the worst part is most of the managers are thrown in the exact same situation and they learn together with the players. Yeah. And, and, and that's completely, it's, it's a new scene. Yes, we, we've been here for 10, 15 years at this point, but that's young. That's, that's nothing compared to, to sports that have had times to, to learn, and, et cetera. And, and from those 15 years, to be fair, the, the last year, year and a half, is when and where we've seen everything getting more professional and, and more people that are actually from outside and not just players turned managers or you, he couldn't be a good enough player and that's why he turned a player uh, manager and so on. Now we see a more professionalized scene, people that are coming to learn, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I think we, we uh, from Team Nigma and also Anubis. Yeah. Guys, yep. you can jump in. Just wanted to add something. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I think the main difference uh, between traditional sports and esports uh, is that traditional sports um, basically provides uh, a huge amount of uh, support. Basically, uh, talking about physiotherapists, psychologists, um, usually traditional soccer player or general athletes in traditional sports have agents. Uh, 
which basically can guide them into the right direction. Uh, Luciano also, or I think Thomas or Luciano mentioned that players actually, like they get like basically thrown into the cold water and they're not even able to read a contract where in traditional sports, they already have basically um, a support system, which is given and, and in esports, that's not the case. It's basically they they learn it over time. And also one point which uh, Luciano mentioned, which I think is uh, is really important, uh, as a professional esports manager, you need to be able to balance professionalism and friendship because at the end of the day, you actually need to be a role model and need to be able to basically guide your players in a direction where they can basically... Uh, benefit and at the same time also become a better human being um so that's uh, that's basically um the difference between traditional sports and, and management in general and i also do think that um it is it is really hard nowadays for um for managers as thomas uh, already mentioned to to Kind of because there's at the end of the day when you become an esports manager, there's no job description. No one is gonna tell you exactly what <laughs> what you have to do as an as a manager. There's no job description. It is true that most of the managers basically learn by doing it, and of course the best the best what they will do like they will of course try to educate themselves and learn and get references from traditional sports and and try to basically uh, gather the experiences uh, which uh, are already given in traditional sports and try to apply it to esports of course not everything can be applied to esports because at the end of the day there are differences of course as uh, Klaus already mentioned there are also similarities um so to, to get straight to the point, it is uh, there is no job description. You, you got to uh, learn by doing it. But now, I, I generally do think now, um, I mean, at the end of the day, I can talk about Dota 2. Um, it is, there are like a few managers out there who are like basically proven and they've used like concepts, well-proven concepts and basically developed a system for themselves, which uh, has been proven to be actually pretty decent and you can at the end of the day everyone in the esports scene not everyone but most of the people in the esports industry they like to basically share the knowledge and basically give the knowledge to the new generation and i think it is uh, for any newcomer it is pretty much uh, uh, accessible to them to reach out um to to a known or a professional manager to reach out to them and ask them like oh, what is your experiences uh, uh, what can i do to become a professional manager the, is there a required skill set? Is there something specifically I need to do to be able to reach the same level uh, as you as you do, etc.? On on one point actually that you mentioned is the how overstaffed football team. Like let's say let's compare it with football yeah. as a sport because it's is the most developed sport right now that we have uh, in the world. How mu much different staff you have in a football team compared to an esports team? So the manager in the Huge. football team, yeah, the manager in the football team, his job is going to be mainly to communicate between you and whoever you need to work with on, on from the other staff. If you need to go to the physiotherapist or if you, you need uh, something, a repairman or a technician. I've had like, I've been doing this for close to 15 years at this point, And I've had times that one day I need to be the technician. The next day I'm fixing the internet. <laughs> The third day, I'm painting the room. The fourth day, I'm driving him to the doctor. The next day, um, I'm shopping for him. <laughs> then the cook is uh, sick, I'm cooking. And all that kind of stuff. So basically, a team manager right now, at least in esports, and I think we're away at least two or three years until we reach the point that that's going to change. But the manager's job right now is you're... Uh, the boy for everything or the girl yeah. for everything if glorified you're... babysitter basically yeah, going basically. back to the glorified yeah, babysitter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah but but uh being a babysitter doesn't make you're a me in a painter so so we're expanding <laughs> the boy you know <laughs> 
And I also think uh, it basically varies from team manager to other team managers, like because at the end of the day, there is no job description. So I, I do assume and I do think that some of the team managers uh, basically were focused on doing specific things while others were doing different uh, things at the same time. It's not like every manager, every esports manager out there is doing exactly the same. That, that's uh, definitely not, not the case. And it, it is definitely different. And it also comes down to to which esports t title we're talking about. Like, for example, I, I think like a game, etc. So there's definitely a, a difference. I, I would say though that it, it was also kind of very hard because let's take Yalla Esports for example. Like yeah. three three years ago, it was literally a one man show. Like I was that babysitter, you know, running five teams uh, across like different titles. And now, you know, lately, like we got our investment. I and and then like I was fortunate enough to be able to to kind of. Uh, yeah. basically give give my responsibilities and hire people and that was super hard actually first i thought that hey this is great but then i was like wait like like somebody else is like can i trust like who wait what, how yeah. how how should i tell this guy what to do and yeah. so so also that that uh, you know on, on one hand like when you have everything under your control as a manager you, you know it's it's hard to then get to this structured point where, where traditional sports is that you actually would have like a separate person with, with uh, responsible for only a small thing oh, fully and all of, yeah go on no, i'm saying and and all of this is without even you know scratching the the surface really i mean all of this is great this is from a player's perspective but what we're forgetting is that there's also the 70 percent is to keep the business running you have the business side of things getting sponsors getting advertising yeah, building your brand making sure your brand grows monitoring your social media yeah. typing etc cetera, etc cetera. so it's uh it really gets uh, i mean this is just one small portion but you still have to drive a team you still have to grow and build that brand uh yeah. and then yeah. you know all of that and the umbrella or in the hat of one person who is not ready and jumping in with no, I mean, the previous experience is great, obviously, whether you come from an advertising background or marketing, but putting all this together, uh, then they wonder why, uh, you know, esports manager all have like black eyes under it. It's just, it, it, it's overwhelming, you know, it's, it's overwhelming. <laughs> you, you're we didn't Jack hear from Anubis, Anubis games. I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm curious to hear more <laughs> about what Anubis game has to say. Anubis esports. Uh, it's 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 bringing me a lot of enjoyment to hear all these guys talk about things. Uh, I think they've all uh, what what you've all been talking about is uh, the difference between uh, esports and uh, sports abroad because uh, the difference between esports and sports in the Middle East and Africa there is no difference it's, except the part that Luciano mentioned, which has to do with the sponsorship and the, the investment and all this sort of thing. But in reality, there is no difference when it comes to managing an esports team and managing a football team in Egypt and the Middle East. Uh, my first two years were the most painful two years of my entire life because five years ago when I started, there were no esports entities in the region, not teams, no entities. Uh, we used to play tournaments for three, four months, and uh, the money we got from that tournament didn't co cover overheads for three days. Uh, so we had to prove to our investors, and at that time, it, uh, it was my father. I had to prove to him that, no, we still have to keep going and keep going and keep going. And Because the, the, the main thing I invested in and I started this entire thing for was the players, because... Uh, I, 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 I always used to grow up uh, here in Egypt and look around me and see people with a lot of talent, uh, a lot of talent, not just talent, a lot of potential, but uh, they, they don't do anything with it. And the reason they used to tell themselves is we're in Egypt. Well, what are we supposed to do? Just live by day by day and that's it. So that's the most uh, excruciating thing I've ever seen in my entire life. And I started the company because... Uh, to, I saw it as my job to sort of gather these uh, these players uh, in a field like esports and and not just build uh, a good team but build a good industry. So so when I started, of course, the, the the goal was to build a team and compete against other teams and so on and so forth. I didn't find any other teams. I didn't find any proper tournaments. I didn't find any proper leagues. I didn't find anyone to compete against. So I thought it was, and until today, it's 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 my job to to when I deal with a player, 
one day this guy's going to be a coach, one day this guy's going to be a manager, one day this guy's going to work in a marketing or advertising division in a tech company. I always focus on that part because when you start so early in, in a region which doesn't really see this as a thing, uh, it's your responsibility to, to, to build the future of this industry. So, you know, so, so after the first two years when things started to get uh, a bit more lively and you found new teams, new organizations, all of this started to pop up, I thought it would be easier, like Klaus said, when you get an investment and you think finally and you start hiring, um, that's and just a it's just a bigger that's challenge it yeah, 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 yeah. then that's, it just yeah. becomes different <laughs> yeah. because, because after the two years when my investor wasn't my dad anymore and it was a group of investors from other companies here in egypt uh, things started to get uh, at a, a, a lot more serious because I, I thought that the the thing i was missing the most because i was managing all the teams like klaus was doing in the first two years uh, with his organization i still manage all the teams until today why because uh, it's it all has to do with the upbringing and education of, of your population. The upbringing and education of our population here in Egypt is for me to be self-dependent and self-sufficient. And this is in all sports. So uh, after three years of managing the teams, I, I was having a very hard time with, with my life, both psychologically and business-wise. So I started going to very, very, very big, big, big football teams, the biggest football teams here in the country. And when I sat down with the owners and the board and, and the managers, they were facing the exact same issues I was facing. The exact same issues. Of course, the first one that I call the sawtooth, when you bring in a player and he kept go, keeps going up, 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 up. And then suddenly he just bangs, you know. And that happens in all sports when you bring someone in who, who hasn't had someone in their lives that believes in them before. And you bring them in and you start believing in them, you start investing in them, you start giving them all the things they never had, proper internet, a proper PC, proper peripherals, all of these things. They start scaling and scaling and scaling, but you can't, because of, of course, there are a lot of reasons, but you can't keep building this person up unless you have the support of something outside of your structure. So you, you need to have two main things. You need to have sponsorship, and investment and you need to have publisher support let's and this is the main difference between esports and sports is the publisher there is no Thank publisher in football yeah. no one no one owns football no one owns basketball no one owns volleyball so no one has the responsibility to take care of the people who are playing these games in anywhere in the world because no one owns it so you have federations you have teams you have a lot of structures built just to support this in esports you have the publisher which is a very good thing since you can't have outside control because the, this no, is where i hide <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> because because the, the, you have less chance for corruption you have less chance for mismanagement you have less uh, chance to have uh, an unfair structure for teams that's great and everything but here in the middle east and africa for the past two years ever since the publishers started to come this has been uh, my main shock you know that uh, when the publisher comes in it, it's it's like when the investor comes in to give uh, to give you money for management it's the same exact thing when the when the publisher comes in there's still that cultural uh, i don't know how to say it, this cultural um, introduction where where people can can know things that are going on uh, other teams know that the tournament is coming when you don't know anything uh, other teams use this as leverage to drag in players because you don't know anything. Uh, all of this, these sorts of things are going on, but 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 the main aspect of, of, of esports or any sport is the players. Because for me, when I started this and until today, I know that one of these days, the players I'm coaching right now, the players I'm managing right now, they will aid me in, 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 in placing this region somewhere completely different than it is now in the world. They will become our managers, they will become our coaches, and they will become our future, you know? So when it comes to the yeah. difference between esports and sports, globally, oh, such a big difference. Oh, structure. In, in the Middle East, it's, a, it's the same exact thing. You have a group of people who need uh, that push every single day from, from an academic standpoint, from a parental standpoint, and from a personal standpoint. Because for me in the Middle East, the big difference I've seen when I've sat down with owners uh, for organizations abroad is the connection we have with players. The connection they have with players abroad is when you're 18, you're independent. When you're a foreigner, when you're 18, you know 
how to get a job, you know how to deal with life and yourself. Here in the Middle East, you are always, always depending on your parents. And and when it comes to esports, when you go to to a, to a mom and dad and tell them your your son is going to be a football player like Mo Salah <laughs> yeah. and all these things, they're like. But when it comes to to esports, and you go to mom and dad, then you're like. He's going to do the exact same thing you, you've been fighting him for for the past three years, <laughs> but in a gaming house where he can do whatever he wants with a group of people that are doing the exact same thing. It's a much, much bigger challenge. I, I, I've, the, the, and and I, was with, I was on a panel with uh, Muhammad Murad in Sharm el Sheikh two years ago, and when I was talking about this, I, ex- I exploded in tears. I cried yeah, in front of I remember that. I cried in front of 400, 500 people yeah. because of the stress I had, because it was the first time anyone asked me the question how does it feel to see a player from day one to day 100? How does it feel? And I've seen parents who have. Who, who have had wars with me, not battles with me, on, on, on what the right thing to do with their kids is. And I've seen them three months later in a LAN, crying their eyes out and saying, thank you for, for, for showing us that our, our, our son is not a failure, that, that, uh, that our son is actually doing something, you know? Yusuf, <laughs> I, uh, I... We will so, make so, so... sure, we will, first of all, we will make sure not to ask you that question. <laughs> so that... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Second, I, I just want to, because we're, we're running a bit short of time, I just wanted yeah. to jump to the other uh, part of this uh, discussion, which is team focus. I mean, everybody talks yeah. about team focus. It looks very serious and focused, but what is it? What is team yeah, focus? I, I, focus? I can finish the point where, with the sawtooth. When it comes to focus, it, it, the, the players at the start, they have an excuse in their heads. And this is for the Middle East. I, I've never managed foreign players uh, on, on, a bigger, on a big scale. But what I can tell you from the Middle East and Africa, they always have an excuse. So the excuse at the start is internet and a proper gaming device and my parents. When you remove these three things and they start actually focusing on the game, a lot of other things start popping up, like lack of motivation, uh, lack of vision. Uh, I don't know what I'm doing. When's the yeah. tournament? When's the tournament? When's the tournament? This is this is the the main reason I see our players losing their focus is they don't know when their matches are abroad from from January the 1st 2020 you know exactly the number of tournaments you're going to be playing in you know the exact prize pool you're going to be playing for you know the exact compositions of the teams you're going to be playing against so when your coach sits down sits down with you he knows exactly how to plan it out here in the middle east you have a tournament tomorrow yes <laughs> what but I haven't been playing in four or five days. Valorant just got released. I, I really like this game. Uh, should I start practicing? So so y- you have a lot of question marks, question marks, question marks. So it's very, very hard to have someone focused when they don't know when their games are, when their matches are, when they don't know anything. They're just, <clears throat> you bring them into the gaming house. You tell them, okay, go scrim, which is, which is the practicing against other teams. Until we tell you when the matches, until we tell you when the tournaments are. So, so, so having a player in the Middle East stay focused is the hardest thing I've ever had to do in my entire life. What about uh, what I, about you, Thomas? Uh, and you are not in the Middle East, and I believe uh, also Muhammad. But but you, Muhammad also, you have players that are not from the Middle East. Exactly. And, uh, I, I would so, I would put it that I would put it that way. Thank you, Riot. <laughs> Just thank you, Riot. It's, it, it's like what you're saying and explaining, I can relate to all of this. So, so just sorry to, to go just for a second back on the daughter topic is this thing with the parents and the family. I was a person 15 years ago that my parents kicked me out of home when I decided to, to, to start yeah. esports. It was either join our business, either okay, go your way, but get the, get the freaking out um, and so on. So I, I can completely read. Regarding the schedules and everything, that used to be, even with us, it used to be a couple of years ago. Like it's a process that um, since esports is so new compared to, to sports and everything, is we are learning and getting more structured and professional with time. And this is, this is what's going to happen. Like, Riot, luckily for you, are now getting into the Middle East um, and and EMEA in general, so that helps a lot. Like what you what you said 
uh, about publishers being here compared to football is you have a backbone that pushes it. And we, we've gotten lucky with some companies. I, I like to give the, the example with Riot because I've been working with them for the, the last 10 years uh, plus, and um, they have grown. And right now you have with Riot, you have a backbone that looks, it doesn't look to make a tournament for the next three to six months. It looks to make their game or whichever game it is. Right now it was League of Legends. Now it's going to be switching to Valorant and others. They look what is going to be five years from now. How do we build something that is sustainable? Uh, not only money, but player development and everything else. Like, yeah. um, what we have here in Europe, um, I, I work mainly with League of Legends. I've worked the past since beta in, in League of Legends. Uh, and what has happened specifically here in Europe, uh, not every region has adapted, <laughs> America. <laughs> uh, but uh, There we go. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the, the EU NA rivalry, you know. But over here, if you look the system that we have, yes, we have the LEC that is on the top of everything, but then we have every single country with a league. Every single country then under that league has another development league. That is something that is slowly starting to be yep. what what is the development. And that's what Riot is good with. And mm-hmm. and that's the good thing compared to, to other ones with um and as I'm saying, a Riot person just joins in, in, the, in the office. I was just going to ask you. I was just going to ask you. If you can break into one second. We're really, really I, I, short of time. We're really short of time. The, getting I, back I wanted... to the topic focus. <laughs> I can uh, say a few things about focus. Wait, 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 um, we're really, we're really, wait, wait one second. We're really short of time. I just really want to get Luciano's take on how, de- how publishers can be supporting uh, teams. No uh, yeah, well, I mean, uh, first of all, uh, Thomas, I couldn't have said this uh, better myself. Uh, if, if we didn't know better, you could have thought it's scripted. Uh, <laughs> no. But uh, all jokes aside... Um, first time look, I miss Luciano, by the way. <laughs> yeah, by the way. First, uh, big fan for Rope. Good stuff Thank on you. the last three games. G2 is next, so we'll watch. Uh, anyways, going back to the main topic. Um, look, uh, publishers uh, within the Middle East and North Africa is, is a bit of a tricky question. Uh, the MENA region as a whole doesn't function the same way you'd have in Europe or, or in, in NA. Uh, from a governmental point of view, there's a lot of blockers. Uh, but once you pass these blockers and, and you have an established company here, so for instance, let's take Riot Games. Riot Games has had presence in the MENA region for about two years, but real presence for about six months. Um, this region has always been behind uh, the West three, four years, specifically when it comes to esports. Um, and the infrastructure itself uh, is almost non-existent. The ecosystem for esports as an industry is also almost non-existent. So you have a lot of teams, yes, you know, whether it's Anubis or, or Yella Esports or, you know, Nasser Esports when I was with it before. And, and, and you know, I, I feel all the pain these gentlemen were talking about because I also went through it when I was running Nasser Esports. Um, you know, these teams exist, but the teams alone cannot do much uh, except just chase the next adventure or chase the next tournament in hopes that someone finds them and says, oh, here's a spot to go into the major or here's a spot to enter into an international tournament. And, and, and that's, not, that's not something only the publisher can do and provide. The publisher obviously will open the doors to it, but there should be uh, the fundamentals and the fundamentals don't exist in the region. When you talk about internet connection, when you talk about accessibility to servers, when you talk about uh, accessibility to areas for training, to, to, to I'll give you an example. Team houses in, in, in the United Arab Emirates, for example, by law is illegal. You cannot have four, five people, six people sitting together in a villa, training and living together day in, day out. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's not allowed. So there's a lot of small little intricacies that need to change uh, there's a you know visa visa processes. We had a massive tournament in Saudi Arabia. Uh, luckily, the government in Saudi Arabia helped us provide certain visas, but it wasn't accessible to everyone. Uh, also, you have the geopolitical conflict. You know uh, whether uh, uh, how easy is it for uh, an Egyptian uh, player to leave Egypt without with the military and university and all these things to go and compete. There's so many things that need to come together even before the publisher comes. 
yes, the publisher is an important aspect because they're going to set the infrastructure. But there's so many things that need to come together. Are we getting there? Yes, absolutely. You know, as we go and as we perfect our craft in the international scene, uh, entities and brands are putting pressure on governmental entities to actually see this as a potential industry, as a potential way to, you know, grow your tourism sector or this or that or you know so on and so forth. And eventually, these things are are, are starting to, to to be put in place. From our side, as Riot Games, our commitment for the MENA region is yes, we are here to stay, and yes, we do have the five ten year vision. Uh, right now, we are testing the water. Uh, we did it with Nexus. We're doing now with IAC. Uh, and when I say we're testing the waters, is we need to start identifying the talent. We need to start identifying the grassroots. We need to start identifying the brands that are uh, that are interested. We need to start identifying the governments that are also interested. So you know, we we're doing what what uh, Thomas was talking about. Uh, you know, the step below the LEC is we've opened nationwide. So, you know, Tunis is alone, Egypt alone, Morocco alone, UAE, where, you know, we're running a, a semi-pro amateur League of Legends tournament to see how people interact with it, to see how players interact with it, and more important, to see how brands interact with it. And then we'll take it step by step from there. But definitely a publisher's presence uh, is important uh, because they can facilitate the non-logistical things, which is, language, uh, accessibility to the game, localization, so on and so forth. That that is, you know, ping. is important. Ping, well, ping, ping is is something that, that that is a huge issue in the region. But again, it's not just a publisher. It's not about, hey, I have a red button that I can click right now in the office and the server pops up. There's a lot of things involved. You know, who are you going to partner up with? Where are you going to put it? What is the best running? People forget that the MENA region is not Germany. Or it's not North America, which is just one country. The MENA region is over 13, 14 countries. You know, uh, it's not easy to bring 13, 14 countries into one kind of uh, basket. It's not just one country. <laughs> G yeah. Germany and good internet doesn't fit in one sentence, though. <laughs> <laughs> An African server sounds pretty good. <laughs> uh, it's been a pleasure to host you. Unfortunately, as you know, uh, we are. Back to back with the with the sessions, I believe we can keep on going for a, a long time. two three more hours and mm -hmm. maybe jump to other subjects. And I hope that we will do. Uh, we have other esports sessions that are taking place during the three days, mm -hmm. and uh, it's it's uh, and we had uh, also some that were already done. Uh, we thank you very much for your time. I mean, uh, it was really super interesting. We still have a lot of question marks yeah. about esports. We still need to learn more about the industry, especially here in the region. We need to really... Difficulties to play. Sadly, sometimes these kind of platforms uh, are a little bit crude when it comes to these kind of things. Another piece, uh, and, and here for the gamers who understand that there is a rivalry that happens in the world between Europe and North America. So obviously, whenever there's an esports competition that happens throughout the world, there's always this huge debate that happens online that is EU better than North America or North America is better than EU. In this case, Lion Serial took a stand, and that's actually what they did. Ça, c'est un fan d'e-sport qui a le lion style. You won't, you won't understand this unless you're a gamer. And I think that's the power of this piece is that they really target the people who actually understand this rivalry that happens between the two crowds. We have some brands like Axe. When you know what the Axe brand is all about, it's about you know, having your mojo and being able to uh, be seductive. They have found their way within the space while understanding also as well that, you know what, gamers do have their own mojo and with a series of interesting content, they ask them to make their move. Oh, <gasps> ball sticks. Sucks for Jen. Maybe she needs cheering up. Uh, maybe. Watch this. Seriously? 
another uh, quick one Whoa. from <gasps> ball sticks so it's our six month anniversary today got you these i'm pollen intolerant i've told you so many times wow a bloodthirster i know you love to life steal <laughs> You know, obviously, uh, the cues in the content here is very interesting. It's about the sword that is available in League of Legends and the word lifesteal, which is a very, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a power technique for the item that players purchase within League of Legends. So the, the wording and the, the scripting when it comes to these kind of content has to be done by gamers at heart, or else it will become a little bit irrelevant. So it's our six month anniversary. My name is Chris. And to we will move to we will move now to a piece uh, with KFC, uh, where eventually they wanted to decide that what's a perfect gamer, and they wanted to define it from their own point of view, and they think that they have cracked that. My name is Chris, and through eating the KFC vegan burger, I became a perfect gamer. First thing that I noticed was how much more energy I had. More energy meant that beating my friends was no longer an issue. It's hilarious because uh, I'm playing with my foot right now. You better get good, kid. <laughs> you say he wants a rematch. <laughs> so I moved on to beating them two, three, four at a time. But it was all still too easy. Would you like I go on mine? Psych! <laughs> Sometimes a different perspective is interesting. Back to the lobby for you, kid. Oh, uh, uh, do you want any more egg on your face? I'd love it, but I'm vegan now. <laughs> My reactions were so fast that I was playing Wii tennis and table tennis at the same time. I was reacting to things I couldn't even see. I call it vegan vision. Vegan vision. I should really copyright that, shouldn't I? I heard somewhere that Roman gladiators were plant-based, which kind of makes sense. And kind of the closest thing there is to a modern-day gladiator. Switching to a vegan burger diet has not only made me a better competitor, but as we all know, switching to a vegan burger diet makes you a better athlete. Hang on, are you playing a game right now? Mm-hmm. And I'm winning. Standard. Is this guy nice serious? Interesting way to look how they actually took how to promote the vegan burger. A very interesting put. Uh, might, maybe you like it, maybe you don't, but obviously they have taken the, the leap forward in that space. Um, I mean, we've all probably heard about this one and it really melted some faces by actually asking the question of how come a brand like Louis Vuitton be able to enter the gaming space, a brand that is really about premium luxury. But, you know, this is how brands, when they define expectations and they really take a leap forward into, uh, into any segment or any industry, that's how they have done this, by creating a very interesting new lineup of clothing in the game and outside the game. So obviously by creating these kind of uh, lines outside the game and also some skins for League of Legends to really uh, reinforce the partnership that they had, they really done the job in an excellent way. One of the brands that really kind of created a little bit of um, exclamation marks going into the space was a brand like Shell. Uh, a brand that is really in the, in the energy field uh, doesn't really, is not really reliable on the consumers uh, or the young consumers at specific, but they have taken that step forward because they understand that they can change a perception. Apologies, this ad is in German, but what you will see here is a character that is mimicking uh, a cast that is mimicking an in-game character. I'm 
Young Dibble Young Dibble Jungs, ich hab aufgetankt. Shell Club Smart Mitglied werden und Punkte für League of Legends Prämien sammeln. Obviously the character was obviously dressed in a League of Legends character and they were promoting the partnership that they have created with the, with the, with the publisher. We move to another interesting piece which is from Samsung. And uh, this is a very interesting piece simply because they have integrated uh, their brand within the product and how it influenced the whole community around a popular game like Fortnite. They got skin in the game and Samsung really did it really well. How do you turn a phone known for this? I can draw and take notes. Into the phone for gaming. Samsung Galaxy Note 9 is the one that everyone's talking about. You don't make a campaign, you make a character and drop it into the world's biggest game. Introducing the Galaxy Skin. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the Galaxy Skin. The most hyped skin in Fortnite right the now. The rarest skin ever. The only way to unlock it is to purchase the Galaxy Note 9. To build hype, we gave the skin to one gamer before anyone else. Ninja. 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 What? Ooh. The world's biggest gamer unboxed the Note 9 in front of 20 million viewers. And then he jumped on Twitch and dominated with the Galaxy skin live. This is the best skin in the game, facts. Gamers lost their sh What? Dude, that looks so effing cool. Oh my god! Oh my god! Oh my god! Oh! Galaxy skin! They had to have the Galaxy skin. Even if it meant attempting to download it from demo phones in retail stores. I am at the mall and I'm going to be attempting to go and get the skin. It's loading, boys. Come all this way to get a Galaxy skin. We just wasted two hours in and get the skin. Gamers shared their fails on Reddit. And a secondary market opened up. Yeah, that's $7,000 for a skin that came free on a $900 phone. The Galaxy skin went beyond the game. Fans made action figures, fashion lines, and even makeup tutorials. Gamers couldn't stop talking about Galaxy. But most importantly, we saw an increase in Galaxy Note 9 sales of 243% and got fans of our competitors in store and hands on with a Note 9. That's how you turn a phone for productivity geeks into the phone for gamers. Very interesting and very successful because this is the pinnacle of what a brand should do when it comes to the gaming space. Using the right attributes when it comes to the product, also to the talent that they have chosen, up to the word of mouth that they have created for the demand of the skin and the phone itself. Speaking of Fortnite, sometimes you have the right to work with Fortnite and sometimes you don't. And you know, in the case of Wendy's, they really don't do frozen burgers and that's how. Let's now talk Fortnite, shall we? It's the newest video game craze spreading fast among kids, college kids, even celebrities. Kids are nuts for this Fortnite. Fortnite has taken over the gaming world, becoming the most streamed game on Twitch ever. But brands are left out of the action, either tweeting from the sidelines or paying big bucks for in-game sponsorships. So when Fortnite announced a new event called Food Fight between Team Pizza and Team Burger, Wendy saw an organic way in. We found out Team Burger stored their beef in freezers. And Wendy's doesn't do frozen beef. So we got on Twitch, chose a character with red hair and pigtails, dropped into the game, and instead of killing other players, we started destroying burger freezers. Again and again and again for nine hours straight. We also declared our mission on Twitter, sending hundreds of thousands of gamers to Twitch to watch us play. And soon other players stopped killing each other and started killing burger freezers with us. Hi, Wendy's, dude, let's go! Top Twitch streamers took notice. I saw a Wendy's stream over here, dude. Oh, you was smacking the dirt Freezers? This shit's lit. Oh, this kind of stuff keeps the game fresh. Thank you so much for coming to the stream, Wendy's. News outlets were talking about it. Even Twitch posted a highlight reel of Wendy's best freezer kills. Then our own competitors showed us some respect.
But most importantly, the game developers removed the freezers from every burger restaurant, meaning Wendy's had rid Fortnite of frozen beef forever. This is when you have a, uh, a creative director who is really a gamer at heart and there's a true insight coming from the game to do really great work. This was a can winner. We move to the next piece uh, on, uh, with Coca-Cola. Look, you know, sometimes there's a lot, always the fact of doing great ideas and coming up with these creative twists. But by the end of the day, players just, they want to play. And this is what Coke did. One of the pieces that we have done globally with Coke uh, in, with our France offices. Make the crowd scream, ah. Me finna knock on the enemy. Bring the fire when I fight to the melody. Blood fire, you begin, ah. Keep on the game, me a winner. Your man, them know me a leader. When I'm coming to arena. Sometimes you don't have to really uh, go very, uh, you can go very operational. It's okay not to be very creative. It's okay to be the catalyst. It's okay and absolutely fine to just let players play games. And that's a great success story from Cook. Uh, just as a small reminder, if you want to have any questions, please type it in the Q&A. We will get back to all the questions, obviously, after we finish the presentation. Thank you. Now we move to, uh, oh, it's freezing on me a little bit, one second. Okay. You know, we, we talked a lot about some global examples. And this is a, 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 a local example that we have worked with Pringles. And obviously they have tasked us to enter the gaming space, but you know, we gave them the solution of, you know what, PUBG Mobile is a, game, is a game that is really rising. And if we need to do something, let's do it with the right people and let's speak the same language. Or you know what, let's do it in the game. And this is the piece that we have created. يا شباب تريدون تفوزون ب 20000 دولار مع برندس ومسابقه بابجي موبايل ايه في خير ازم بشيكي simple effective and straight to the point we spoke the language of what the PUBG community uh, PUBG Mobile community speaks using one of the talents. This guy's called UAE Skills. He's very prominent within the community of PUBG Mobile. And the entourage and the art direction and the look and feel of the whole campaign was really embedded within the style of what the PUBG Mobile universe looks like. So if you really want to speak to gamers, let's speak to gamers within their own turf and territory. We move now to uh, an interesting piece from Vodafone where, you know, there's this big talk, who's a gamer? Uh, am I a gamer? Do I play, if I played one game, am I a gamer? Or if I play five games, am I, if I, am I a gamer? 
So Vodafone obviously took that point and really wanted to establish a point of view on the matter. And this is what they've done. Gamer. 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 And she's a gamer. And her. This lot too. And them. And her. And this guy. Yep. And them. These guys too. And her! Yep. Gamer. It's simple. You want to promote 5G, promote it to all gamers. And guess what? Everyone is a gamer. We end this with a very special dear piece to us, uh, which we take a lot of pride in creating. Um, in Saudi, there's a lot of unsung heroes. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of players who have achieved greatness when it comes to gaming and esports. And they are not known. No one has ever probably heard of them. Some people have, but probably the mass community or the mass audience didn't really pay attention to the amount of efforts that these guys have done. Mobile, you wanted to approach gaming and luckily for us, they have chosen the right strategy and they have created a great piece of content with us that is really not only building on that space, but also building on their brand. بسمع كلام كثير عن الجيمرز انهم جيكس وانهم ما عندهم حياه بس يقعدون على الكمبيوتر وما يسوون شيء. بعض الناس مو فاهم الاي سبورت مو فاهم انه هو المستقبل للرياضات. في ناس كثير هم يشوفوا انه الجيم مضيع للوقت. بالعكس هذه وظيفه اكثر من انك انت كلاعب. الاي سبورت تغير عن حياه ناس كثير. حاب ابين لهم ان هذا هو المستقبل. انت يمكن لو لو تخش جو الجيمنج عالم الجيمنج بس ابو ساعتين بس ثلاث ساعات صدقني ما راح توقف احب الادرينالين الطش اللي يجيني. هي مثل اي رياضه ثانيه، الاي سبورت يبغى له تركيز يبغى له سرعه الانتباه في اللعبه. الاي سبورت في السعوديه انا اشوفها هذه بدايه وبدايه مره قويه. كل ما ادخل على بطوله في الاي سبورت اعتبرها اخر بطوله في حياتي. عالم السعوديه لما شفته يترفع اسمي كله كان يرجع. لا تخلي الفشل هو حاجز لك لان الفشل هو بدايه النجاح. اسمي فالكون. انا سوره. اسمي كسار. انا فاست. انا نيم سيفن. السبارس انه صار جزء مني ومن شخصيتي وما اتوقع انه يجي اليوم اني اقدر اتركه. Obviously, Mobile didn't stop by this piece. They've created a series of stories about each and every single of those champions and eventually turned to... Okay, I found this on the web for a series of stories about. That's, Check it out. That's my Siri, actually, just answering my question. Sorry about that. So eventually, speaking of Mobile right now, what we will do is let's speak to the man himself, uh, Luai, about why they have taken that step and why they have, uh, they have eventually approached gaming and esports the way that they have done, and what are the plans that they have for the future, obviously. So, uh, welcoming Luai, uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Thank you so much, Joe. Thank you guys for the opportunity and for us to actually talk about this. Thank you very much. Uh, Luai, just really, before going into a lot of details, just explain to us what was the thought process, what you guys uh, acquired when it comes to how to tackle this subject. Uh, from, from obviously you've heard about gaming and esports for quite some time. What was the tipping point that made uh, Mobile e go into the space? Uh, well, I mean, uh, if you want to consider the whole timeline of how this operation all started, uh, it basically started from looking at a phenomena that started to materialize in Saudi Arabia in terms of us having, um, uh, Masaad was uh, one of the first uh, Saudis to actually be crowned in the FIFA World Cup. Ironically, we lost that uh, FIFA World Cup, but we won it electronically. And suddenly people started incorporating the conversation of how Saudi lost the World Cup, but won the World Cup at the same time. Uh, and then it started becoming more and more into a lot of circles as an idea of, is this an opportunity to create content? Or is this an, uh, an opportunity to, to cross sell? Is it a platform? So it started with an experiment. And uh, one of the key uh, elements of this experiment is knowing who are you partnering with. 
who is going to be your partner and actually guiding you into this new territory? Because we knew that we had the intent of pushing forward when it comes to uh, uh, this niche and how we want to expand on it. But we wanted to know how to be relevant as well, because uh, as you might know, and some of the audiences are for gamers, it's a heavily uh, uh, enclosed community. So if you're not relevant, if you're not clicking with the, uh, with the audience, there is no way you're going to make it. Uh, they can see you. They can see through you. So if you're not coming from a genuine place, uh, it's not going to happen. And if it wasn't for the passion of the team involved being gamers themselves, uh, it, it wouldn't have been able uh, to materialize, at least, to understand where the opportunity lies. Uh, of course, it was a small uh, experiment uh, at first, but it started to grow exponentially uh, based on the kind of engagement we're expecting. If it's something that is an investment but high impact, suddenly it starts to equalize and you start to see more and more opportunities pop up. And uh, one of the key things that I think uh, us working together and you guys noticed is that all of this happened right before the government started to adopt heavy esports strategies. So we, we were ahead of the curve when it comes to that. And now we're trying to be, uh, or we're trying to cut uh, a small piece of ours, uh, I mean, of this new market, of this niche, uh, completely for us, uh, which is us trying to collaborate on creating boot camps uh, to help game development in Saudi Arabia. And at the same time, us trying to give a platform for every other gamer, because uh, although gamers is a very vocal minority, uh, but there are huge numbers, they don't get their moment in the spotlight unless it's a very popular game. Uh, and this is and this is why we decided that if people are focusing on one, we're focusing on everyone else, uh, being that everyone else is using us anyways. And we're trying to create this uh, emotional relationship, which allows us to actually cross platform later on in the future. It's excellent what you're saying. And guys, please, if you have any questions for, for I uh, and to how mobile you enter this place, please do uh, write them in the, in the Q&A section. But you've talked about the, the kind of approach to do it. Now, how do you see the, the whole industry going basically when it comes to the involvement of Saudi companies within the space? How everybody is jumping on that topic and how do you see it expanding, obviously, from the lens that you were probably one of the first brands who created a brand campaign when it comes to gaming and esports? How do you see the other brands going into the space right now and, and to which pace? Okay, well, I mean, um, uh, I have to say this disclaimer because, again, I happen to have some sort of skin into this game, so uh, take me as a bit biased to what we're trying to do. But from my own observation, I'll try to be as objective as possible because, again, uh, we were trying to go through the same sources of evaluating our research. Uh, our own observations is that the market is actually starting to notice that there is an opportunity or else you wouldn't have a full on government section uh, dedicated only for esports. And nobody expected, me being a gamer myself, nobody expected something as a League of Legends tournaments to have the biggest cash pool prize in the Middle East to happen literally like three or four months ago. This is something that happened overnight, at least for me. Because this time last year, everything was in plan. Uh, maybe it will happen. Nobody knows if this eSport thing is going to be. There's a lot of rumors happening around, oh, this brand is jumping in. Of course, telecoms happen to be uh, competing in this space head-to-head -head because they have the biggest uh, stake in this, being a service provider to these gamers. So it allows us to understand what those gamers need, and it allows us to understand as well how do we talk with them. Uh, we are not just a, uh, a snack that they can actually eat while playing. They have a, a relationship with us. Uh, uh, be it in service or being in the loyalty that we're trying to create. And uh, what we're seeing from the other brands is that they break down to two categories, focused but quiet or completely scattered but very loud. Um, and we'll see the impact usually around every, every quarter or so, uh, but we see that very small gradual footsteps leading into a big impact later on, creating that kind of ongoing relationship and creating that loyalty fan base because this is the best thing about gamers is that when you start small and you start creating that small community, when it grows with you, it really grows with you. And it starts to rely on you in terms of the kind of communication that you're giving, in terms of the, uh, uh, like the information that you're doing, and in the events as well. Uh, and this is like, uh, as, uh, I think this is something that we explored, you and me, uh, over now, not one but two different tournaments and how the engagement keeps on adding on using the previous tournament as momentum. 
it's it's good that you've mentioned the tournaments aspect. I mean, obviously, we see a lot of brands asking about how to create tournaments. We see a lot of tournaments happening here and there. In your eyes, from a brand standpoint, what do you expect to see when, when, when there's a branded tournament with Mobile? What are the parameters of success that you look for as a brand? Well, um, to be honest with you, way before, um, um, especially being just a follower, uh, I never knew the amount of information and detail that actually goes into them. Uh, I came from a boot camp where it's just about turning on a game and making a Twitch channel, and that's all you need for you to start a tournament. The whole infrastructure and content structure and the kind of behavior that goes throughout between the live streams and what to do when you're offline so this kind of cohesive plan that the tournament is not just people competing together it's a, a maybe a week two weeks maybe a month worth of content of live streams offline streams engagements giveaways that kind of cohesive plan makes it uh, very easy uh, for us uh, as a brand to evaluate rather than just a hit or, uh, like a hit and run which is most of the events that happened before it used to be an activation on ground during some gamers day we just have some kind of a small one-on-one -on -one tournament and that's it. There is no the kind of level of engagement that I attend and see online every now and then. So that kind of uh, detail and attention to detail, uh, where are you talking to the gamers? Where are you announcing uh, your tournament? Uh, I'm not going to be announcing my tournament in the streets if I can reach them all the way in Twitch or Discord. Uh, so knowing where to talk and how to talk uh, is going to be key in terms of understanding and evaluating is this going to be a tournament that I need to host, sponsor, or even create uh, on my own. Uh, one last question from my end before we jump into some interesting kind of tips on how to do it better. Uh, obviously, as a company like Mobile, it's, it's a big company that has a lot of stakeholders and a lot of layers as well for approvals. Um, yeah. What are the struggles that you guys face internally when you are able to kind of do stuff like this? Is there any, are there any struggles? Are there any kind of uh, extra efforts that you have to put internally for you guys to be able to make sure that these activities happen, which are a kind of left field space for the industry as a whole? Well, uh, I wouldn't call them struggles more than trying to identify yourself with something that is completely new. Uh, uh, any mobile in Saudi Arabia has been there for 15 years and we're very known to be an innovative in the market in terms of how we actually approach solutions but at the same time with that status like the great spider-man quote comes great responsibility in terms of that if I'm going to venture into something new I don't want to venture into something that actually turns off to be a flop later on I don't want to venture into an area that might not be something that gives me an advantage to the competition because at the end of the day, it is a competition in terms of who adopts what platform and how. So internally, we really did not face much of a problem in getting people convinced that esports is a thing more than trying to align momentum into pushing and to making esports as a complete uh, division. Because again, despite the fact that we here make it seem so big, uh, gaming is still a niche market considering everything else that a telecom company goes through. So it's more about we're going to start small or we started small and then slowly as the engagement and as the interaction increases, then you'll understand exactly what kind of market you're in. But at least that way, you're going to build up the kind of understanding and the kind of internal alignment that when the opportunity arises, everybody's going to jump on it. And I think that materialized recently uh, when uh, the Ministry of Communication started to, uh, uh, to host uh, an event called Gamers Without Borders. I'm going to be uh, plugging that event now, which is basically a boot camp that teaches kids how to develop video games. And we saw this as an extremely uh, a great opportunity for mobile to be associated with that as we are the platform for the gamers. We are the platform that gives them a stage. And we are the platform that actually wants a new generation of gamers to come in, uh, being uh, the young ones and being the unknowns uh, who are uh, like very famous in their own regard, uh, the ones that we did feature content on uh, with you guys. Great, um, but very insightful, very insightful tip, tips uh, for brands to go into the space. And this is exactly what we will be moving uh, to next uh, on how a brand, if, if a brand wants to go into that kind of space, what kind of, what kind of tips we can give them by the end of this, uh, this webinar? So first and foremost, I think, play by the player's rules not your rules. It's, and, and this is a great example of how Pringles and Coke, the, the both videos that we have showed you, they are very genuine to the gaming community. They are really creating uh, elements that players want to play, uh, tournaments, events, activities, 
um, similar to the world of uh, PUBG Mobile that Pringles created, really simple, don't overcomplicate it, don't really try to create something that is new to that space, stick by the rules that the players really adhere to and everything will be fine. Um, tip number two, I think here to what Mobile did obviously and what, what Vodafone example we showed you, work on an idea that is helping the gaming community at first. We have seen with the Mobile campaign, uh, bringing that voice uh, to the public, bringing those, uh, those gamers to the limelight, giving them something in return to what they have done to their country and to their communities. So whenever you want to work on an idea, try to work on something that is really helping the gaming community because this is how the perception will be obviously reverted back to you in a positive sentiment. Another tip, link the initiative to your brand values. There's really always a fit. And we've seen how Mercedes obviously have done this. And I will take the example of Axe. Axe is a brand that's really building, uh, it, it got built on the essence of creating its mojo of being able to be seductive. And look how they used a gaming scenario and a gaming context to really fit that kind of uh, value that they always stand for. And this is very important. There's always a brand fit. And, and, and this leads me to the fourth tip which is also important, going into, a, going into gaming and esports can really change a brand perception. I mean, Shell did it. Shell, obviously, it's a big, bad energy company. And, you know, the Generation Z look at it as, you know, this is a fuel company that is not helping the world when it comes to the global warming and such. But obviously, going into that space, talking to that audience will be able to give you a trick or two to work on your perception towards a, a, a certain community. Tip number five, do not be intrusive, be insightful, be authentic. Look at Wendy's, really simple, straightforward. They didn't really overthought about how they want to do it. They really just understood the game and they really understood how the gamers played the game. And the gamers created the idea. And that's the strength of the, of the idea itself, similar to Alliance Serial. When we talk about EU and NA, if you go and talk to anyone right now, they don't understand what is this, why there is this rivalry. But obviously, the mere fact that Lion Bar, Lion Serial, obviously took the initiative to demonstrate that rivalry in a piece of content that they created gives you a lot of uh, hope that brands really want to be insightful and authentic in the way that they communicate to this type of audience. And last but not least, it's really simple. Speak to gamers where gamers are. We talk here about Facebook Live, YouTube Live, Twitch, Discord, and I know there's, there's, there will be questions where is Mixer, where there's a lot of live platforms. Here we chose the platforms, obviously, that uh, they are available and strong within the region. Um, I think the screen is, yeah, mixing, so it's good right now. So nonetheless, these are the six tips that we leave you with. Please uh, do type your questions in the Q&A, and I think we will be able to take those accordingly right now. So, Edward, to you. Thank you very much, Joe. Uh, so now it's time to go into the Q&A. Uh, I hope you guys found this uh, very interesting. Thank you very much, Luai, also, for your very insightful uh, testimony. Uh, I do see a lot, a lot of, uh, of interesting questions here. Uh, we'll try to answer uh, some of them live, most of them live. Um, and I'll redirect these to uh, you, Joe, or, um, or do I? Um, okay, I, I was expecting this one, and this one is interesting indeed. Um, we talked a lot about the target audience, and we have a question. Uh, Joe, is gaming spreading among women in the region? Absolutely, absolutely. It's that dramatically growing. We, we've seen 70, 30, and obviously this number is really growing to, uh, to the 40s as we speak. Uh, we see a lot of game streamers right now. We see a lot of esports organizations that are hiring game streamers, female game streamers, uh, on, on a continuous basis. It's becoming a norm. It's becoming not a trend. It's becoming something that is absolutely normal. We expect this to be happening more and more often, and we expect... We expect also brand to jump on this more and more often. There was a girl gamer event that happened in Dubai a couple of months back. And obviously when these kind of things will occur, the growth will happen. And obviously women will tap into the space more and more as we go. Great, thank you. Uh, I see several questions for Luai. Luai, are you still with us? Yep, I'm here. I'm just on mute because my kid is just running around me. <laughs> Yes, these are the joy of uh, confinement. So, a first question for you, Luai. Um, 
With 5G taking gaming experience to the next level, uh, how do you see the communication strategy shifting for mobile? Well, I mean, you just said it. Uh, 5G is more of an adoptive uh, technology. It's not an intrusive technology. So you're not really introducing more than you're trying to showcase the application of how 5G is actually improving every single aspect of what you already know. Um, uh, the audience right now are not as uh, illiterate as they were before. Everybody is tech savvy. Everybody understands 5G is the hype. Uh, it's all about the application. And uh, uh, like here at Mobile, we're studying all across the separate type of applications that are actually associated with 5G, with gaming being at its core because of latency. Uh, and this is one of the things that uh, um, when it comes to speaking the language, if I know how to market 5G, I know exactly what is going to be setting me apart than everybody else. And I know exactly what is going to be the appeal or the plug when it comes to uh, gaming in general. Do I? But that's yeah, yeah. But that's but that's but that's all I can uh, like say at the moment. All right, and and a second question for you uh, from someone in the audience who's definitely uh, very knowledgeable about esports, and I think Joe, you will be able to jump in as well. Um, so it's as you know, gamers hold grudges and have a very long-lasting memory. This is very true. Um, in saying that, there have been several large tournaments that did not go according to plan in our region and has scared several esports enthusiasts, both players and viewers. Uh, in your opinion, have these tournament organizers in our region learned from and improved on these missteps in recent times? And if so, do you have any examples of recent tournaments that set the right example? Apart from your tournament, uh, Luai, which- Yeah, of course, because, yeah, because I'm gonna be like uh, uh, biased on this, but yeah, I mean, uh, I, I totally agree when it comes to, yes, uh, they never forgive and they never forget. Um, when I, I mean, when any tournament that I attend, either virtually or actually in person, and it goes bad, I make sure that I at least bad talk that tournament for the next two weeks. So I understand exactly what they're. I mean, where that's coming from. Um, but then again, because this is a market with both uh, leaders and followers. Uh, you're going to find uh, certain events that are hosted and organized by companies that are about to make a profit and they treat it as an activation. And there are companies that treat it more like an actual event with uh, uh, subscribers, with followers, with attendees and so on and so forth. Um, uh, what I noticed, uh, at least what we noticed uh, uh, at Mobile, is that the variety of the suppliers has definitely increased both locally and internationally. Uh, uh, more and more people are uh, targeting certain interactions, certain type of events that they actually want to be associated in. Uh, they're promoting their services. And of course, the track record of these companies, uh, before us as a brand get associated with anybody else, the track record of these companies and the events that they hosted helps a lot in terms of deciding this event is going to be good or not. Uh, we get a lot of really interesting proposals. And usually when we remember, oh, so this is the company that hosted that event, and I remember that event was not that good, uh, we automatically say, uh, no, thank you, and we move on to the next option. So brands need to be aware in terms of what kind of uh, track record they're looking at to avoid uh, creating that kind of stigma with the audience. Because again, once yeah. you lose that audience, it's a very hard uh, path for you to win them back again. So definitely, uh, 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 the organizers learned and the growth of the market is a big uh, segment of that. But of course, there's ups and downs uh, in that growth. I would just uh, add, add a quick point on, uh, on the ice point here. It's very important for all tournament organizers to understand um, the, 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 the nuances of broadcast and how the nuances of broadcast work and how the live business work. And they need to really understand also as well that in order for us to have a very successful live, it's very important for us to understand, obviously, how the reaction of the crowd goes to the live, how they interact with the Twitch channels, how they interact with the registration process from putting your email to participate in a tournament at, and until you receive the prize pool. Um, it, it has to be a communication that happens at every single layer, from the moment that they participate up to the moment that they sign off from the tournament itself. And they need to have a very clear communication with the organizer and a very transparent tournament with the organizer that is available almost all the time. You're talking to kids who are 16, 17 year old. They don't understand how business works or how the business should be working for them. 
all what they want obviously is to have a very good play and they have a very good organizer as well to kind of uh, provide them with that space. So it's a very challenging space. And to your point, absolutely right. They will not forget if you fail. So the trick is really not to fail and to really keep improving as you go. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, we have really lots of interesting questions. So hopefully we'll, under, we'll answer most of them. Um, a quick one for you, Joe, um, an interesting one. It's, so Mobile is definitely a, a great uh, case. Um, however, not every company is Mobile uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, size and, and budget. So with clients being nowadays more budget conscious, uh, how, how, how such an operation like Mobile is scalable budget wise? I think this, this is the, the interesting thing and the beauty about the business that it is scalable. It is something that can vary from a very small budget to a very high budget. Uh, the scalability of this obviously happens uh, in the context of time and in the context, uh, in the context of the amount of content that you create. Uh, people get really, uh, uh, you know, they think that doing something uh, as the mobile stuff or any other tournament or content is really a huge amount of money. It's really not. It's, you can really win uh, with small tactical initiatives and with really budget efficient uh, uh, cases. Doing a small gaming activity is really not a lot of money, but doing it right is obviously what is the importance uh, of it. You can reach it through, uh, you can reach gamers through uh, doing content, throughout obviously branded uh, elements with streamers, throughout uh, obviously creating uh, uh, some ads, uh, sponsoring teams. There are a lot of avenues where you are able to really have quick gains without really going all in. Uh, and identifying also the community at hand is really important. So it's really not a lot it's it's really not a lot uh, of money but it's smart money basically uh, and, and a rebound question on this one is on a project more mobile or on a typical project what's your lead time uh, to to create such a, such an activation um i mean the lead time obviously to create something like um, i mean mobile is obviously a big case because it had a brand campaign uh, so there was a lot of strategy and there was a lot of a production of content that happened from a video standpoint up to a really talent standpoint up to a tournament. So we're talking about three months to do a program of that kind of specific size. Uh, but sometimes you can do stuff within a month. Um, the, the beauty about the industry, it's very agile. We are able to activate it very quickly. We were tasked to create a Fortnite tournament for mobile during COVID-19. So we have done this obviously within a couple of weeks while everybody is in their bedroom. Uh, and we were able to pull, pull something like this uh, and that's the beauty of the business, that we are able to do it remotely and quickly and efficiently uh, with cost-effective sh- solutions that provide great, great ROIs. So based on the brand case, based on exactly what the budget are, we are able to sue eventually what we want to create. Great, thank you. So I see a lot of questions on, um, you know, what are these budget-conscious solutions? Can you share the presentation? And so on. All of these, um, I, I suggest we... We take this offline afterwards with uh, you people interested. Uh, Obviously, we could have made this webinar last uh, an hour more or two hours more. Uh, So we try to address things top line and give you relevant examples. But then for sure, you may have questions relevant for your specific industries, your specific budgets. Uh, We would be very happy to take this offline with you and provide you with more insights uh, on specific game, on specific industries. Uh, To continue on with a couple more questions, probably. Um, so I see some very expert questions. Um, so we mentioned a lot, uh, the platforms like, uh, Twitch, uh, YouTube live, uh, and a bit of an expert question, but it's, why didn't we, uh, why didn't we mention Mixer here, Joe? I mean, there's, there's around 20 live streaming platform in the world, 2022, even right now, uh, the Chinese uh, platforms are dramatically increasing by the minute. Uh, we didn't mention Mixer because sadly Mixer isn't really, didn't really pick up in this region. So it's just for presentation purposes. We have displayed Twitch, Facebook Live and YouTube Live, which are the most prominent streaming platforms in the region, uh, obviously by the numbers and by the platform itself. But Mixer globally is moving very aggressively by acquiring Ninja and, uh, and uh, I think Shroud as well uh, joined, uh, joined Mixer. So it's something to watch for the future. For the ones who don't know, Mixer is a streaming platform that is owned by Microsoft. 
Okay, so I, I'll take two more questions. Um, and this one is also, uh, it's very important for, um, for, for any brand who want to enter this space. Um, it's, it's about the publishers. And what are the challenges uh, we are facing as we be there, but also as a, what challenge a, a brand would face to work with a publisher? So to work with Epic for Fortnite or to work with uh, Tencent uh, on PUBG, for example. I mean, publishers, uh, they have a lot of, uh, they have their, their intellectual property that they have created, the game itself, which is their most important asset. So they are obviously, as creators of that intellectual property, they are very protective of that IP. Uh, they want to obviously hand that IP to the right brand first and to the right uh, partner as well to be able to operate this. So whenever we want to work with a publisher, there's a lot of, it's a hefty process, but it's a very important process for them to protect uh, their assets. So we have to discuss with them about the brand that want to integrate within it. Uh, we want to discuss with them about the way that we want to create the content about it. And we want to discuss with them about the time and the scale of it when it comes to the production value. Because obviously, if you create something that is not very good, they will not allow you uh, to, to work with them, obviously, moving forward. So it's a very challenging business from our end because it's a trifactor. It's, it's, it's with us as, as, a, as a content creator and a producer of content and tournaments. It's with the publisher who have the game and the intellectual property. And it's with the brand also as well to be, to be able to kind of coordinate between these three in line to what the publisher wants to do is the challenge. But from a, again, from a publishing standpoint, if you are in line uh, with their strategy of the content that they want to create, if you are in line with their uh, guidelines and rules and regulations on how to activate their intellectual property, there is a way, there, there's always a way. Great, thank you, Joe. Um, I'm, I'm looking at all the remaining questions to take a last one. Uh, lots of interesting questions. So. Sorry if we can't understand all of them. Again, very happy to take them offline uh, afterwards. Um, okay, a last question is, and it goes a bit beyond the, the, the mere scope of this presentation is, uh, so beyond communicating with gamers or changing a brand's perception, create an activation, uh, what are the other opportunities for investment in the gaming and esports industries, specifically in the region? Well, in the region, the investment right now lies into probably three areas. So the first area is eventually, and by all means, uh, the creation of games. You have seen games like Latin and Arab and uh, a lot of games that have really local uh, presence and very strong local presence like Rise of Kingdoms uh, that are really heavily, uh, heavily advertising their, their games within the, the space. Uh, Salatin al-Arab is a, is, an, is a Chinese game that is owned by, by, by locals, uh, is one of the most played games in the region. So investing in game creation is a space that a lot of people are going into. The second one is obviously in, in esports and teams, similar to, uh, to, uh, to any other region. Obviously going and creating teams, buying teams, investing in sponsorship of the teams and the players and growing that kind of industry is, is an area that is going to grow eventually uh, within the next, uh, within the next, uh, obviously, probably three to five years, I would say, maybe less. Uh, the last area is the area of content creation and publications and publishing content when it comes to gaming. So obviously, uh, as the ecosystem we showed earlier, there's the game, there's the esports teams and the talents, and there's also, you know, the media. So if you look at right now, you see a couple of prominent areas like Saudi Gamer and uh, Millennium and a couple of you here and there. I think there will be a lot of room of improvement and a lot of room of growth when it comes to the potential of investing in these spaces, uh, investing in creating content in publishing content and covering also esports games and events and activities and even considered as well to create events. So I would say probably these three areas are the areas where investment opportunities lie within the region itself uh, for esports, for the esports and gaming industries. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, I believe it's time to end this webinar. So big thanks to Joe, to Luai for attending all the very insightful information. Uh, thank you for everyone for attending. I hope you found this interesting. Maybe it sparked something, maybe it confirmed some of your intuitions. Again, we're very happy to, uh, to, to take this further with you offline, to share more data, to share the presentation, um, please do reach out uh, and we can continue this uh, with great pleasure. 
Uh, thanks again and have a great day and a great weekend. Ahead. So we are back day three at DGC Live and it's our third session with Tipe Mobile and Unity. And we welcome for this one, Freddy Munir, Platform Engineering Manager at Tipe Mobile and Steve Taylor, Product Manager at Unity. Today, we're gonna be discussing with you gentlemen, maximize your game revenue with one single integration, the technical element, and you will be showing us also how we can integrate with the demo on the UDP platform and the benefits of the partnership as well with Tipe Mobile. So I know that both of you have a presentation, so I just want you to say hello to the audience and then we can start the presentation. Hi, Habib. Uh, hi, Steve. Uh, I'm uh, Freddy Munir, Platform Engineering uh, Manager um, at Tipe. Um, it's a pleasure being with you today here at uh, DGC and having this uh, session to discuss how to maximize your game's revenue with a single integration and to distribute your game to um, all the countries and stores in MEA through Tipe Store and Unity Distribution Portal with the least uh, engineering work uh, required. Um, hi, Steve. Yani, can you tell us more about the Unity distribution uh, portal? The mic is yours. Thank you, Freddy. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, really happy to be here at uh, DGC. I'm Steve Taylor. I'm a product manager for Unity. And the product I'm in charge of is called Unity Distribution Portal. And I will tell you more about it. I think you're familiar with Unity. Uh, Unity is a game engine. Uh, that is used by more than half of the games out there, uh, specifically more than half of the top thousand mobile, uh, grossing mobile games um, uh, are using Unity. And, you know, I can quote examples like Mario Kart Tour, like Arena of Valor, like Call of Duty Mobile, all use Unity. Unity is more than just a game engine. It's also an ecosystem, as you know. There's services that we offer to the developers. And I'm in charge in one of those, of one of those services, the Unity Distribution Portal. What is it about? In a nutshell, when I ask developers like you, why isn't your game on every app store in the world? The answer is always, well, oh, it takes a lot of time and effort. Uh, so many SDKs to integrate. I don't really know where to get started. It's confusing. I'm just not sure it's worth the effort. Because the situation is like this. If there's 20 app stores out there, and I'm talking Android app stores, alternate app stores outside of the incumbent, uh, usually you don't know there's 20 of them or 20 is just an example, but you just don't know the Sony out there. Maybe you know a handful. But then there's 20 SDKs to integrate, 20 builds to create, 20 developer consoles to get your game out there on 20 different app stores. And then you have your reporting coming from 20 different places. So yes, it, it is very tedious to, uh, to manage. So Unity Distribution Portal wants to address that problem. Right? Uh, it, there is revenue. To be, to be made in these alternate stores. And we want to change this situation from a single build, uh, a single SDK to integrate, which means you only have a single build to manage and you have a single console to upload that build and prepare your submission, yet you can submit to those 20 stores. And when your game is live on the 20 stores, the reporting comes into a single place, which is the UDP console. So that is what I'm going to be talking about later. I will show you how this works uh, from the implementation standpoint all the way to actually pushing your game to the stores. So I'm going to hand over back to Freddy, who's going to talk a little bit more about um, TPA, and I'll see you uh, right in a minute for the demo. Thank you, Steve. Um, thank you for that uh, introduction about UDP. It, it makes a lot of sense. Um, to say how it really works in terms of the distribution. Um, TPay is the first and biggest mobile payment gateway in the uh, MEA region. Um, TPay enables payment and subscription management through DCB, direct mobile carrier billing, mobile operator wallets, and bank wallets using mobile identity. We enable payment and collection from 54 plus mobile wallets, direct carry billing and bank wallets that use the mobile identity in the whole MEA region. We cover 24 countries, 
which unlocks 580 million users. Users, I mean mobile uh, network subscriber. And from the 580 users, there is 480 million Android users in the MIA region. Um, so for any game developed by Unity distributed in any uh, of our stores, we have this access to mobile subscribers slash Android users. This means that TPay will enable payments, collection, settlement for all game developers through in all our uh, coverage using our local presence in um, these countries. Today, uh, basically we are a payment gateway, but today we are announcing and uh, showing how uh, and we will take a look on TPay Store, which is our new uh, baby product, which boosts TPay positioning in terms of content distribution, using our uh, coverage in uh, um, across the MEA region. And we enable game developers to distribute their content in all our coverage operators and uh, countries. TPay Store grants game developer access to all the operators in me when i'm talking about access it means that they can monetize and do collection uh, through uh, the mia uh, coverage we uh, provide games are distributed to all tpay operators with a single click on the udp the unity distribution portal so we have we are announcing TPay Store, TPay Marketplace, which is fully integrated with Unity Distribution Portal in order to take the games published there and distribute them to all our uh, marketplaces and uh, operators uh, we are connected to. Uh, TPay is all the operational processes through uh, uh, out the MEA presence. For example, uh, collection, collecting money from the operators, uh, settling it with the developer, the reconciliation, and all the support cases we uh, as TPay handle. So you just publish the game through UDP, you select TPay store, you select the countries and operators to publish the game in. With a single click, you can monetize from all our uh, 54 uh, plus operators and uh, um, uh, wallets we are connected to, and we handle as they pay all the operational stuff and the collection and everything um, uh, that is needed for any uh, developer. And at the end, the gamer enjoy their games and paying using their mobile number, which deducts the amount from their direct carry billing wallets any payment um, method that use mobile uh, identity. I believe uh, it's time to get uh, yani, uh, some hands-on. Uh, so the mic uh, is yours, uh, Steve. So I'm gonna show you how UDP is implemented and this, uh, into a game and then this game um, submitted to, uh, to the stores. So this is a project, it's actually an internal Unity project. It's a game called Trash Dash, it's a runner game uh, it's actually an, uh, an asset that is available on the Unity Asset Store. So it's it's a real game. Um, I'm going to show you here. I can enter play mode, and uh, and we're going to start playing, right? So this is the game that I'm that I'm going to uh, implement UDP in, right? So all right. Let's get started. So I've already done some work in that game, right? I've already implemented uh, the UDP uh, SDK. What is the UDP SDK? We've been talking about Unity Distribution uh, Portal, UDP. It's um, the UDP SDK is an in-app purchase SDK. You implement it once so that you don't have to implement it for each of the stores you're gonna be distributing to. So. There is a documentation that explains how it works. You, know, you need to do, that would say, the regular things, such as uh, initializing your SDK, um, querying inventory, uh, purchasing a product, consuming a product. So that requires a little bit of code you know, that you do once 
and for all into your game. So I've already done this in this game here. I've, I've, I've done the code part. And once you have uh, implemented all of this, uh, you want to list your in-app uh, purchases into a catalog. And you know, I'm going to give you another example here. If I enter play mode and uh, I, I load here the premium shop, um, you would have the list of all the products that you can buy for real money, right? I'm not talking about the, the objects that you can buy with a grind currency. I'm talking about the product here that you can buy with real money. So um, I'm going to show you how it works. It's here, UDP settings. I'm going to load my game. So again, to give you the context, I've done some of the work. I've actually already created a, a version 1.0. And let's just give you a real life example. I've created that game. I've actually already submitted it. And I've realized that uh, the economy is not working the way I would want to be. You see, there's two types of products in, um, in, the, in this game, right? So let me just go back to this scene and back to the shop. But you see that we have here the fish bones, uh, which is a grind currency. And here you have the sardines, which are the premium currency, right? So uh, let me just bring up the settings again. So I've realized that my players actually just like to grind for the fish bones. They're not really purchasing them. So I had a product here that says you could buy you know, 500 fish bone for 99 cents. And, but people are buying the premium currency. Right, um, and my combo pack of which is a mix of fish bones uh, and sardines is also not so popular. So you know, I've just decided that well, if people are buying the premium currency, maybe I need to create um, a new product uh, which is going to improve the monetization of my game. So just copy here this product ID. I'm going to add a new product, right? And I'm going to give let's say I'm giving here fifty for two ninety nine. So I'm going to give a hundred and uh, 50 premium sardines for 5.99. So that's double the price, triple the value, right? So that's a hundred premium, right? Uh, great value for money. There, okay. So I'm gonna push that. So here what I have done is I've added that product to my catalog. So it doesn't get automatically added, right? I would still need to do a little bit of work in the code just to make sure that when that purchase happens, you know, that amount of premium currency is unlocked, et cetera. But I'm here only showing you the end part of the implementation. So I've, um, I've added my IP. What I would need to do now is just to build uh, my game, right? So I build, okay, I'm not going to show you the whole build process. I've already built that 1.1 uh, ahead, of, uh, ahead of this demonstration. So I have it already built, but you know, normally I would build it and here you go, right? So the next step is um, then what happens after you've built it? You go on the UDP console, right? And you see my game is already here. Um, before I go into the detail of uh, preparing a game for submission, just quick uh, walkthrough of the UDP console, right? You have access to the documentation. You see it's here. Um, you have access to the partner stores, so you can see which of the stores you can actually address via UDP. You see TPay is one of them. And each store has a section that gives an explanation of uh, um, what is their business about, what is their geographical coverage. And there's also some very practical information to get you started and understand better how the channel works. Right? So, Let's dive right back in. My game Trash Dash. So you've seen me just now add a new IAP and build a new version of the game, right? So here I'm preparing my game for submission. So I've already created my V1.0. So all the stuff is already there, right? Let me go into edit mode. So I'm not gonna change the icon. Um, I'm not gonna change the description. Um, I'm actually good with the, with the screenshots. I could, you know, I could add one if I wanted. Let's say I want to add here this one, right, etc. But okay, I'm not going to add any landscape images. This is a portrait game. Um, here, this is my 1.0, right? So I want to replace that, and I'm going to upload my new APK here. My 1.1, you see, it's here. There you go. Right. So I'm going to let it load. Um, 
the premium, uh, uh, the sorry, the in-app purchases, the in-app purchases. So this is this is the item that I just added, right? So see, it has a USD price, um, and now I'm just going to convert this into all the local currencies here. Uh, and you, know, you have control over the local pricing. So here we're just doing a conversion basis, the dollar, but you may want to adjust that, right? So specifically here in Diram, maybe I'm going to round this up to 25, right? Say, and if I want uh, here, let's say the Egyptian pound. So this, um, let's say I'm going to make it say 60 Egyptian pounds. So this is where you can take into account the local pricing, right? Is your USD price uh, adequate for each market? And specifically here, this is where you would need to interact with the people who are the specialists in the market, uh, in this case, TPay, right? For the Middle East region, if you're gonna submit your game through them, they can tell you, well, you know, your, your 0 0.99 USD price bond should convert to that many dirham in, uh, in the Emirates and that many Egyptian pounds in Egypt, etc. cetera. Yeah. So there. Um, no, I can I can do this. Let's say I'm going to flag this one here. Let's say I'm going to round it up this one to twenty um, here and and for the Egyptian pounds, I'm going to round that one down to say uh, fifty. There. All right, done. I'm going to do the other two uh, here. So I'm going to round that one up to four and the Egyptian pounds here. Yeah. This one, I'm gonna make it 10 there. And finally, this one. So I'm gonna round that one up to 12 for the Emirates and, and here, this one, I'm gonna make it, let's say, Let's say 29.5, like, let me make it like a nicer looking price. You have control over that, right? You set the prices and the currencies. Okay, um, you know, what I could also do is, is adjust the way my products are called. So here just go 150 premium, but maybe I want to call it a sardine value pack. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, yeah, it's always better when it's spelled properly sardine value pack here there and um, you know if you have a lot of uh, IP products you can actually import that directly but the whole notion here is that what you've entered in your in your editor early on what you saw me do in the editor actually syncs here with the console so you've entered the catalog of four product or rather you had three you added one it's synced here with uh, with the console so you can take it over from you. here you have additional information about integration test accounts here. You could, uh, what's new? Yeah, my, my APK here is, has fully uploaded. So we have now the version with 150 premium. Yeah. Um, my APK, which implements UDP and I've uploaded it. I have my game metadata, the screenshots, the descriptions, um, and I have my catalog of IP products. So I'm gonna create a release um, so this one, I'm going to call it V1.1, and it is still my suburban uh, version. So I'm going to call it suburbs, suburbs. And this is my version with the 150 premium IAP. Here. So that's my release. So here we're just asking you, did you actually test your build? Of course, you need to test your build, right? If it's not going to test, if it's not going to work now, it's not going to work further down the road. So yes, I have done my test. You have a sandbox, you have access to a sandbox so that you can, um, you can test that your UDP build works properly. So this is now the second stage, right? Where you have access to all the stores that um, you, you want to distribute your game to. So... Let's look at TPay specifically here. You see you have access to uh, all the operators that uh, they cover. So here you see that we cover 11 operators. Uh, Freddie, do you want to talk quickly more about the operators that you're covering? 
Uh, yeah, uh, Steve, um, this is uh, what we cover for uh, phase one of this project. Uh, we will be adding on a lot of operators uh, in uh, later uh, phases uh, to unlock the 54 plus operators we have. And when any developer submit a game to uh, these uh, uh, operators, we treat each operator as if it is a different marketplace with its own branding, a branding related to the operator and the country. It used the language and slang of the people living there in order to have like um, better conversion and wider spread of the uh, game and the downloads. We are talking to each um, target audience, uh, each gamer in a country with his language. Uh, so this is uh, how we are thinking about the operators. We are thinking of them as um, a single standalone marketplace, not just the TPay with the TPay branding. Each operator has its full branding, slang, language, use it uh, uh, for the target audience um, and different games as well, uh, different preferences. And I will talk about the recommendation engine we have uh, going to build uh, in the roadmap of the uh, marketplace. Thanks, Freddie. So, so you have control over where you want to distribute, right? So if you, uh, for instance, don't want to distribute to Jordan, you can just take out Jordan. If within Egypt you want to only select uh, certain operators, you can. You have full control over that, right? So here I'm going to distribute everything. Now, the notion of here, repack, submit, this is this is really, here you're looking at the mechanics of UDP. How does it work? <laughs> that build that you saw me create early on in the editor is what I call the generic build. It's the single SDK, single build that you have to manage. We take that build and let's say that I'm going to, to submit here to three stores. We are not going to jam three SDKs into that build. We're going to take that build, clone it into three builds, and each one of them, we're going to unpack it take out the generic sandbox environment and put in the store specific SDK instead, right? So the me get apps build is going to get the me get apps SDK. The Q app game store build is going to get the Q app SDK and the TPay build will get the TPay SDK. And then we repack these builds uh, individually and then we submit them to the stores along with the metadata and the pricing, etc. So that is what repack, repacking a game does. So you could choose to either just repack your game and have a look at the APK, uh, test it, or you can just repack and submit, uh, which means that you're doing that repacking and uh, then the repacked APK along with the metadata is going to be submitted to the store. So here in this example, I'm just uh, going to say to just repack my revision two for uh, the, the first two stores and I'm going to submit it to TPay. Off we go. Oh, um, forgot to show you. You have the access to the advanced section where you could do a little bit more uh, if you want, for instance, to tweak your pricing um, per, uh, per operator. You, you have access here again to the prices uh, that you have set and you can modify them if um, you want to do some tweaks to your submission on a country or operator basis. Uh, uh, right. Yeah, and uh, Steve, if you allow me to comment here, uh, that our commercial team will be helping the developer to put the right um, a price for their game uh, by giving them more details on the ARPU per country, per operator, uh, the, the, um, uh, how the behavior of the end uh, user or gamer and how uh, if they are willing to purchase uh, with that amount or not, uh, uh, this um, um, uh, TPay will, yani, TPay has a lot of extensive experience in this part that we can help our de uh, developers uh, select their prices and um, the targeted markets and so on. Yes, of course. Yes. Thank you, Freddie. Okay, so we're set. We're going we're gonna to publish. So here I have a, just a warning for the Me Get App Store, which is perfectly fine. It's something that I know about a package name is going to get modified in the process. But for TPay, you see where here, here's where the work starts. The UDP machine is set in motion. Uh, the build is being repacked for all three stores, right? 
And uh, for me, GetApps and QUP Game Store, I've just said, I just want to do a repack. But for TPay Mobile, I said, I want to repack and submit it. So what is going to happen now is that the game is being repacked. The UDP machine is unpacking these, uh, these three builds, repacking them. So you see this one is done. The other ones will be done soon. After the, the game uh, has been repacked for TPay, it will then be submitted to TPay. And once it has been submitted, then the TPay the team will review it, right? So yeah. rather than wait here for everything to actually fall through, I'm going to show you the revision that I had previously submitted, right? You see um, here it got repacked, it got submitted, um, TPay store reviewed the game and, uh, and accepted it. And you see I have granularity here over uh, all, the, all the telcos that have reviewed and accepted my game here. You see it's got repacked, submitted, repacked, submitted. So here I'm all green. All the telcos have accepted my game. Do you see it's still, it's still in process, right? Because, well, my, my bill was repacked um, and you see it has been submitted successfully already. Um, but now TPay is going to work with the telcos uh, to, to, to do the store review and, and acceptance. So here, your, your game is on its way at this point of time. Um, and you know, the last thing you would probably want to do once your game is accepted is then have a look at how it uh, performs. So here, this is my demo account. So unfortunately, uh, it's not extremely lively when it comes to charts. You see it's, it's all zeros, um, but you will have access to your all-time revenue, your recent revenue, IP performance um, with metrics such as RPU, RPPU, uh, game health, with uh, your MAUs, your DAUs, your retention rates, et cetera. Right. So here we go. This, this wraps up my, my demo. Uh, I hope it is clear. I've shown you how UDP is implemented, uh, how you add products into your game, you build it, and then you bring your game here to the console, prepare it for submission, submit it to the stores. Um, and, and from that point onwards, then your game is, is already knocking uh, at the doors of, of the different app stores. Uh, Freddie, I'm going to hand back over to you. Okay, thank you, Steve. Um, it was very uh, clear and elaborative. Um, uh, once uh, the developer published the game uh, through the UDP, as Steve uh, showed, uh, we take all the revisions, test it, make, all the, uh, make sure that all the operator regulations um, applies uh, because uh, it will be shown on a portal branded by the operator for that for that country. So we make sure that the game is eligible to be published uh, um, on the operator uh, OTP slash operator marketplace. Um, I will show you um, uh, how the store looks like, but with um, a very minimal branding um, branded by TP, which will not be the uh, commercial thing. Um, I'm sharing my screen. Uh, this is how the store uh, looks like. Uh, this is the store. Each mobile in a country has its own branding. This is the original one without branding. So uh, it is more familiar to the gamer living in the country, the subscribers to that mobile operator. As you see here, uh, here we can see uh, the user, uh, how the gamer can uh, check the game details, check the pictures. Uh, this is the game, uh, the same game uh, Steve was uh, publishing uh, in the UDP. And this is the marketplace in a mobile uh, view. Uh, uh, we enable uh, an HTML uh, uh, web uh, discovery portal for the operator, but it is mobile responsive for the, uh, all the users using uh, Android and so on. So uh, as you see here, uh, the end user can see the images, the YouTube video, the description about the game. Uh, there is a huge roadmap for this tour uh, to build a recommendation engine, rating engine, uh, what are the highlighted games, what is the highly preferred one in, the, uh, in that country. Um, here, as you see, the user do login uh, on the uh, portal in order to uh, see the uh, purchased uh, games and uh, etc. Uh, and uh, now uh, let's move to see how the payment is done inside the game uh, itself. 
So uh, the in-app products uh, 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 Steve uh, mentioned, uh, they are set up on the uh, UDP. The prices is put in local currencies. And now uh, we will see a game um, uh, that we are testing uh, currently and how uh, the uh, in-app purchase uh, works. Uh, now uh, let's see how the in-app uh, uh, purchase uh, works. As Steve said, you set up the in-app products and let's see how it works on a game that uh, we as TPA are currently uh, testing. Now let's see how in-app products, uh, how in-app purchases works. Uh, as Steve said, you set up uh, all the in-app products inside uh, the UDP, put local prices and Let's see how uh, it works uh, here. The gamer opened the games. Uh, he needs to uh, do a login in order to receive all the consumable and non-consumable uh, uh, products he already purchased under uh, the same uh, account. Then he clicks and uh, purchases a certain coin. The, uh, our uh, payment page opens that knows what is the uh, product needs to be purchased. The user just enter his mobile number, send pin code. He receives one time password in order to verify the purchase. He just entered that password, then click purchase and payment done. And uh, the uh, coins or the product he purchased is um, uh, redeemed. Um, so I believe this shows what TPay really uh, do. Um, payment without any information, just your mobile number and all is um, done. Um, I believe uh, that we are um, done, uh, right, Steve? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Freddie, for this demo. No, thank you, Steve. It was really... Uh... So this is our last session with Unity, but uh, I'm sure that so much is happening from your end uh, on the meeting platform and you've been meeting developers and integrating them on the platform and showing them this great opportunity uh, that UDP and TPay Mobile are now offering developers from our region, international developers, to, to, to bring their games really uh, globally and, uh, and, and to all markets without any, any more of all of these barriers that happen. And Freddie, I wanted yeah. to ask you just to, to, to finish this uh, sure. session. Uh, what, what about career billing? Okay, uh, career billing um, is the uh, opposite for uh, the new payment direction uh, rather than the bank uh, or credit cards payment. Because the percentage of bank population, especially in the MEA countries, does not exceed 15%. And the direct carrier billing coverage is much more higher. The number of mobile uh, operator subscribers actually in some countries are double the number of people living uh, uh, in it uh, because each one has like one or more subscriber to mobile operator um, subscriptions or SIM cards. So the coverage of DCB is much more higher than uh, the uh, credit cards or bank population. Everyone has mobile, everyone has a SIM card, so everyone can do payment without having a real uh, credit card. And on the other hand, DCB is more secure. Uh, it is not sharing uh, any confidential data like credit card or any other information. Payment is just done using the mobile identity. And mobile identity now is used in a wider uh, um, um, very widely, yani more than the DCB. Uh, for example, we can see a lot of bank wallets using the mobile identity. So it's DCB is much more safer, higher coverage, and easier way of payment. And TPay handle all the operational thing of the collection and getting the money uh, from uh, the countries. That's perfect. I mean, uh, we've seen the great work that uh, TPay Mobile has done in the region in the past years. We also know how much Unity is always on the forefront of making it so much easier for game development and game developer yeah. and really at all levels. And I believe this is only uh, a great opportunity for our region 
as well as uh, you know uh, uh, for the developers themselves. And we, we, we thank you for all you, that you are doing as Unity and as Tpay Mobile to grow the ecosystem and also make sure that every developer has a chance to bring his game to an audience, to users, and yeah. also to be able to monetize on it. So yeah. thank you very much, gentlemen. And, thank you, Habib, uh, so much. Thank you, Freddie. Thank you, Eddie. And uh, we hope to see you again soon. And we hope that also uh, you will bring us even more uh, news and great things that can just make everybody's life so much easier. <laughs> thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, sure. More to come. Thank you, Habib. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. It was That's pleasure. the plan, yes. Thank you, Habib. <laughs>final session with HTC and should we say you guys kept the best for the last 100% 100% and today we are uh, speaking about virtual reality and location based entertainment I think this is one of the most amazing and exciting part of, of, of virtual reality and it really engages the audiences directly and what I love about these these uh, setups is that they're always really out of this world Really, it's it's uh, it's amazing. I totally agree to that, and I couldn't uh, uh, say anything more. But then, uh, point is, it becomes super immersive versus, uh, let's say, playing at home. So it gives you a different experience altogether. And the second part is the socializing part of it when you go to, uh, let's say, LBs where they, you have VR. So I, I totally agree. And we have also two guests with us, uh, joining us on the Zoom call. We have. Mr. Hussain Shaban, who is FEC manager of Extra Life in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and Mr. Plutarch Lee, who is AVP VR Enterprises uh, Solutions for HTC, joining us from Taiwan. And we really thank Mr. Plutarch to take the time to be with us today uh, and really share his experience as well in uh, location-based entertainment. And I mean, we've had some crazy sessions with you guys in the past two days. We were live as avatars. We were also uh, discussing the r r remote uh, location, the, the remote workplace. So many things, and now we're into location-based entertainment. So let's not uh, delay it more. Daniel, maybe you would like to uh, us to start the conversation. Yes, uh, thank you, Habib. I mean, we're very excited today. I mean, me as a child, I grew up where. Uh, there was internet cafes, there was Ataris. This is, was the limitation that we had at some point. But today, if you see fast forward 20 years, uh, we are seeing evolution of the gaming industry that's taking you a totally different environment. And today, this gaming cafe is becoming an arcade, it's coming in location-based entertainment, and it's growing so fast that we are offering to this new generation a totally new experience. We're very excited also that with HTC Vive and Vive Land, we've taken this concept, and for the first time in the Middle East, we have a, an example in Saudi Arabia with, the, with Extra Life, where people can really replicate this global model and can enjoy this experience. I hope it's not gonna be the last uh, one. I'm sure there is a lot in the pipeline uh, through, through our partners, and uh, I'm glad to have um, our lead uh, pioneer, Mr. Plutak from Taiwan, to talk to us about this great experience, how we capitalize on it on a global level with HTC and Viveland, and with Mr. Hossein, how he has taken this initiative with all his passion and his team's passion and replicated it in the Middle East. And we want to show you how you can take it uh, through other partners and why not other people can take this example and initiate it in this part of the world. For sure. So I guess now we can hear Mr. Plutarch. Uh, hi. 
How are you? Good, good. Uh, so, Mr. Plutarch, as Daniel said, uh, you will be explaining to us uh, everything about Viveland and uh, the, it's, it's all yours now. Yeah, I will uh, introduce the, the two locations uh, from uh, HTC Viveland uh, in Taiwan. So, Habib, I will just uh, first uh, take you through with some uh, uh, brief concepts about the LBE part. Let's dive into details. And then, obviously, Plutarch can give us example on the actual Vivelands, which he's operating. And then Hussein can come in and talk about what he's doing in Saudi Arabia. Sure. So, just to uh, say and thank you for, for giving us this platform to communicate. So, in terms of LBE per se, I guess the acronym people are still not aware of. Uh, it's called location-based entertainment. Uh, the main difference between uh, LBE versus a uh, normal uh, gaming center is where we are talking of creating a virtual uh, environment to give you the immersive experience which you can't do it, let's say, physically sitting at home playing in PC. So just to give you an example, let's think of uh, you playing Counter-Strike at home in PC versus going to, let's say, VR Park in Dubai Mall, where they have created an entire space with a battlefield with some grenades, guns, and you're playing with your friends. That's the main differentiation factor which LB can bring into the picture of the whole gaming space versus when you're doing it socially, uh, I would say individually at home. So that's briefly the concept of LB. Uh, just to give you names of the biggest LBs around uh, in the globe, we are talking of uh, likes of Hologate, we are talking of uh, zero latency, but when it comes to HTC Vive Land per se, the biggest USP what we have is end-to-end -end solution. So right from the stage of designing the concept layout till the time your LB is launched, we are working with partners hand in hand, taking it to the next level. So that's where our differentiation or USP comes into the picture versus uh, competition brands. Uh, when it comes to VR in LB, and as you have realized after trying Vive Sync, how cool it is to yeah. be inside VR, how immersive and how real it is versus, let's say, uh, sitting in front of a 2D screen and playing. So definitely VR is the next level of gaming. Uh, obviously, it, in order to come to mainstream, it will take some time, but LBA currently is a medium through which we are trying to expand the gaming and entertainment industry and tap the customers to enter into the VR space. Uh, so that's basically the brief of uh, the concept. Uh, now what I'd like to uh, talk about is mainly the trends in LBE. What are the games people like to play? So when it comes to LBE, there are few contents which are being very popular now. One is free roam. So the concept of free roam is where you are not tangled with any wires, you're, you're using wireless headset, let's say, or a backpack PC with a tethered headset, and you roam around uh, within the area free from any, let's say, block. That's amazing. So that's pretty cool because think of a situation like uh, a hypothetical situation in a five by five space or a 10 by 10 space, you have eight players playing against each other and they're moving around. At the same time, VR also lets you make sure that you don't go and hit each other because obviously- we No, have, I was gonna say that. <laughs> yeah, so we have taken that into consideration. So as of now, the main contents uh, in uh, LBE is free roam. And the second is escape room. I'm sure people must have played escape room in real scenarios, but VR is the next level concept because here you don't have to create a room with the interior as such, because you can just have an empty room, put VR and you're in a different place. So we have titles from Ubisoft like Medusa's Gate and some other titles which are pretty cool. And these are the current trends which LBs are kind of catching up uh, in the market. Of course. Uh, I just wanted to give you some example of uh, how LB is also helping in esports. Now, this is one key uh, place where people are interested in playing games for a longer time because there is some target or there is some plan to go where you're talking of either ranking on a leaderboard scale or socially competing on an online platform, global platform, where obviously they host challenges. I'm sure you must have heard of PUBG tournaments, Fortnite tournaments, same thing in VR, we do esports events, and we have few titles uh, which are specifically for esports. And these are getting really popular uh, when it comes to your uh, VR in esports. Uh, business opportunity wise, let's say if you were to start an LB, why would you do that? Uh, so uh, my suggestion or my uh, idea behind this is, a, uh, obviously it's the new level of gaming. So 
at the end of the day, if you want to adopt something early, this is the time uh, because this is going to come anyways. We are adopting things from West. In West, we have seen so many LBs which has come up and this is becoming very popular. So eventually it will come. Uh, second, it's a very good socializing place too. Uh, in terms of a crowd pooler. So obviously, when you have an LBE, apart from your game as such, you will have your FNB part and you have other entertainment parts. So definitely it adds to the overall business uh, model as such. And then hosting esports tournaments. So working with, let's say, esports community locally here and hosting tournaments. So these all leads to several business reasons why someone has to or should be interested in opening an LBE. So these are like from a business opportunity perspective. And then we have, I just wanted to introduce the Viveland concept and what exactly we do for LBEs. Mm. So as I told you, uh, we do right from end to end solutions, starting from scratch, design, layout, till the time we launch. Apart from that, we also help uh, using the LP location in doing a lot of uh, educational uh, contents, which is called edutainment per se. Mm. So like school trips, you bring students and give them some educational content. Plus we do some enterprise training if required using that space. So that space can be used for multiple purpose. Mm. And that's where the Viveland concept comes into the picture where we are talking of a total solution, not only from a gaming perspective, edutainment, as well as training. Uh, these are the ways uh, how Viveland supports. Uh, obviously, uh, how, as I said, what we provide is uh, from a content management, hardware management, software management, training, end-to-end. -end. So I will not get into details, but as I said, it's like end-to-end, -end, so you can rely to us for anything and everything. Uh, in terms of content, uh, we also hold IPs of various contents, and we have contents uh, categorized in different sectors. So let's say for family entertainment, we have some contents. We have some content for hardcore gamers. We have some for children. We have some for elderly people. So we have segregated our entire uh, a content portfolio in different segments. So you as a LB or anyone who wants to open LB can pick and choose what they want. And based on that, we can customize the space and uh, let's say do the interior designing according to the games and contents you choose. So that's how we work uh, on from a content perspective. Uh, recommended space, we have some recommended spaces uh, which is required for multiplayer games, uh, starting from five by five uh, meter space to 10 by 10 meter, depends on uh, number of people who wants to you know participate or join in the game uh, Just to give you some example. I will just uh, quickly show you uh, some uh, Trailer of a couple of our content which are AAA content and being widely used and we are using this content in all our LBs in Taiwan as well as uh, in uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, I hope we will replicate the same in uh, our region too, in UAE specifically. So I'll just give you a glimpse of the uh, content uh, video for your understanding. Covering fire! 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 So this is basically a glimpse of a multiplayer content and the next video is a glimpse of free room which I started off the conversation with. That's really with. intense what we just saw now. It is and think of a situation where you have this kind of an environment created yeah. and then you play. Uh, that's pretty cool. Uh, so this uh, next content is all about uh, free room where you basically can move around uh, without any wires dangling and this is something which is also a trend in LBE currently and this is the content.
Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> really. <laughs> That's actually quite what a better way to be inside the video game. Hundred <laughs> uh -huh. percent. So now we would like to uh, basically uh, ask uh, Plutarch to talk on the Taipei Viveland, uh, which he has started and he has been managing. And uh, yeah, he will take us through on this slide. Perfect. So uh, yes, uh, we have uh, two uh, permanent uh, Viveland store in Taiwan, uh, in Taipei City and Kaohsiung City. So the first the Viveland okay, uh, in Taipei, we. Uh, that was built uh, in uh, 2016. So in this side, uh, we have uh, 28 HMD and also the space is uh, about uh, 330 square meters. And totally right now around like uh, uh, 30 experience. And uh, we can offer uh, about uh, 50 people in the same uh, space at the same time. And uh, uh, yeah, here, here is uh, some numbers uh, in the operation. Before the uh, COVID-19, uh, the utilization rate of the uh, machine, of the equipment is around like 30%. So uh, based on the financial uh, estimation, so it, we almost like get a balance around like uh, 20%. So once the utilization rate, uh, more than 20%, uh, we get profit. Yeah, so that's uh, something uh, we can share to, to everyone. And uh, uh, here's another number is about the uh, repeated customer. Uh, so uh, right now it's around like uh, uh, average is around like 15 to 25 uh, percent, depend on the different seasons. Yeah. So uh, yeah, the repeat customer is kind of uh, our uh, focus to do the marketing to have a more uh, event or more uh, membership membership uh, system uh, to uh, invite uh, the customer to come back to experience the uh, the new content. Yes, yeah, that is the uh, major marketing uh, event we are doing. And uh, for next slide, uh, is uh, is for the uh, Kaohsiung Vineland. So this side is a bigger, is a bigger one. So the total uh, space is around like eight hundred and twenty-five square meter with uh, around uh, sixty HMDs. So it's allowing uh, like a hundred and fifty percent in the same space. So. Uh, because the space is big, so uh, actually uh, we host, uh, we held uh, two uh, ESPO event uh, in 2019. So uh, you can see the the image. Uh, we have uh, two uh, big space uh, for for ESPO. The space around like 10 by 10. So we have two uh, such kind of uh, space. Yeah, and uh, we treat uh, this uh, Taipei and Kaohsiung uh, violent as a demo site. So. Uh, once we have uh, any uh, new content or new idea or new design, we will uh, try to uh, adapt uh, to this uh, new location. So based on the, the idea, so we all the content from Violin, we verified uh, in this uh, two area and also uh, we do we correct uh, the user feedback and uh, try to understand uh, the user's test. To, to define ourselves, we define ourselves as a, a VR LB a total solution provider. So all the content, all the, the operation, we needed to verify in these two places. So uh, we do the, we create the SOP after we uh, try the content and uh, understand uh, the user behavior. So we create, correct uh, and uh, create a lot of uh, material. So once we have uh, the business engaged with other uh, customer, uh, we do provide such kind of uh, SOP and also uh, training material to our customer. So uh, the next this page uh, is a video to show the uh, the Taipei and Kaohsiung Island. So uh, you can see from this video, uh, we have uh, several categories of content. Uh, with, uh, Again. And also, uh, we have a space for a sport, we call it sport arena. We have a seven VR sport in this area. Something is a bed for badminton, weights, and also tennis, archery. Yeah. And you don't need that, right? You don't need him to speak, so we just want to do it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so uh, next is uh, the location of Kaohsiung Bayern. And all this area is a space, a uh, larger space. So we 
we have more content, more than more than more than And uh, uh, in this page, you can see uh, that is the uh, pop-up store uh, uh, for our uh, new in-house content module, so-called uh, Dinosaur SR. So in this content, we have the integration with the AR and the VR technology, and also with the simulation chair, fan, and the heater, uh, and also the high-quality content about the dinosaur. So uh, in this experience, you will truly uh, feel the breeze from the jungle and ocean, and also the heat uh, from the uh, lava. Uh, so it brings you into the real and the immersive uh, drug world. So it's kind of, uh, we do uh, in-house in work uh, to create content with uh, simulation uh, chair and the fan and the heater. So uh, next page, uh, you, you, you can see uh, this is a spaceship. So this is a video, uh, you can feel the content. This pop up store. We also built a violin uh, with partners at Hong Kong uh, in 2019 and also worked with Etra uh, Husen uh, to build up one site in uh, KSA. And later on, I think Husen will introduce more uh, information about uh, this site. Thank you, Plutak. Uh, very insightful, and uh, hopefully, this model can be replicated elsewhere as well. Uh, now I have with me uh, Mr. Hussein from Extra uh, Saudi Arabia and he will be taking us through his experience how they were able to bring a similar concept to this part of the world. Uh, hi, hello, hello everyone. Hello. Good to be here. Okay, uh, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, really uh, be given this opportunity to talk about uh, Extra Life. Uh, the newest concept in uh, tech-based entertainment uh, today, which I also uh, humbly consider to be the top location-based entertainment in the Middle East today. So, to first to begin with, I have uh, to explain uh, what is Extra and what is Extra Life. So, Extra is the group. Uh, and uh, if you if you live in the region or or if you work in retail, you probably know or uh, heard about extra extra stores. So right now, extra is the largest omni-channel electronics retailer in the region, and in extra we are in continuous search for new venues and create opportunities such as this one. And it was obvious for us that the entertainment industry is being revolutionized in the Middle East and especially in Saudi now. So it was a great time to enter the market. So we have Extra, the group, and we have Extra Life. And I hope I'm not going to confuse you for the rest of the presentation. So briefly about the group, we have uh, Extra, the electronics retailer, about 44 stores in Saudi Arabia, and more stores in Oman and uh, in Bahrain. And we have... Uh, the service company and we have Taqseed company, service company, which is an after sales and installation company. Taqseed is a finance and micro loans company. And finally, uh, Extra Life. And Extra Life is the latest project by Extra Group. So talking about Extra Life, the tech-based entertainment and especially the VR entertainment industry is a new industry and an untapped market. And it's only going to progress from now on. It will only advance. So it's a good time to enter this business. Back when we began working on uh, Extra Life, 
Saudi was the second biggest spending country on e-games in the Middle East, preceded by Turkey. Now Saudi is the biggest one in Middle East. So Saudi gamer is the most spending gamer in, uh, in the Middle East right now. And looking at the population, 60% of the population is youth under 30, under 30 years old, with approximately 5 million active gamers who, who spends on average triple on what other gamers spend. So as said, the opportunity was so obvious for us. And the first thing we had to do was look for the right partner. And of course, we reached out for HTC's Vive Land. So how can we create the hotspot? How can you create a hotspot? How can you attract youth? So it's, it's basically combining three main key, key components to achieve the four pillars of a paramount hotspot. Combining gaming and entertainment with dining and social uh, to achieve an iconic LBE, an addictive destination that offers a great experience which is suitable for everyone, gamers and non-gamers. The concept, as said, had to be an iconic concept. It has to be something uh, that was never done before. And people had to feel different when they enter. They, they need to see different, hear different, and even smell different. So it had to be very unique. Um, let's watch a, a, a short video about uh, Extra Life so you understand the concept a little bit more. Okay, thanks for watching. So, as you can see, these are a couple of pictures from uh, Extra Life, from inside uh, Extra Life. And this is, these pictures were taken during a weekend. So we've succeeded in attracting uh, the, 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 the targeted segment we wanted. So going through the journey and, and, and uh, designing uh, the concept, there are keys of success that cannot be missed. If, if you miss one of them, it's, it's a, it's, it's, you're bound for failure. So the most important one is selecting the right partners. Uh, we had many partners on this project, and it makes a lot of difference how a good or a bad partner can affect your progress. Um, the second one is de designing the correct customer journey, what the customer sees and hears. This includes everything, branding, pricing, and like what we said before, how to spark the senses of your customers and let them do live their fantasy, which is our slogan. The third one is content selection. So all what we said before are keys to every or any LBE success, but in a gaming or a VR entertainment based uh, LBE, you cannot miss on uh, content selection. Because having the wrong games or the wrong titles, and I'm not saying bad games, I'm saying the wrong games, or a mismatching game to your audience will brand you boring or will brand you which will stick to you and it, it's, it's, 
it would make problems for you. So the fourth one is, uh, is merging the social components of what people look out in each culture. And this changes from one market to another. Store classifications, it's one of the great uh, things about this concept is its flexibility. So you can offer, you can, have, you can actually offer uh, a wide or a, a good variety of uh, stores and shapes. The first one, the flagship store, is the bigger one for dense cities, more simulators, bigger areas, more customers, higher capacity. The second one is what we have now in uh, our uh, <clears throat> first store, a versatile medium-sized store for medium-sized cities, less dense cities. And the last one is the movable store, designed to be moved around with activations, carnivals, and such. Thank you very much, Thank uh, you. Hussein. Thank you uh, for having me. Very valuable input, and uh, uh, we really look forward to uh, seeing uh, more uh, similar concepts uh, around the region. Uh, I've got a few questions to both of you, if you don't mind. Uh, for the sake of time, please, can we limit every question to maximum two-minute two answer uh, so we can um, address um, everyone sitting at home or remotely accessing uh, the event. So, Mr. Plutak, I would like to first ask you uh, a little bit about uh, what is the current um, trend for LBEs from a content perspective? Uh, we've seen uh, free roam and escape uh, room content, but uh, how do you see these evolving um, uh, in the location-based entertainment industry? Yeah, I think uh, for the location-based content, uh, we want to address, uh, we need a uh, more uh, social effect and also uh, we need to uh, some attraction uh, to uh, attract uh, repeat customer. So uh, I would say uh, free learning and escape room content are uh, two uh, major trends uh, we, we, we foresee will be, uh, become uh, more popular and popular uh, for VR content in LBE. So I want to address uh, for the escape room, Actually, uh, for the traditional escape room, uh, it's already very popular, especially, especially in uh, Asia and also uh, North America. And uh, the, this content already be proved is very attractive and uh, uh, very uh, good for social. <clears throat> so uh, I think for the VR uh, escape room, there has some uh, uh, strengths compared to the traditional one. Because the uh, the traditional one uh, usually uh, need a bigger space and also need a, a lot of investment uh, for the decoration and they need to uh, renew the, the content, they need to uh, re decoration again. So, but uh, for VR, uh, usually uh, uh, they need a smaller space, usually like a five by five uh, square meter, then that's good enough. and. Uh, Dollar investment because uh, the the VR escape room usually uh, you can uh, in the same location you can replace the content regularly but uh, you can uh, leverage the same hardware the same equipment you don't need to do too much uh, decoration so it is a save a lot of uh, cost so you can uh, have a lower uh, fees uh, investment also in the uh, VR escape room. Usually, uh, you can have uh, several content in the same location. So uh, it means uh, the player will come back to play the different content. For the traditional one, uh, usually uh, the owner will change the decoration, change the content, say uh, yearly or uh, two years. So, but uh, for the we are escape room, you can have the same have several content at the same time. So that is a strong reason to have the customer come back again and again to try the different content. And they will also expect when is the next content will, will, will public, will release. So that is a uh, very strong point. Thank uh, you very much. Uh, Thank you. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, I'll move on to uh, uh, Mr. Hussein uh, for a question that a uh, lot of people asked when we start supporting on this project is that, 
Uh, we know Extra is being um, a significant uh, electronics retailer um, and home appliances in the region. Uh, we, you're famous with your mega sale uh, uh, festival every year. I mean, what, what got you to think about something like this out of the box, totally different? And you, you, you're doing it very well. Thank you, Fayot, uh, for the question. Actually, um, we have this exposure to the electronics market. So we, we can see what's trending now. We can see what's going on in the market. We can see the tendencies of people, what they like, where they're going. So in terms of retail, everything was pointing at this direction. And at the same time, the direction of the country was entertainment. So this is the entertainment in the way that we can do, technology-based. And uh, the, the, the concept of the VR LBE, I think it's here to stay because if you remember the rise of the arcade, the arcade disappeared from most part of the world because of the console. But then people started missing the, the social component in the gaming, the multiplayer, being on the same place, playing together. And this is very limited now. I'm not talking about online gaming. About I'm, I'm talking about the actual social interaction. So this is here to stay. And, and, and uh, I think that most LBEs will have to come up with other ways that people interact together in, in such ways. Great. Thank you very much for that. Very insightful. Uh, one last question for Mr. Plutak as we're running out of time. Uh, we've seen, Mr. Plutak, that uh, most of the RBEs, they work from afternoon until late at night, where morning time has been, you are thinking with your partners about creative ways to bring audience. We understand that kids are at school. We understand that uh, youth are at university. But we've seen some nice edu entertainment uh, initiatives to drag uh, traffic uh, to these uh, LBEs. Can you uh, tell us a little bit about those initiatives and what's next on that? So uh, you are asking about uh, how to uh, more utilize the LBE locations? Yes. Yeah, so actually uh, we do have uh, a lot of experience, uh, experience in this. And uh, take uh, the example, uh, we have the uh, Kaohsiung Violin. So basically I uh, initial a program to install the educational uh, content uh, in the Kaohsiung Violin. So uh, including they have some content for K-12 and also some content for popular science and some content for arts. So uh, I will invite the school to come to uh, visit and experience the content. And uh, usually uh, the, the school in Taiwan, uh, especially for primary school and also the junior high school, they have uh, several uh, activity in every semester so they are very happy uh, to join such kind of experience and uh, we always utilize the morning time and uh, the, the, the the time uh, because as i just mentioned usually the utilization rate of the the lb is like 30 percent 40 percent so we have a lot of time uh, okay. space uh, to uh, so such kind of arrangement so based on the feedback from the school uh, that is very positive and also it uh, also it uh, utilize the time of the, the location and the environment and the equipment uh, for the uh, arcade store Great. because we have like 60 uh, HMD in the location so it's very uh, helpful for the finance and also uh, for educational uh, purpose. Very interesting, thank you very much. Um, one last question for Mr. Hussein. Uh, uh, we we want to know from you, what are your plans for expansion? Uh, where do you want to go next? And will, will you have a franchise model ready to be replicated in this part of the world? Okay, um, for expansion, we have a rapid expansion uh, plan that's been disrupted with the current situation in the world, as you can imagine. Uh, but as soon as things go back to normal or the new normal, we'll continue uh, expanding. We, we, for now, we will uh, expand to uh, uh, metro cities in uh, Saudi Arabia, and we have plans to expand beyond that as well. Uh, we will disclose, of course, that afterwards, um, but uh, not right now. And uh, for the franchise model, uh, we are working with HTC on a franchise model. We're just um, uh, 
perfecting uh, the operation uh, side of it because it's it's new and um, needs time. So we don't want to jeopardize any of our partners. And this is part of, like I said before, it's selecting, uh, it's key, selecting the partners. And we don't want to put them in, uh, we don't want them to test for us. So we will do the test. We will finalize everything. And we will support the, uh, the uh, franchise Great. model. Uh, thank you very much for, for your time. I want to thank uh, Nicholas for taking us through the location-based entertainment trends, uh, activities, and current uh, content. I want to thank Arabia uh, from uh, Extra Life, who is giving us uh, this valuable experience and real life experience, how they converted the LBEs into a great success story. I want to thank also Mr. Pluta Kli from Taiwan, who's uh, leading our teams uh, in enterprise solutions for location-based entertainment on VR. And finally, I want to thank um, uh, ITP for this platform and for this valuable input where we are now uh, due to the current situation, we are still able to reach our audience and interact with them and make this experience available to everyone. Of course. And it's really amazing. I mean, you guys are always on the edge of uh, the next big thing and the next big experience. It's, it's really amazing and it's so captivating to look at it and, uh, and just by watching a video. So just imagine you're, you're in it. It's, uh, I think uh, HTC is always, you know, taking it to the next level. And this is really interesting as well. And for DGC as well, and for, uh, of course, all the VR developers, because we are very pretty much into uh, developers as well. Uh, this is a really exciting time to start creating crazy content. And why not start seeing also some local content, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, we have seen some local companies doing experiences and uh, like Mr. Hussein also, you know, creating these spaces and, and, and going into that uh, uh, environment. But we want to see more local content as well being created, maybe more culturalized content, etc. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank and you. Uh, this was our last session with HTC. And we hope to meet again very soon for some crazy ideas and experiences. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you, Abib. Thank Bye -bye. you, everyone. Kareem, uh, 
Uh, welcome back to the studio. Thank you for uh, having me again. We are on the third day today of DGC, and uh, so we've seen you in one of the biggest projects in location-based entertainment that is going to take place in Abu Dhabi. We've seen you launch the great Transformer VR with Hasbro, and uh, really, I mean, the, the trailer you, you, you showed, the teaser you showed about it, thank got you, everybody thank drooling. You. Thank you, thank and, you. Uh, and now we are welcoming you back for uh, eSports. So yes, it is. Robocom <laughs> VR and GameX, which is a, uh, an eSports organization. Correct. And we have with us the CEO of GameX uh, from Lebanon, Mr. Hassan Gandour, welcome. Good to be here. Thank you. The, and uh, so, uh, esports now. Yes. Uh, what, what, what is it? V, <laughs> VR esports? No, VR no, location no. based esports? What? No, well, the thing <laughs> is, uh, as you saw uh, on the interview with Mataz and Al Qana, we're venturing into esports, opening the first uh, esports academy in the region. Uh, with that being said, I think it's only uh, right that we get into the esports industry. And our business in the VR industry in itself is only going to lead for it to be a competitive sport, just like esports is. Of course, Hassan will get into the more uh, technical details of the industry or the statistics and whatnot. But uh, as the overall vision entails, uh, I really see VR merging with the existing platform that esports or the landscape that esports e provides. And it is only in due time that these uh, VR gamers uh, will, when, when it's commercialized and it has uh, much more users than it does now, it will only need to, uh, it will need to turn into this competitive uh, industry uh, that revolves around the teams and the tournaments and, and the whole organization that Hassan will get into later. But yeah, it's an exciting new venture for Robocom and uh, we're glad to uh, have a, a home-based country. You know, I'm originally from Beirut, Lebanon as well, so it's nice to see uh, like-minded individuals from your home country that are doing uh, something uh, similar. Uh, Hassan, uh, tell us more about your esports organization and uh and then you can also speak to us how you uh, decided to join how with, you uh, met Robocom. With, uh, with Kareem <laughs> and Robocom. But I'm, I'm, uh, I'm also from Lebanon, so I'm really interested to know uh, more about your esports organization in Lebanon. So basically, we started around a year and a half ago. Uh, I'm a gamer. I've been always passionate about gaming. Uh, I've been uh, monitoring esports in general around the world. I see it growing on a daily basis for the past, uh, past couple of years. And uh, I teamed up with my partners here in Lebanon. I, uh, we told them about the idea. They were very interested to join. And uh, basically, we started it. We saw the lack of esports organization in our country and in the region in general. We have a big, big uh, gaming community in our region whether it was MENA or GCC, but we don't have anyone to cater to that talent. So we decided to venture into that business and take it to the next level. And then here we go. We're sitting here now. And uh, I'm not uh, very familiar with the esports scene in, uh, in Lebanon. Uh, and I don't believe there is too, so many teams also that are from Lebanon. Uh, so I would be really happy if you can, you know, Explain to us more uh, what's the esports scene in Lebanon? How do you see yourself uh, branching out not only to the region but globally? And of course, now with this partnership, maybe you will also have uh, make benefit from Kareem's uh, connections and uh, and his also his uh, his presence in the gaming industry in general. Uh, give us an idea, Hassan. So as I said, the gaming community is vast, but the esports scene is uh, relatively weak because you need someone to organize it. You need someone to take those teams and to uh, provide proper mentoring and provide the proper setups and everything, the environment for them. So what basically here we have just individual players organizing their own personal teams and trying to compete, but that would never reach to high levels. So what we want to do is to be uh, mentoring those teams, mentoring those players, the individuals, taking care of them, 
the practice, uh, everything to providing the proper setup. We want to cater to their needs so they can reach the global stage. Uh, and that's basically what we want to do. Um, on another note, like we have so much potential, but again, nothing's organized. Like no one provided anything to these guys, to these athletes. I consider them to these players. And to me, there we have a lot of potential. Like I see them, I see these players on different levels, on different games, reaching the highest tournaments, the biggest tournaments worldwide. So Karim, uh, I mean, like Hassan is saying, uh, so you would like to enter esports. We know that there are the other projects, and it might make sense strategically. Correct. But uh, you, as Hassan is saying, it's. Uh, why did you decide to uh, really invest your time and, and, uh, and resources into an esports team? Well, it goes back to the fundamental issue that we were talking about earlier about uh, uh, the ecosystem in general. You know, uh, when you want to uh, support the ecosystem, when you want to advance the ecosystem, you can't just advance it from uh, one avenue. You have to uh, penetrate every single leakage you see and as Hassan was mentioning we don't really have that support structure uh, for esports organizations and teams uh, and this was what I wanted to give to the industry in general so being part of the game industry of course specific to VR but you are still part of the industry uh, and being part of the industry we wanted to be able to give back to esports organizations because uh, other than the money you know the talent is there there's a lot of talented individuals that have the potential to go places and having a project like Alcana and working with brands like Hasbro and Discovery Channel and just being able to have such a reach uh, and being Middle Eastern mm. actually gives us this platform to provide for these individuals and this is what we wanted to give back to the community mm. after all we're, we're after all we're very community oriented mm. and we wanted to give back to the community in terms of just having this game house, this organization, uh, everything to provide them to be able to reach the peak of their potential. Mm. And uh, I also know uh, from Robocom uh, that all of your uh, team are f from the Middle East. Oh, and correct. You, you, and, you, and you never actually uh, used anyone that is from uh, outside of the Middle East. Correct. It was always 100% uh, homegrown yeah. team and... Uh, Although you are working on international Not that we're biased, titles. you know, but it's just... No, no, <laughs> but actually it's, uh, it's interested. Uh, it, it just links back to the, your belief in, in the local talents right. and, and growing them. I, I guess this is the only way, anyway, yeah. to, to really grow this. Uh, Hassan, I, in, in terms of esports, uh, you know, we, we had a lot of sessions uh, on esports. Esports was a, a real focus uh, this year in DGC Live. Uh, how do you see... Uh, what are your challenges, uh, I mean, on a, not having a real ecosystem, not having things in place? I mean, it, it, it must really make it um, much harder for you. And how would you like to see this changing? It is very challenging, to be honest, uh, for, for on all levels, on all levels. Like, let's just start from simply the mindset of the players, because they lack the experience to be part of, or, uh, to be a part of, uh, a big organization they need a lot of motivation and in general the as i said the community is big but it lacks a lot a lot of things to be honest but with time everything will work out and uh, esports is growing it's 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 gonna skyrocket it's already skyrocketing day by day month by month year by year and we want to take our region and skyrocket it on an international level uh, challenges like are definitely there but like um, it's you can easily overcome it you know what I mean uh, the lack of uh, basically everything like let's say in Lebanon in our case here let, just from the setup perspective like uh, from the internet that uh, was a challenge we got the best one in Lebanon as a provider the best ISP provider IDM as a major sponsor for us so we had to tackle all these subjects before we actually uh, start competing on any level. So but hopefully everything will be overcome. And uh, the fact that we joined with the Robocom, uh, that helps a lot. And that would take the esports organization to another level uh, with a much shorter time than it should have taken us by now. So if, if we were to go a little bit specifically, 
as a yeah. as an as an owner of this or esports organization and also a founder uh, what are the missing uh, steps that you need to see in order to progress what is really missing because you know a, a, a lot of i've been hearing this for over the past three days and i would really appreciate if we would go more into some specifics like okay i have a team but my 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 team members or my players need this and this and this and then we're not able to provide them we need to go into global championship but we're not able to do this uh, in order to compete we need to qualify and we need to you, you see what i mean i can answer the first question and hassan can do the rest yeah first time me and hassan agreed to open the company oh. he said i need a twenty-five thousand dollar computer for each player i said what <laughs> that's more than a car <laughs> and this was i think the first challenge of, of getting into the esports industry very expensive hardware nonetheless of course this is not this is not a restriction or this is not a, a complication but it's it's, it's one of the things, I think, and the tools you need uh, to be able to compete on the level. And Hassan can tell you the rest <laughs> of the things. <laughs> well, we can take it step by step. Like, for example, these challenges, honestly, are very difficult. But as I said earlier, easily overcome. To me, I believe you need the best possible setup. You need the best possible hardware when it comes to specs and PCs. You need the best possible internet due to lag connections and everything. Uh, like... Uh, just a simple fact, my boys have competed in so many tournaments and because of internet issues, they just lose connection to the host and due to the fact that we lost connection to the host, we lost the tournament or qualifying. So just from an internet aspect, you need like very stable internet. You need the best PC hardware setup for your players to be able, for your players so that your players can perform in the best way possible. And your players have to have the discipline. You need to provide to them. You need to cater to them. Like these athletes are young. Uh, this industry, in a way, it's new. It's changing on a daily basis. You need to cater to their daily needs. Uh, you need to consider them as your own children. Like if you have a family, you need to look out of their food, if they're working out. Because like in our esports organization, we put strict programs because definitely they need to work out because health to me is very important before actually competing because we see we see so many players i've been reading and researching a lot recently so many players at the age of 21 19 20 they're retiring and these are pro athletes they're retiring due to health issues because organizations are not taking care of them from a health aspect what well, this player he's 21 why do i want to put all my time and energy in a young player where i'm going to use him for two years as an athlete and then just he retires. That's not our mindset. And it's all about after the player retires, you can offer him a job as a content provider, as a content creator, because he has each player who has his fan base, his community. There's many, many aspects to work on. And honestly, it's very challenging. And if you want to dissect esports, esports itself and esports organization is actually a couple of businesses in one big business. You know what I mean? You have the content creation side. You have the tournament side, you have the athlete side, you have uh, uh, fashion apparel side. So it's a whole bunch of things connected to each other and they all have to work systematically for us to reach uh, our goal, our vision, and for us to be one of the biggest esports e -sports organizations in the world. And if you put a plan, for example, now, uh, and let's say you are... I wanted to ask a question, by the way. Yeah. Let's say I'm a team in, in Lebanon and my internet is not working so well. Uh, do I fly my team to Dubai and compete from Dubai where the internet is better and still I win? Or, or is this... Is you have to ask Hassan. I only know about the... I, I also don't know, computer. but I mean, uh, yeah, <laughs> I know. But for example, uh -huh. Hassan, if it's such a big and important... Uh, I'm just trying to see how... Uh, when uh, and uh, That maybe... I can be more flexible or something. It's like, you know, going to a meeting, you know, and just taking the plane and then, you know, or, or is it, or am I simplifying it too much? I think having good internet, internet doesn't mean you're gonna win. It's just okay. part of the puzzle that you need to have for in order for you to compete at the best performance possible. You know what I mean? But having the best hardware, the best internet doesn't mean you're gonna win. It's all a big setup. You put the pieces of the puzzle together. And the basic thing 
what I believe, other than having a very talented, uh, a very talented roster in any game, you need synergy between the team members. That's the most important thing. If the team members do not have synergy together, in game and in real life, I believe personally we will never reach anywhere. They have to be a family. That's the entire uh, reason why we uh, emphasize on the gaming house. These players will live together, will eat together, they will go out together, they will fight together, then they will uh, make amends together. You know what I mean? That's why you have a team captain. The team captain usually is the one who uh, directs the team, uh, creates that synergy. Team, team, uh, team captain is different than in-game leader. So he's the one uh, that takes care of them, basically, on a psychological level as well. So the team captain uh, goes through a specific kind of, uh, uh, what do you say, um, specific kind of um, evaluation for, in order for us to choose him as the team captain. Uh, so Kerim, uh, I'm sure that now you, be you will be learning more about esports yeah. and uh, getting closer. Do you also see in the future a mix between esports and VR? We had, you know, during the past days, uh, a few sessions with HTC and uh, they showed us some incredible things happening between uh, VR, esports and esports and VR. And Hassan, I wanted to ask you, by the way, also, and Kerim, uh, which uh, there is always the team is always more specialized in a game, yeah. you know. So is it uh, CS:GO? Is it Dota? Is it uh, another game? So in your case, in Game X, Kareem, uh, uh, sorry, Hassan, is it is it more? Uh, can you tell us which game your team is playing more? So the first roster we adapted uh, will be in PUBG, Player Unknown Battlegrounds. PUBG. And, and yeah. yes, PUBG. And in the near future, because I, my, I'm a PUBG player. I love PUBG. I've monitored the game since its launch in 2017. I saw how uh, greatly it grew worldwide. Like that, that game is insane. It's insane. And there's many other big games out there. Out there. That's why very soon, we're going to adapt another game, and hopefully within two years, we're going to have around seven, eight different rosters in different games. And in this case, uh, we can have, for example, two PUBG teams. Like, there's no restriction, you know what I mean? But definitely, we want to adapt into other games. Uh, like, right, right now, there's Valorant came out. Valorant is, uh, is big. It's pretty big. A lot of esports organizations are adapting new rosters to Valorant. People are shifting from CSGO. Pro players are shifting from CSGO towards Valorant. Uh, so perhaps that would be one of uh, the games we're going to adapt. But uh, that's to be decided in the near future. All right. So, uh, Kerim, so basically now... To answer uh, your question yeah, about the yeah, exactly. <laughs> esports. Well, esports, Habib, in general, is a definition, you know. Uh, whereas uh, the game, the games, for example, PUBG, you know, it, it's a game. Uh, Dota 2, it's a game uh, that come from these publishers. Uh, whereas the platforms they're using are PC, PlayStation, Xbox, uh, let it be. Uh, esports, as a definition, is a sport, and uh, VR is a, is another platform, just like PC is a platform. But the usage of the PC for these publishers and these games are much higher than VR. So uh, in the near future, the only way it can go is to shift into a new platform, just like b b new platforms are coming out. It's only the, the other day Apple released Apple Glasses. You know, everyone was used to Apple Watch, and now there's Apple Glasses, and augmented reality is taking over. And, uh, and I think these things are going to become very popular because they're very efficient. So when the evolution of the hardware and the software comes to a point where it's very accessible with VR, you can just have sunglasses and they become VR right away, this is when it shifts in the gaming landscape, in my opinion, in the esports landscape. And we want to be ready. We want to understand the business uh, via a GameX organization. And once we understand the organization, we can integrate VR to become the new platform. And uh, in, 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 as, as I've talked about many times before, Ready Player One is, uh, is the inspiration we have. And this is where we wish to go. And we think uh, GameX would be a fantastic uh, addition to this vision. Well, I, I wish you all the best. And I know that this uh, partnership is still fresh. So 
congratulations. Thank you. And uh, uh, Hassan, we ho hope to host you the next uh, DGC, and you know you would have. Uh, looking forward to it. Excuse me. I'm looking forward to it. Yes, and uh, and you will be uh, you know winning with your team, and uh, we can host the whole team and. And you know it. We uh, gotta I, give you I a demo session the at the uh, DGC event in yeah, September. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. And uh, uh, so, Kareem. Uh, so I mean, this is uh, a new venture for you, and yeah. wish you all the best. You're doing a lot of things for the ecosystem, and uh, now esports, VR, uh, location-based entertainment so many other things as well. Event management. So, and event <laughs> management. So, <laughs> congratulations. And uh, I wish you all the best. Thank and you, we you. really love these stories that come from the region. This is all about DGC. Yeah, really. and, and just to add to, to that, I think the ecosystem uh, will be built uh, despite, you know, it's only a matter of time. And it's people like Hassan and myself and yourself uh, and Muataz and all these people that we've met uh, that have this passion to drive this industry. The thing that led me to invest in Hassan's company, uh, now a subsidiary of Robocom, is his passion. You know, uh, he was extremely passionate about uh, the industry in itself, and this passion is contagion. Uh, whenever you meet someone that's this passionate about something, you can not help yourself but to listen. And it, and he got me listening. And and when I listened enough, I said that this is it. It's time for the region uh, to take this step this next step in the esports landscape, and we wanted to be the ones uh, to really push push the ecosystem in that sense. Perfect. If I, if uh, I may add one more thing, uh, it's actually because you said, how did we start together? How did we venture? Like the reason why we actually ventured is when we first met Kareem uh, through his brother Basil, actually, we wanted as GameX uh, from Kareem, as from Robocom, actually a sponsorship. And then we started talking for a couple of minutes and then Kareem told me, listen, Hassan, wait, put sponsorship aside, talk to me about partnering up. And that's how everything like started from there, which is actually an amazing story. And I want to add one more thing, uh, uh, like uh, in our region, especially in Lebanon right now, we have a very severe financial crisis. Uh, the country is very unstable. And on top of that, with all that's happening in our country here in Lebanon, we decided to venture into it and into to invest in esports and build an organization with Karim and with Robocom uh, despite everything that's happening, which is amazing by itself. We want to show that what, despite whatever is happening, we can still do it. We can still uh, create more opportunities, cre create more opportunities for uh, as well from the players aspects because these players are young. They're 18, they're 19, you know, like financial situation, financial crisis. They're not going to find a job. If you are passionate about esports, if you are passionate about gaming, we want to show you that there's a way for you to be a pro player, to make money. If you're passionate about content creating, you, you have it. So we want to lead the way in our region, in our country, in our region from that aspect as well. Of course, I mean, that's all about entrepreneurship. It's challenges, obstacles. 100%. And always with the little resources we have, we make, uh, we still reach our objectives. Mm -hmm. So that's the whole spirit. Uh, life of gives you lemonade. <laughs> when life <laughs> gives you lemons, <laughs> you make lemonade. <laughs> exactly. So, on that lemonade note, <laughs> we have to end our uh, conversation because you know we are back to back in, uh, and and uh, we are welcoming uh, the another session just now. Thank you, Karim, again. Thank you, Habib. And for thank you, Hassan. Thank you. Thank you.
are back now with our last session on uh, Africa. And uh, we will be discussing today content monetization in Africa. And uh, we have with us uh, Sahar Salama from Tipe Mobile that you have seen already over the, the, the past three days. And uh, we have Kofi as well from Senegal. And we are welcoming for the first time Kaelu, who is uh, a Twitch streamer uh, from Madagascar. Uh, thank you all for joining us. We were supposed also to be joined by Olivier Ona from Ertel Telecom, but it seems that he is not online. In case he joins us later, we'll let him into the room. Uh, so content monetization in, uh, in Africa. We've seen over the past three days uh, many uh, challenges and opportunities related to the African continent. And of course, making money and how to make money with applications, or in this case, as part of DGC Live with games, is, is, a, is a very big question. Sahar, I believe you have, uh, when you founded Tipe, actually, you went into all of this challenge. Uh, because monetizing in, 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 in countries where you don't have easy credit card payments, you don't have easily uh, people that have bank accounts or credit cards, etc., is, is such a challenge. Uh, uh, can you tell us more than give us just a global picture of, uh, of monetizing content in Africa? Thank you, Harry, very much again. Uh, always a pleasure to be joining um, here and, uh, and, and, and always happy to be part of uh, seeing the progress happening again year over year, bringing together uh, more and more um, uh, uh, people from the ecosystem here sitting uh, in the middle of uh, the scope of Africa is very exciting to me. Um, uh, and, um, and back to your question, monetization. Yes, uh, since, since the early days of the establishment of TPA, this has been always a problem. The, f the great potential um, talent uh, um, that exists in uh, Middle East and Africa um, that, that, that was not captured by the current distribution infrastructure or monetization infrastructure in this region. And in order, honestly, to do monetization, it's not about launching a payment method only, or it's not only about uh, you know enabling one story or enabling one, one partner. It's it's about uh, you know like having a platform that does allow creativity, innovation, continuous creativity, innovation, and and, and you know trial and error and access story and. And you know, uh, uh, versioning uh, till you, you reach success. Because in the content business, you cannot really uh, you know do everything, and then decide how to distribute and how to do monetization. So it's a it's it's a, it's a, it's a process uh, that ha monetization has to be embedded in in order to tune and in order to be there. Second, in monetization, also is about uh, the, the 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 scale. So. Um, in, in, in many of our countries, even in, in the luxurious uh, or like uh, high ARPO countries, uh, you cannot, after a certain point, you cannot scale in the digital world, in the content world, uh, by only trying to focus on the local uh, country scope or uh, the local distribution arm that you have. Y y y the, the, the world has become much global and um, the demand and the interest in the content is is, is much bigger in, in the bigger pie. And, and the dream was to how to be able to export uh, your product to more and more audience easily uh, without the frictions and the cost uh, that, that is happening. And, and, and I'm, I'm happy and proud that, that, that at this point of time, uh, we built this uh, platform for MENA and we just launched in Africa and it enabled lots of other industries. Gaming was always very tough, uh, but again, uh, now more of the big players of the ecosystem, and we'll talk about it, like Unity has fixed for us this problem so that we really can unlock immediately uh, the Africa talent uh, in terms of distribution and monetization uh, in a decent uh, story that can, make, uh, that can make the visibility uh, um, and the gross of this industry happen. 
no meio hora na outra. Uh, Kofi, uh, yes. you, are, you have been also involved a lot in, uh, in the, on the African continent side. And uh, on the developer side, what are the challenges that are faced when it comes to monetization uh, of their games or their content today? And, and honestly, what, what are we talking about? We're talking about small casual games or are we talking about mid-core games? Is there a certain genre that is working better? Is it directly with the telcos? Is it through publishers? Is it just advertising, using games? What is the content first? Okay, so I think, I think that first, the, um, the first content is about um, uh, casual games and hyper-casual games. And it's important to understand also that um, we have a big influence of um, Western companies like Google on the ecosystem of payments. For example, if you see um, the population of smartphones used in Africa is about 75% Android smartphone. So uh, a developer right now in, in this region, West Africa, for sure, um, will select the choice to go on this platform. But at this moment, the first uh, problematic will be uh, the problematic of regional zone or financial zone. Uh, for me, who traveled a lot, um, a lot in Africa, the financial system from Maghreb is not the same from the East. It's not the same from the West Africa. And sometimes it's not the same from the South Africa. So it's a very big problematic about interconnection of different regions. And for how really an impact about that is not about the ground. You need to go to the high level because right now it's about regulation financial zone and decision of strategy of different country. For example, us um, at GCC, we, we were one of the first uh, gaming event producer to be sponsored by a bank in Africa, especially UBA Bank. When you talk about UBA Bank, it's a bank from Nigeria, it's about uh, 7 million customers who use this product. And we succeed to do that because first, we, we were user. So for example, me, I have a credit card. This credit card permits me to log on other platform, to be uh, logged on platform, for example, like, like PayPal. So first, the gamer will use this product for buy first. So if you don't have this experience to buy things online, it will be very difficult for him to think after the experience for create a product and monetize it. So I think that for me is the first level of education. And so far during 10 years, I never see a bank who have this from the traditional business. We have a credit card, okay? We have an ATM and we stop right now. We don't go further. We don't try to explore new frontier, new business model. For example, me, I know that in certain banks, sometimes people sell your product, but they don't know that this product can be, for example, connected to PayPal or Alibaba and so on, so on, so on. Because they are not, uh, they are not how to say that super, super ambassador users. This is how I call the things. This is the kind of users who have the capacity to, to research and to challenge very fast your traditional, traditional product. And with COVID, for example, uh, the problem is rushed because right now everybody used to monetize the content. So it's, a, it's, not, it's not, we don't talk about anymore about exploration. It's an, ob it's an obligation. Mm. And many developers right now in Africa always think or, have, or are obliged to do to check, for example, an account of Google in USA or in Europe for monetize in Africa because they don't know, because they don't have the, the right platforms 
and so on, so on, so on. So the, the, the problematic is very entire. Myself, uh, I begin to monetize uh, officially since 2015. I begin to monetize Emojicon on the, um, um, a messenger app called Line from Japan. And from Japan right now, I can monetize in 250 countries because I have a credit card. And when you go to the, the, the population of the credit card, you know that in many countries in Africa, the population is the less, bank, the less bank horizon. So people who have credit cards, they are in fact the elite. But in another way, we are uh, a boom about using of mobile money. And today, I think that the, the best solution is to understand or to link mobile money interfaces to bank and gaming API to have across a cross share a cross share platform because the population who uses mobile money uh, is a boom in West Africa I think that we have the one of the biggest adoption rates about mobile money mobile money so far in 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 Africa so how, you like, have any Sorry, I'm interrupting you, Sophie. Sahar, would you have any numbers or any... Yes, like, this is what we were talking about, actually chatting just before this session yeah. with, uh, yeah. with Kofi. We have been introduced that uh, I've been telling him now, now it's an invitation for every single developer in Africa currently mm -hmm. to at least be able to go to a known platform which, yeah. which is which is Unity, and find mm -hmm. monetization channels on mobile money in Africa, uh, ready and exported to MENA. On, exactly. on also as well for we have like uh, twenty three countries, fifty four uh, monetization channels, meaning uh, operators uh, that you can distribute and monetize in. So this is a starting point. It's not complete. It's not finished. We're still, uh, by the way, in Nigeria also, we're, we're going to okay. we're launching as well in Nigeria and in Nigeria, because we don't have good mobile money. So actually we're launching in Nigeria using the, the APIs of the banks as well. So it's happening, you know, it's happening. And I'm happy that I'm happy that you coming from the developer side and from inside the country, from the inside the industry, you did locate that this is the solution, uh, you know, which is matching our vision that we want to connect yeah. Africa across one single platform on the mobile money interfaces and on the operator DCB interfaces for MENA yeah. so that you can access this region and, and, and manage it. And, uh, you know, I'm very, very excited to to be able to to say so because, um, you know, with the help of Unity, uh, it wouldn't been it would have never been global. So currently, exactly. we're not talking about we're not talking about a small region or small. We're talking about any developer in the world, whether it is uh, a small local talent or whether it is big publishers interested to publish here in our countries. They yeah. would be able to just click a button and be there. And this is a huge chain that was really exactly. castles, you know, before. And, and, and um, I, this is what I am um, excited about. We're just launching, we just launched technically end of March. Uh, and uh, very soon you would see us on the ground in seven countries in Africa. Now all of the developers of Africa can launch their games in MENA from okay. Instant Unity by the way, and monetize all of the countries of Middle East. And I do, I'm, I'm, uh, I think, you know, we've heard all of that uh, potential and business talk and solutions. What about you? You are a, you're a gamer, you're a content developer, you're a streamer. Uh, and I believe also, Sahar, you mentioned that you were creating a solution for streamers as well. But uh, I'm going to hear Kailu a little bit now. And uh, uh, so what do, you, what do you think about all that? I mean, uh, it's the first time I meet a streamer from Africa and Madagascar. <laughs> so I don't know really what to ask. However, you have been listening to Sahar and Kofi. Maybe you can uh, tell us more about what you think about content monetization in Africa. Mm -hmm. mm. Um. 
If I take the case of Madagascar, we don't really have an ecosystem specific to video game industry. We can say that it's a, a field that is slowly starting to gain a place here in Madagascar, thanks to gaming events organized by passionates and entities. And it's hard to monetize content here in Madagascar. For example, for YouTube, uh, for there's a YouTube space which uh, is trying to work on that. The popular YouTubers here have an account abroad, which allows them to monetize their video in France, USA. So I say otherwise companies are gradually starting to call on content creators and videographers were often known as influencers to sponsor the content. And in my case on Twitch, if we talk about a donation system, we can't receive PayPal payment in Madagascar. That's why I have fortunately friends um, who are willing to lend me their PayPal in case I would get donations on Twitch. And however, for subscriptions, but our first income coming from Twitch in other countries like France or uh, the United States, they have the auto-entrepreneur status, which is more advantageous for small activities or freelance. Here, it's either an individual company, a SIRL or a LLC in USA, or SIRLU, equivalent to corporation, which is quite complex in terms of finance, charges, and taxes. Mm -hmm. And about the games developed here, they are ever not free or free, but with ads to finance them. Oh, uh, you know, it's clear. It's uh, clear. For example, uh, Sahar, you know, you have been facing these kinds of situations like in every country you operate in, right? Uh, true. true. Uh, but for example, if we take the case of Madagascar now, and, and Kailu, mm. she's a content creator and she needs to, you know, live from her, from her work, from her passion. What, what kind of solutions can we, uh, can we give her in that case? Yeah, I mean, it, there are always two ways of thinking. So she, I mean, everybody is looking at the existing ecosystem that she mentioned, uh, wherever that doesn't really come to the region because mm -hmm. they are not going to come soon and they you keep waiting, yes? Or you build your own version of the ecosystem from inside the region. And this is the second approach that we've been trying to do is that we have, uh, we, we let's go to the closest a chain that that can avail access in this region which which is the mobile money processors and mobile operators and build on top of them the platform for uh, mm -hmm. for, for for the content providers for all of the for every single digital industry okay in africa to monetize directly directly without any intermediary uh, in the middle from the consumer who is a subscriber of those uh, network operators and this was the idea i think the fastest route that we thought about to make it happen or we can control otherwise we do have all of these long-term partnerships exactly. coming in related to of course we are partner of google store and apple store and you know and 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 all of the stories of moving funds between the wallets and the pipeline etc but this is always following their roadmap and their priorities to cover and and in africa or in the Middle East, it was a story in the Middle East like five years ago. It was the highest growth in terms of uh, content, digital consumption, smartphone, and everything. But it was underserved in terms of the uh, monetization online payment. And we had to wait, to wait for things to happen. Um, so so this is how I believe that time, time is not on our uh, side to wait for uh, the international platforms. To solve our problems, and this is what I believe that we we are we are very advanced in Africa, uh, in terms of the stories uh, uh, globally in, in fintech and mobile money. Why not just add a little bit of layer that just start made this cross border platform for everybody in Africa to be able to access uh, Africa in terms of uh, pockets and in terms of consumer, in terms of reach, in terms of visibility. Uh, uh, and, and, and instead of uh, instead of the short-term hard tough 
root that Karin is 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 really uh, you know living every day. At the end, you are stopping the growth of tal- you know high potential developers. Yeah. I'm sure that they do exist. They will not survive waiting for all of this to happen. So how can uh, if I'm a developer or I'm a content creator, in the end, I, I you know I live where I live, you know. And I live with my, mm-hmm. and I I am born with my talent where I live. So, I I will ha- also I will also have to wait, for example, for uh, Tipe to branch out into Tipe Mobile to branch out into my country, maybe and bring me these alternative solutions for uh, for yeah. payment. Or or what do I do? How do I go about in the end? You go Car- directly Car- to currently. This is a partnership with Unity. We didn't want to go one by one. So I think that we chose to 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 accelerate, you know, and have the reach because uh, you know to go to the platforms who are willing to uh, innovate uh, for the developers and for the create creativity uh, kind of talent. So Unity did make the move themselves to go up in the value chain, and they want to. Uh, solve this problem of monetization okay. and access. So this is why we think that anybody in the world, uh, Unity is a uh, global. Yeah, yeah. I, they don't have yeah. to pay to, to number to, one number one product for game developers. Yeah, yeah. It is. It is 60% of. It is 60 to 80% of the uh, all of the games of the world. Yeah, all yeah. of the games that have been developed of the world. Exactly. So, any 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 and and i think all of the also uh, content in terms of uh, digital and virtual reality and even mm-hmm. the media kind of productions so what we what we 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 do now you go and create your content uh, there this use the access of unity that ha- they have built with all of the one click inside unity you don't have to export your code you don't have to redevelop you don't have to choose you don't have to uh, uh, wait uh, uh, for um, how to get your money how to get your uh, you know uh, go and click the button choose the market you want to be in in terms of reach and you can immediately start monetization how they will wait for tpay is that they will wait for tpay to cover that so currently we cover 14, uh, we cover, uh, sorry, 14 markets. Uh, by the end of the year, it will be 52 markets. Uh, so, 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 so this is our roadmap, it's not that far. Uh, but now, now you can start monetization. From 14 to 52? Yeah, actually we launched seven only in the very test phase of in March. Uh, six is going live as we speak now. Uh, and then 20 are going to be live between June till end uh, of uh, of the year, uh, and, and and when I say that, it's just not because of um, we're doing uh, local presence or developing. Just like um, you know, uh, doing it bit by bit, rollout by rollout, in order to tune even the product with Unity. I mean, we are we are they're doing amazing jobs. We're 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 building a whole ecosystem with them, and we it's new. So we're editing and changing and tuning. Yeah. Uh, before we can expand fully, you know, across in way or another. All right, uh, we are really running out of time, and uh, we have another uh, session just after you, of course. Uh, so I believe, well, it's positive for sure. I mean, it's uh, Kailu, it looks positive, and it's coming soon uh, to also solve your problems, and you can also now maybe connect to the Unity distribution platform. It will solve your problem. You will not have to wait anymore. Uh, Kofi, what you were saying, well, you have a credit card, but now also this can be accessible to so many other developers that maybe don't have this credit card. Or, exactly. Or let's call them content creators, not only uh, developers. And uh, exactly. Sahar, it seems that uh, over, you have found also the match uh, that is, you know, taking what you have already started to, because you already found solutions for millions of people in, in, in the continent since you started your operation. I mean, you made it easy for yeah. ma- millions of people to be able to have alternative ways of payment. Uh, and now I think with the, specifically for the developers and for the game developers and for the app developers and content developers, uh, and I was just mentioning that maybe you also had something related to the influencers, the content creators as well, 
maybe that's also another discussion, unless you want to summarize it very in, in one minute. <laughs> no, I mean, I don't want to go into this, but like, I mean, what whatever we're saying is that the ecosystem of the uh, production and creativity is 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 a value chain. And, and, and what we see is that once you create first layer, then we also uh, yeah. allow uh, to really propagate it to the rest of the value chain uh, so that so that the, it flourishes fast. So yes, we do payment and we do disbursement uh, real time for the for the for for example influencers, vendors, uh, market marketeers or whatever inside the country. And and, and 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 this is also a big problem for them to get immediate uh, real time uh, monetization uh, traffic out of the uh, out of the platforms of content in general. So. Yeah. At least one, so now I'm a content creator, I'm a gaming company, at least I know now that I will not also struggle in case someone likes my game, uh, in case someone wants to monetize and pay something in my game or in my app, at least I can earn that money without you know, losing too much on it or even never getting it or just you know, being frustrated and uh, and quitting one day because you know you can't uh, it's not because your game is not liked it's just because you can't you can't monetize which is which is really yeah. a great frustration for any content creator i mean so uh we thank you and uh olivier didn't join us so uh maybe we'll catch him on another panel very soon and uh, yeah. thank you very much for being with us for uh content monetization in africa thank you saha thank you kailo thank you kofi and uh, we hope to see you soon again. Pleasure. Thank you, everybody. Pleasure. Really, really nice you. to meet you. an inspiring business hub where over 20,000 talented minds are positioning Dubai as the engine of innovation by pushing the limits of creativity every day. Home to over 2,000 media companies from around the globe, Dubai Media City is a vibrant community offering business, entertainment, and lifestyle, enabling our partners to lead with creativity that resonates. Redefining the future of media innovation. Dubai Media City.
In today's mobile world, attracting users is becoming increasingly challenging. To better bridge the gap between brands and consumers, TikTok pioneered a new and unique way to engage users, Branded Hashtag Challenge. The Branded Hashtag Challenge taps into users' passion for creation and expression by inviting them to join in on a collective movement. TikTok empowers users to become co-creators while interacting with branded content. The Branded Hashtag Challenge is a fun and easy way for brands to collaborate and seamlessly integrate within TikTok community. Every day there's millions of hashtag challenges taking place on TikTok. Alongside some of the hottest trends in dance, comedy, fashion, food, and more. Users can discover the latest hashtag challenge on TikTok's discovery page. And popular challenge videos will be easy to find in users' For You feed. And they easily participate in the hashtag challenge by clicking Shoot button. In fact, over 50% creators have participated in a hashtag challenge with an average engagement rate of 8.5%, generating huge brand buzz and affinity. Besides a highly customized theme accompanied by challenge rules that suits your campaign objective, you can enhance your hashtag challenge by adding branded effects and music. TikTok also has a rich ecosystem of influencers who help show users how to do the branded challenge and encourage creators to get involved. The branded hashtag challenge can lead to different landing pages and drive conversions. We encourage you to support your challenge with brand takeovers and in-feed ads. These placements serve as full-screen traffic drivers to boost the awareness of your challenge and maximize the number of people who click into the challenge page. How to measure effectiveness? Instead of measuring campaign exposure and engagements simply through members, you can access brand metrics through our Brand Lift study. And the branded hashtag challenges have shown to help brands deliver higher engagement rates and drive brand metrics, such as ad recall, brand awareness, favorability, association, and purchase intent. So what are you waiting for? Join in the conversation today. Looking for a better way to get up out of bed instead of getting on the internet and checking a new hit me get up. It is! No last breath available to save him is the choke! And Tekken Master advances! That's Tekken Master has! And Tekken Master going up 1 0. Oh. And we did it all way, chrome music. I said my skin. Lucky me to go on there. That's a mistake. That's a mistake. That's going to be a goal for Rami Saeed. One the last 30 minutes of the Oh, it's beautiful! Down. Got that Bob Barker suit game and Plinko in my style. Money, stay on my craft and stick around for those pounds But I do that to pass the torch and put on for my town Trust me, on my eye and Master Esports win out map number two Esports convincingly taking out the win 20,000 USD richer man, that is insane 
Quite shit. Labels oh, out. Oh, it's the black mommy. Beautiful stuff with it. We can get it to the people. Spread it out. Labels out. Champion of 2019. We give it to the people. Spread it across the country. Go back. This is the moment. A flock is at night. Getting on the internet and checking a new hit me get up. It is no last breath available to save him. It's the choke and Tekken Master advances. Tekken Master has it. And Tekken Master going up 1 0. Oh. And we did it all with chrome music. I said my goal's lucky me to go on there. It's going to be a goal for Rami Saeed. One of the last 30 minutes. Oh, it's beautiful. Down. Got that Bob Barker soup game and Plinko in my style. Money, stay on my craft and stick around for those pounds. But I do that to pass the torch and put on for my town. Trust me, on my eye and Master Esports win out map number two. Sports convincingly taking out the win. 20,000 USD for Richard, man. That is insane. Oh, it's a black mommy. Beautiful stuff. We give that to the people. Sports convincingly. Spread it across the country. world 
Attracting users is becoming increasingly challenging. To better bridge the gap between brands and consumers, TikTok pioneered a new and unique way to engage users, Branded Hashtag Challenge. The Branded Hashtag Challenge taps into users' passion for creation and expression by inviting them to join in on a collective movement. TikTok empowers users to become co-creators while interacting with branded content. The Branded Hashtag Challenge is a fun and easy way for brands to collaborate and seamlessly integrate within TikTok community. Every day there's millions of hashtag challenges taking place on TikTok. Alongside some of the hottest trends in dance, comedy, fashion, food, and more. Users can discover the latest hashtag challenge on TikTok's discovery page. And popular challenge videos will be easy to find in users' For You feed. And they easily participate in the hashtag challenge by clicking Shoot button. In fact, over 50% creators have participated in a hashtag challenge. With an average engagement rate of 8.5%, generating huge brand buzz and affinity. Besides a highly customized theme accompanied by challenge rules that suits your campaign objective, you can enhance your hashtag challenge by adding branded effects and music. TikTok also has a rich ecosystem of influencers who help show users how to do the branded challenge and encourage creators to get involved. The branded hashtag challenge can lead to different landing pages and drive conversions. We encourage you to support your challenge with brand takeovers and in-feed ads. These placements serve as full-screen traffic drivers to boost the awareness of your challenge and maximize the number of people who click into the challenge page. How to measure effectiveness? Instead of measuring campaign exposure and engagements simply through members, you can access brand metrics through our Brand Lift Study. And the branded hashtag challenges have shown to help brands deliver higher engagement rates and drive brand metrics, such as ad recall, brand awareness, favorability, association, and purchase intent. So what are you waiting for? Join in the conversation today. For a better way to get up out of bed instead of getting on the internet and checking a new hit me get up. It is the last breath available to save him is the choke and Tekken Master advances. Tekken Master has And Tekken Master going up 1 0. Oh. And we did it all way. Chrome music. I said my skin. Lucky me to go on there. Nice. It's, it's going to be a goal for Rami Saeed. One of the first minutes of the Oh, it's beautiful. Down. Got that Bob Barker soup game and Plinko in my style. Money, stay on my craft and stick around for those pounds. But I do that to pass the torch and put on for my town. Trust me, on my eye and Master Esports win out map number two. Esports convincingly taking out the win. 20,000 USD for Richard, man. That is insane. Oh, it's a bad the we give it to Big the people. Boy. Spread it across the country.
inspiring business hub where over 20,000 talented minds are positioning Dubai as the engine of innovation by pushing the limits of creativity every day. Home to over 2,000 media companies from around the globe, Dubai Media City is a vibrant community offering business, entertainment, and lifestyle, enabling our partners to lead with creativity that resonates. Redefining the future of media innovation. Dubai Media City.
Looking for a better way to get up out of bed instead of getting on the internet and checking a new hit me get up. It is! No last breath available to save him, the choke! That Tekken Master advances! That Tekken Master has Tekken Master has the choke! That Tekken Master advances! That Tekken Master going up 1 0. Oh. And we did it all way, chrome music! I said my skin! Like he means to go on there, that's a mistake, 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 Money, stay on my craft and stick around for those pounds. But I do that to pass the torch and put on for my town. Trust me, on my eye and Master Esports win out map number two. Esports convincingly taking out the win. 20,000 USD richer, man. That is insane. Oh, the we give it to Big the people. Boy. Spread it across the country. mobile world. Attracting users is becoming increasingly challenging. To better bridge the gap between brands and consumers, TikTok pioneered a new and unique way to engage users, branded hashtag challenge. 
The branded hashtag challenge taps into users' passion for creation and expression by inviting them to join in on a collective movement. TikTok empowers users to become co-creators while interacting with branded content. The branded hashtag challenge is a fun and easy way for brands to collaborate and seamlessly integrate within TikTok community. Every day, there's millions of hashtag challenges taking place on TikTok. Alongside some of the hottest trends in dance, comedy, fashion, food, and more. Users can discover the latest hashtag challenge on TikTok's discovery page. And popular challenge videos will be easy to find in users' For You feed. And they easily participate in the hashtag challenge by clicking Shoot button. In fact, over 50% creators have participated in a hashtag challenge with an average engagement rate of 8.5%, generating huge brand buzz and affinity. Besides a highly customized theme accompanied by challenge rules that suits your campaign objective, you can enhance your hashtag challenge by adding branded effects and music. TikTok also has a rich ecosystem of influencers who help show users how to do the branded challenge and encourage creators to get involved. The branded hashtag challenge can lead to different landing pages and drive conversions. We encourage you to support your challenge with brand takeovers and in-feed ads. These placements serve as full-screen traffic drivers to boost the awareness of your challenge and maximize the number of people who click into the challenge page. How to measure effectiveness? Instead of measuring campaign exposure and engagements simply through members, you can access brand metrics through our Brand Lift Study. And the branded hashtag challenges have shown to help brands deliver higher engagement rates and drive brand metrics, such as ad recall, brand awareness, favorability, association, and purchase intent. So what are you waiting for? Join in the conversation today. For a better way to get up out of bed instead of getting on the internet and checking a new hit me get up. It is the no last breath available to save him. It's the choke and Tekken Master advances. Tekken Master has and Tekken Master going up 1 0. Oh. And we did it all way. Chrome music. I said, my God, lucky me to go on there. That's a mistake. That's it. It's going to be a goal for Rami Saeed. One of our first minutes. Oh, it's beautiful. Down. Got that Bob Barker soup game and Plinko in my style. Money, stay on my craft and stick around for those pounds. But I do that to pass the torch and put on for my town. Trust me, on my eye and Master Esports win out map number two. Sports convincingly taking out the win. 20,000 USD richer, man. That is insane. Oh, it's a We give that to the people. Spread it out. 
world champion of 2019, Big Ball! Spread it across the country. An inspiring business hub where over 20,000 talented minds are positioning Dubai as the engine of innovation by pushing the limits of creativity every day. Home to over 2,000 media companies from around the globe, Dubai Media City is a vibrant community offering business, entertainment, and lifestyle, enabling our partners to lead with creativity that resonates. Redefining the future of media innovation. Dubai Media City.
came from the darkest regions, wrapped in a cloak of light. My mind is in focus, eyes I'm trying to get my opus right. Throw my doubts aside, I climb them out inside. And when I reach the peak, the view will see what I'll be flying. Feel the pressure, but it's relative to the man I mentioned. No time for hesitation.
In today's mobile world, attracting users is becoming increasingly challenging. To better bridge the gap between brands and consumers, TikTok pioneered a new and unique way to engage users, Branded Hashtag Challenge. The Branded Hashtag Challenge taps into users' passion for creation and expression by inviting them to join in on a collective movement. TikTok empowers users to become co-creators while interacting with branded content. The Branded Hashtag Challenge is a fun and easy way for brands to collaborate and seamlessly integrate within TikTok community. Every day there's millions of hashtag challenges taking place on TikTok. Alongside some of the hottest trends in dance, comedy, fashion, food, and more. Users can discover the latest hashtag challenge on TikTok's discovery page. And popular challenge videos will be easy to find in users' For You feed. And they easily participate in the hashtag challenge by clicking Shoot button. In fact, over 50% creators have participated in a hashtag challenge. With an average engagement rate of 8.5%, generating huge brand buzz and affinity. Besides a highly customized theme accompanied by challenge rules that suits your campaign objective, you can enhance your hashtag challenge by adding branded effects and music. TikTok also has a rich ecosystem of influencers who help show users how to do the branded challenge and encourage creators to get involved. The branded hashtag challenge can lead to different landing pages and drive conversions. We encourage you to support your challenge with brand takeovers and in-feed ads. These placements serve as full-screen traffic drivers to boost the awareness of your challenge and maximize the number of people who click into the challenge page. How to measure effectiveness? Instead of measuring campaign exposure and engagements simply through members, you can access brand metrics through our Brand Lift Study. And the branded hashtag challenges have shown to help brands deliver higher engagement rates and drive brand metrics, such as ad recall, brand awareness, favorability, association, and purchase intent. So what are you waiting for? Join in the conversation today. For a better way to get up out of bed instead of getting on the internet and checking a new hit me get up. It is the last breath available to save him is the choke and Tekken Master advances. That's Tekken Master has And Tekken Master going up one. Oh. And we did it all way. Chrome music. I said my lucky me to go on there. It's going to be a goal for Rami Saeed. One of the first minutes. Oh, it's beautiful. Down. Got that 
Bad Bob, Barker, Soup Game, and Plinko in my style. Money, stay on my craft and stick around for those pounds. But I do that to pass the torch and put on for my town. Trust me, on my eye and Nasser Esports win out map number two. Esports convincingly taking out the win. 20,000 USD for Richard, man. That is insane. Oh, it's a black Prepared to champion of 2019. We give it to the people. Spread it across the country. This is a An inspiring business hub where over 20,000 talented minds are positioning Dubai as the engine of innovation by pushing the limits of creativity every day. Home to over 2,000 media companies from around the globe, Dubai Media City is a vibrant community offering business, entertainment, and lifestyle, enabling our partners to lead with creativity that resonates. Redefining the future of media innovation. Dubai Media City.
in the darkest regions, wrapped in a cloak of light. My mind is in focus, heights. I'm trying to get my opus right. Throw my doubts aside, I climb the mountainside. And when I reach the peak, the view will see when I'll be flying. Feel the pressure, but it's relative to the man I measured. No time for hesitation, finally time to step up. And when you're feeling deep in your bones, and soon you're fed up. You're close to the glass ceiling, keep your head up. See your dreams as a goal, the time see your mind achieve my full potential. And all of the demons pre my shine.
today's mobile world. Attracting users is becoming increasingly challenging. To better bridge the gap between brands and consumers, TikTok pioneered a new and unique way to engage users, Branded Hashtag Challenge. The Branded Hashtag Challenge taps into users' passion for creation and expression by inviting them to join in on a collective movement. TikTok empowers users to become co-creators while interacting with branded content. The Branded Hashtag Challenge is a fun and easy way for brands to collaborate and seamlessly integrate within TikTok community. Every day there's millions of hashtag challenges taking place on TikTok. Alongside some of the hottest trends in dance, comedy, fashion, food, and more. Users can discover the latest hashtag challenge on TikTok's discovery page. And popular challenge videos will be easy to find in users' For You feed. And they easily participate in the hashtag challenge by clicking Shoot button. In fact, over 50% creators have participated in a hashtag challenge. With an average engagement rate of 8.5%, generating huge brand buzz and affinity. Besides a highly customized theme accompanied by challenge rules that suits your campaign objective, you can enhance your hashtag challenge by adding branded effects and music. TikTok also has a rich ecosystem of influencers who help show users how to do the branded challenge and encourage creators to get involved. The branded hashtag challenge can lead to different landing pages and drive conversions. We encourage you to support your challenge with brand takeovers and in-feed ads. These placements serve as full-screen traffic drivers to boost the awareness of your challenge and maximize the number of people who click into the challenge page. How to measure effectiveness? Instead of measuring campaign exposure and engagements simply through members, you can access brand metrics through our brand lift study. And the branded hashtag challenges have shown to help brands deliver higher engagement rates and drive brand metrics, such as ad recall, brand awareness, favorability, association, and purchase intent. So what are you waiting for? Join in the conversation today. For a better way to get up out of bed instead of getting on the internet and checking a new hit me get up. It is the no last breath available to save him. It's the choke and Tekken Master advances. Tekken Master has And Tekken Master going up 1 0. Oh. And we did it all way. Chrome music. I said my skin. Lucky me to go on there. Nice. Nice. That's it. Nice. It's going to be a goal for Rami Saeed. One of the first minutes of the Oh, it's beautiful. Down. Got that Bob Barker soup game and Plinko in my style. Money, stay on my craft and stick around for those pounds. But I do that to pass the torch and put on for my town. Trust me, on my eye and Master Esports win out map number two. Esports convincingly taking out the win. 20,000 USD for Richard, man. That is insane. Oh, it's a black the we give it to Big the people. Ball. Spread it across the country. Go back. This is the moment. Tonight is the night. Feel like 
Back at DGC Live with Rami Smail, founder of Vilan Beer, who's joining us from the Netherlands. I'm joined by our dear friend and co-host uh, Ahmed Al Nashid, hey content guys. creator, game developer, and so many other things. Uh, and and uh, <laughs> the, the the session today is really to get to know Rami and his journey into the gaming industry. Rami is uh, a unique model. Uh, that of, of a success that made it actually outside of our region, but sure. he has also origins from the Middle East. He's from Egypt originally, uh, born in the Netherlands, however, and uh, he has also been so much engaged with indie developers sure. uh, to, to, to fight for their cause, to help them improve. Mm -hmm. uh, he's really what we can call an engaged uh, uh, game developer and entrepreneur. Rami, thank you for being with us. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, we've been actually wanting to have Rami for a few <laughs> years already now at the, at the conference. We're very happy to have him. Finally. Finally, Finally. yes. So, Finally. so the, we, we, we'll start, if you want, Rami, with just a brief intro about yourself, about the company, how you started into uh, gaming industry. Yeah, uh, so uh, I'm Rami Smain. I'm uh, one half of Vlambeer. Uh, we're the creators of games like Super Crate Box, Ridiculous Fishing, Nuclear Throne, Luft Rousers. Um, I've been the creator of Do Press Kit, which is a free tool to make online press kits for game developers. And I do a lot of work uh, speaking publicly, traveling around the world, meeting developers, talking to them, figuring out how I can help them, uh, interfacing with their governments. Uh, trying to make sure that game development everywhere and anywhere has a chance. Um, I started, well, so I started games really early on. My dad uh, is Egyptian. He's from uh, Cairo, uh, And um, he moved to the Netherlands at some point in his life. Um, and even though while I was growing up, we moved back and forth uh, between Egypt and the Netherlands a lot. Uh, at some point, they had to choose where I would go to school. Um, I was I was the first kid um, and ended up in the Netherlands um, but obviously as uh, somebody who moved to the Netherlands my dad didn't get um, a particularly good job straight out of the straight out of the gates so uh, we got our first computer from an uncle um, and it had MS-DOS, and on MS-DOS was um, a game called Gorillas, but it was really uh, a tutorial file for code. So six-year-old me tried to figure out what the code was, and I didn't read English, of course. Like, I spoke a, a little bit of Dutch, a little bit of Arabic. I was a young kid, um, but I recognized the text from the main menu, so I went, and I deleted that, and I changed it into Rami is fine. And then when I booted up the next time, the game the next time, instead of Microsoft Gorillas, it said my name. And yes. that was it. Like for the rest of my life, I've been chasing that. I've been chasing the idea of if I change words on my keyboard, I can change games and I can make them my own. So yes. um, from six to 12, every game I found, I would try to see if I could edit any file in the directory, right? Like uh, I would try to edit the BMPs and I would open it in a text, in a text editor and it, it would just be nonsense. So I would open it in paint and then, oh, look, there's files here. So I'll draw on it and then see what happens. And then I would boot up the game again, game would be different or it would be a text file and it would say, okay, the speed 
of the tank is five, and I would set it to 200, and the game would immediately crash because it would press forward and the tank would just fly off the screen, right? So I kind of kept doing that. And then um, around age 12, I started writing my own code from scratch. Uh, I did some websites, I did some, um, I did some, you know, just general game development stuff, but um, I kind of drifted away from it a bit until I was about 16 years old. And at 16, I came across this programming language for video games called Dark Basic, which was kind of a strange one. It's not C, it's not C++. It's, um, it's a strange game specific language that was specifically made to easily make 3D games. And in that time, those languages were very popular. Um, and through that, I got to know a developer who was working on these space sims and he was making them for money, which was ridiculous. Like he was actually doing on his own he was making these games and then selling them online. And I was just like, wow, you can make money with this. And so this is the end of my, my high school. So I had to choose a career at this point. And my dad is Egyptian. So he's very much like, okay, Rami, when you grow up, you're a smart kid. You're going to work for NASA. You're going to be a rocket scientist. You're going to be a doctor or a liar or an engineer or a disgrace to the family. You know, like those are kind of your, your options. Uh, and I told him, well, I'm going to make video games. And he was like, absolutely not. And I was like, well, <laughs> well but I want to make video games. I'm like, it's like an engineer. You go programming. He's like, you sure it's like an engineer? And I'm like, yes. Okay, he's, like, he's like, okay, you go be an engineer. Um, so I went to school for game development. I actually hated it. It was not, it was not very good for me. I think everybody has their own way of, of learning. Um, and the Netherlands is very much a place where um, there's a lot of systems that if you don't finish school, you'll be fine. Now, that, I know that's not true in most places in the Middle East, so please do not take this as advice for what to do in your career. This is just my story. Um, if I had finished, if I, if I could go back and keep everything in my life the same, but keep my career, but but change my education, I would have probably studied something like computer science because um, being able to, to interface with computers, to program, to think about how computers work, that's actually something I had to teach myself during my career. And if I had just done that as education, uh, it, it would have been so much easier, right? Um, so I, um, I went to a game design school, hated it, and then I uh, met this other guy who also hated it, and then the two of us left that school and uh, started a company together. That was Flambeer. Um, actually, me and my co-founder also didn't like each other, but uh, we didn't like school more than we didn't like each other. So choosing between school or working together, we decided to work together. And we kind of thought we'd make one game because we didn't like each other and then never worked together again. But our first game was a massive hit. So we just kind of kept working. Now, uh, as, I, um, as that studio started, um, our first challenge was that nobody knew who we were and that nobody cared about us and that nobody cared about the Netherlands. Uh, a lot of people might look at Europe and think, oh, well, you know, well-connected, um, easy access to everything. But the reality is that's mostly English-speaking countries. Right, the English-speaking countries have a huge advantage because if the if the if if the newspaper in London writes something about a video game, it's in English already, so everybody in the world can can read it. While if the press in the Netherlands writes about a game, there's only 15 million people in the world that speak Dutch. Right, there's way more people that speak Arabic in the world than Dutch. So yeah. our first challenge was that nobody cared. Uh, so we actually made our first game free and just put it out there and then it spread everywhere uh, because it was a good game, it was free and we kind of thought of it as our business card, um, but it was a very small game. Um, that game became a hit, um, a lot of people played it and then with that fame and that attention we ended up making uh, our second game and the story kind of just ramps up from there. Uh, every game we've made, our goal has always been to get more people interested in us rather than to become rich or make more money or whatever, because in the end, we think the people are what matters, not the, the money. The money comes from the people caring. Um, yeah. 
So yeah, that's kind of uh, that's kind of where my game development career started. Then there's obviously my my career in in helping other developers, but that's kind of a story that follows from that. I don't know if that is that interesting or yes, yeah, it's, it's it's interesting it's perfect, to see to, to see like how you switch from creating games to helping other people create games and how you engage in this whole community and try to put a voice. Like coming from the Middle yeah. East, we didn't have a lot yeah. of influence in, in creating games. We didn't have any game developers. Like yeah, for me, someone. like if I if I go back, uh, I'll play like uh, games from Square Enix. I'll play games like from uh, Konami with uh, Hideo Kojima. Like for yeah. me, who influenced me to get into in this industry are m might be different than the, the people that influenced you to get in this yeah. industry. But now for the Middle East, like I think having people like you, you will influence another generation because you speak the same language. You yeah. you went through stuff that n n none other like faced these issues. Because as you yeah. said, you, you worked on games, creating games, uh, and and you're creating games for like in Dutch, <laughs> where where the whole community and the, the gaming community yeah. speaks that yeah. language, the English language. Yeah. But, but also, yeah, no, I mean, I mean it, you know, it was Rami, actually a... A, a lot of young developers here in the region can also relate, for example, to the simple story that I want to become a game developer and this <laughs> discussion with the family. You know, no, really. Yeah. I mean, this yeah. is something where everybody is actually uh, can relate to this. So, yeah. so what happened there is actually this is actually related to what you just said. Uh, I, I ended up trying to help people in the industry because as I was growing up, I was playing all these video games, right? And I, I've always been stuck between two cultures, right? I'm too Egyptian to fit in in the Netherlands very well. And I'm too Dutch to like perfectly fit in in Egypt. You know, if I go to, to Al Haram and I try to get in as, as an Egyptian, I, I need to prepare a little, you know, to, to, set, to, set, to sound Masri and to have like the, the right accent again to get rid of my Dutch a bit. Um, we have a, I have a place in uh, near 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 Cairo near near uh, El Cairo, and um, and even though I spend a lot of time in Egypt, like the Egyptians are so fast with their language. Every year, there's new words, there's new ways of saying things. You know, they really like their slang. slang. <laughs> yeah, it's I always miss the slang, so I have to go sit in a in a taxi a few times and just talk to some people to sound to sound right again. Um, but. Um, one of the things that I noticed when I was growing up, uh, growing up between these two cultures, is when I was playing these games, the heroes would always look like my Dutch friends, and the enemies would always look like my Egyptian friends. Yeah. And I was always a little upset about that, and I couldn't figure out why, because I, I was a kid. But then later growing up, I was like, I know why this happens. It's because it's the people that look like my Dutch friends that are making video games. But why are the people that look like my Egyptian friends not making video games? Because they're smart, right? The people in the Middle East, all my friends in the Middle East are smart. I have a, I have a niece, she's a programmer. She's a better programmer than I am, honestly. Uh, but she works in, in, in medical. Um, I have uh, lots of people that love video games. Like when I was growing up, it was my cousin. Uh, my cousins, Muhammad and uh, Mahmoud and Am, they had, uh, they had the PlayStation. My dad didn't want to buy a PlayStation. He didn't. He, he went to the black market. He bought a police station. You know, the, 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 <laughs> one, the, 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 that one. Uh, they had a PlayStation. With, well, they had Pro Evo. They had Grand Theft Auto. They had all those games. You know, so I would always go to them if I was in Egypt. I would go to them. Uh, and um, so, but it started. It started. I started noticing that. Like, why is nobody making games? And I started looking at the region. I'm like, there's lots of people making. They're just not getting attention. So how do we how do we fix that, right? Um, so as I started in in my career, and nobody paid attention to us at first, right? And I had to go to London to talk to people there, and the I couldn't afford that because I didn't have any money. So I learned that if you do public speaking, and you get the attention of somebody, that they might fly you to a place, and then if you're in the place, you can give a talk, and then you get flown back home, and you get a hotel and all like that. So I just started practicing public speaking. I just started practicing like being on a stage, talk to people, giving them my story, um, answering their questions. And I only had one game, right? It was a complete bluff. I was not an expert. I was, I was just starting out. I was a kid, really. Um, 
but it worked and I got, um, I got flown to London for a talk and I met all the press there and I started to talk to them. And then the talk was really well received. So people from other events started messaging me. So people from the US started messaging me and people from Canada started messaging me. And I started giving talks there as well. Um, and then at some point, and this was honestly one of the, the best moments in my career, I started getting these messages from everywhere. Started getting messages from uh, Dubai, started getting messages from Indonesia, from uh, Uruguay, from, from everywhere. And they all said, can you come to us? And I'm like, yeah, absolutely. And they're like, can, can you afford that? I'm like, well, I, I don't have money. Do you have money? They're like, we don't have money. I'm like, well, but how, if nobody has money, how do I? Go? Yeah, how, how do we do that? And they're like, oh, okay, yeah, no, uh, we, we can't because the communities were very small in, in 2010. Even in the West, indie communities yeah. were like 10, 20 people, right? The US had like maybe 100 people making indie games. So it was very early. Nobody had money. Um, but uh, in 2013, I made a game called Ridiculous Fishing. And it's a game about fishing with machine guns. I don't know how that happened. Long story. <laughs> Uh, it involved a documentary and duck hunt, uh, but um, we made that game and it was a massive hit. And it was the first game that actually made us real money, right? So it was the first time in my life that I could go to my dad and say that I did it. I, I did it, right? I said I would be an engineer. I said I would make money, and he was like, uh, because he was always like, "Rami, when are you going to like? When are you going to have, get a real job?" Right? When are you going to, uh, to get a job that will pay for your family when you get a family? And, um, and one day I, just, I was so happy that I could go to him and just say like, okay, Yabba, look, I, I did it. Um, <laughs> and he said, well, you should buy me a ticket to Egypt so I can go visit the family. <laughs> uh, so, it's fair. Um, I, I, I think it's fair. I think it's fair. Yeah, fair, fair, fair. He spent his life trying to make sure I get an education and I can spend a, a little bit of what I managed to, what Funny I managed enough. to make out of this, uh, this opportunity he gave me to, uh, to Funny give back. Funny enough, it was again a matter of a ticket to fly somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah it frequently is. But so when I finally made that money with Ridiculous Fishing, I went to my co-founder and I said, uh, JW, Jan Willem is his name. I said, um, I'm going to take some of this money and I'm gonna use it to go to all these places that emailed me and I'm gonna go talk to them because I wanna know what is make, what, what happens that you, people that look like you can make video games and people that look like me, I'm the only one I know, right? Like, how is that? That's not possible. So I started traveling around the world. I started talking to people and I started realizing, okay, visas, right? Language, uh, hardware, software, company access. Uh, Nintendo still doesn't have an official presence in the Middle East. Like I started seeing all these things that from Europe were impossible to see. Yeah. I started realizing there's, there's a fight here, right? There's a challenge here because if games are for everyone, because one of the most beautiful things about games to me is if you take, uh, to Kodum, if you take football, yeah. it doesn't matter where in the world I go, right? I put a football on the street, I kick it at somebody. Doesn't matter which country I'm in, they'll kick it back. Because you don't need language, you don't need, to, you don't need to speak with each other to play with each other. And that's the most beautiful thing about games. It doesn't matter where you are, you can make a game that everyone can play, no matter where they're from, no matter their age, no matter their language, no matter their history or their culture, everybody understands play. But if games are for everyone, then they should also be made by everyone, right? And that's, that should be logical. But instead, I was only seeing these very few games from these very few people. I was like, this is wrong. We're going to fight this and we're going to change this. Uh, so for the past eight to nine years, I've been working on that. I've been trying to fight that. I've been trying to create opportunity because it is broken, right? Um, so it's been getting better. Uh, alhamdulillah, like this has been a, it's been a very long fight uh, and it's ongoing. Um, but if I look at the Middle East, for example, uh, Cairo, um, Smart City has the, the largest global game jam in the world. Uh, yeah. That's in the Middle East, right? Uh, major companies are starting actual community management in the Arab world. You're seeing Ubisoft. Um, you're seeing, um, I think, Epic Activision games. Blizzard. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You're, you're seeing a lot of them now booting up 
those efforts. I got a message a few years ago from a really large game company and they were translating their, their game's title, but they couldn't figure out exactly whether it was right or not. So they sent me a message and they're like, okay, does this mean that? I'm like, yeah, didn't you hire like a translation company? They're like, yeah, but they're a translation company. We'd rather talk to an Arab that we just know. And I'm like, okay, well, yeah, this looks good to me. Um, and I'm starting to see people like me. I remember in 2016, I was at DICE, which is not the game studio. There's a game studio, but there's also an event DICE. The event just, DICE. Yeah, exactly. I was at the event DICE and there was the award ceremony and you have to check in, right? And um, so I went up to the, to, the, to the lady that checks you in and she's like, what's your name? And I'm like, Ismail. And she looks at the list and she goes, which one? And I'm like, excuse me? She's like, which one? I have two. I have uh, Rami Ismail and I have Ashraf Ismail. I'm like, there's two Ismails in the games industry? When did this happen? I'm like, it was one of the most beautiful moments of my career because for the first time, I had met another Ismail. And then it turns out Ashraf is actually a uh, lead great. creative director at Ubisoft. He, awesome. he, uh, so suddenly there were two of us and it was great. And then I met Osama Dorias at Warner Brothers. I met uh, Farah and then suddenly we start seeing all these game developers and there's Arabs. We now do, we now even do um, Arab game developer meetups at, at the game developers conference when it happens. And it's just, it's so nice to see that this, this region, the region, uh, a region that speaks the language of so many people and a culture that is older than almost older than time that yeah. we're we're here now like this is also our place and it's just it's been really cool to see that all that fighting you know it it pays off because it's it's, it. it's it worth it right yeah yeah it's incredible uh there are so many stories there's so much art there's so much culture and uh, I have to say, watching the games industry in the Arab world, one of the things that is a little heartbreaking to me um, is that so often when they make games in the Middle East, they try to make Western games, right? Yes. They look at the, because that's the games that inspired them. They, looked at, they look at those games and they go, okay, so we'll make a game like Grand Theft Auto. We'll make a game like Need for Speed. We'll make a like game a like, Super, uh, like, like a Super Mario. Um, but then they put those games, they put them in the Western world, right? They put them in Western mythology and Western history. Well, really, we have in the Middle East some of the most beautiful culture and history in the world, right? And again, no matter what your culture is, you can play games. So if you want to make something unique for the games industry, really all you have to do is look at your own history. Like, look at your own places, look at your own countries, look at your own music. Like, a lot of people think, well, people won't understand it. It's video games. It doesn't matter. We can understand an alien world where squids fly around and talk and say their feelings, right? In Mass Effect, we come across these alien plants. We understand that. It's not like the Arab world, the Middle Eastern world, is not more alien than uh, a planet in Mass Effect or the, the universe in Star Wars. Like, you can absolutely, just genuinely, sincerely use your own culture, use your own history, use your own stories and tell those. Um, because that way we'll be unique. Like we'll never be better at making Western games than the Western people because they are Western. Like that is their history. All they have to do is look at their history and go like, oh yeah, I grew up with that. Um, if we want to make unique games in the region, if we want to stand out, if we want to make games that will get people's attention, all we have to do is be genuine, be sincere, make our stuff make our region. How would, you, um, how would you encourage like game developers to create something like this if they see the profit? Uh, because as a game developer here, you want people to play your games. You want to have yes. that name. So you always try to copy something. Like we, we saw that with people copying, like as you say, GTA, they're copying like Uncharted, they're copying like all of these different games. Copying they're, Clash of Clans, yeah. copying all of this. But uh, how would you encourage them to, to, to make their own or find their own voice? Yeah, I mean, it's a difficult question because obviously a lot of the games that exist now have grown from just two cultures around the world, right? The Japanese and the Western culture. That's yeah. basically it. There's a little bit of French in there. But the French are stubborn enough that they kind of end up having their own flavor of games. Yeah. Um, I think the Arabs inherently, we have a very strange conflict at our core, right? Because inherently, we are very creative. In the Middle yeah. East, people across the Middle East are incredibly creative. Um, 
and have a rich history to like put that creativity fund. The other, on the other hand, we're a very um, practical society, right? Our parents are very much focused and a lot of them grew up in like difficult circumstances or in poverty or they just want a better future for their kids. There's this system of honor that means that you have to have a job that pays good money. And that is technically the inherent conflict of game development as well. You want to make something artistic, but you also want to make money, right? Um, but the problem with creativity is that creativity can only work if you are also comfortable failing, right? Because the way games work is you never know whether it's going to work, but you are going to spend two years on it. So I think for most of us, that is the problem. We are scared of experimenting because we are scared to fail because our culture is very much against the idea of failing. You want to do things right. But game development requires getting things wrong. Like you have to test, you have to try, get it wrong, do it again, test, try, get it wrong, do it again. And every time you get it wrong, you learn a little while you put that in the game. And then you just keep repeating that until the game grows and grows and grows. And eventually it's good, right? Um, so you can absolutely start from Uncharted. You can start from Need for Speed. You can start from FIFA. Um, but then think of what what is... What is something that I would like to see in those games that isn't just, well, it's Uncharted, but the main character is Ahmed, right? Yeah. What, um, what if Uncharted was, you know, instead of just being in the Arab world, what if this character was Arab? How different would Nathan Drake be if he was, you know, not, uh, is he American? I think he's American, American, yeah. Yeah, he's an American. Uh, of course he's an American. Um, <laughs> But what, what would these worlds be? Like, if, if I was making a FIFA game, if I was, if I was a FIFA, like, when I grew up, one of, the, one of the biggest Arab TV shows I watched was Captain Mag. Yeah. Uh -huh. Which I, which I uh -huh. later learned is Captain Spasa from Japan. But Spasa. for me, it was, it was always Captain Mag. Yeah. If, any, if anything in the Arab world, like, that's the soccer game I would want to see. If I was seeing a football game from the Middle East, that's what I want to see because that, that series was intense. That was good stuff. Like, I want to see that. Um, but the, there's so much more. Like, a taxi driver in Cairo would be ridiculous. Like, that would be – there's so many cars. There's so much traffic. There's so much stuff happening all the time. Um, so you, you, you have to not just – try and tell the story you have to build the mechanics from there we have so many games that are also like very com common there like uh, backgammon and all these games that people that my dad would always teach me um i mean chess is yes it gets played in the west but the first times i played chess was always in egypt yeah um there's a lot of our culture than just like being a backdrop right? like there's there's games in there there's ways of thinking in there um, that would absolutely translate to a video game. Um, but it's, it's not easy. These are the hard games to make. And I think um, a lot of people are worried about money, but that's why I'm very encouraged to start seeing uh, publishers. Publishers are really starting to take an interest to the region, partially because there is money now, and it's clear that people are spending money on games. Yeah. Um, but also because there's so much development there now that there's absolutely talent. Like people are seeing the talent in the Middle East and I'm talking to a lot of publishers that want to start connecting with the Middle East, want to start setting up studios in the Middle East, want to start uh, funding games from the Middle East. Um, so I think now is the opportunity for us in the region to say, okay, we're gonna make our games. And it's gonna be hard, but with funding or with a, publishers, uh, with a publisher, we can aim for that we can aim higher than just trying to remake the games that we know will be successful. We're going to make the games that we don't know are going to be successful. We just know the that rest. they're genuine. Yeah. They're just, they're just our voice. There are, there, there are people, there are history, there are music. Um, that's the future. That's the future for the region. We are not the region that makes knockoffs of existing games. Like when we grow up, we want to look at our region. We want to look at our history. We want to be able to, to look our kids, our grandchildren in the eye and say, like, these are our video games, right? These, this is our history. This is our culture. Um, and not because we are better and not because we are worse and not because, no, because we are us. 
we are our culture and we can be proud of that. Like it's a beautiful culture. It's one of, it's one of the oldest cultures in the world in many ways. Um, the development of the region is a fascinating historical story, right? It's a fascinating political story. It's, there's so much that has happened. Um, there is so much to tell here. And I mean, you can see it. If you look at Ashraf, the moment he got control of Assassin's Creed, uh, he dropped it in Egypt. Yeah. Right? Like the first thing he did, like we're out there, we're trying to fight that fight. Um, but, you know, it, it's even though, you know, I'm half Egyptian and that's cool. I want the full Egyptian, right? Like that's, that's my next goal. My next goal is that when people think of an Egyptian game developer, they don't think of me because I'm half Egyptian. I'm, I'm no snus. So, like I want the full Egyptian. I want the full uh, Saudi. I want the full uh, person from Dubai. I want the full, like uh, Bahraini. I want uh, like Tunisian. I want all of them. I, I want everybody. I just want them to look. I want a wall of game developers out there, male, female, no matter what. Uh, I want a wall out there. And no matter where you're from, you see a picture from somebody from your country. Right. And that's the wall of game development. It's a good dream and we're getting closer to it. You know, when when started uh, DGC and th these gaming uh, events as well. It, it was it was really just by mistake. We didn't even know anything about the gaming industry. And it, but when you discover it, you you fall in love with it somehow, and then it it grows on you. you yeah. it's, it's just like Rami said when he just was able to change his name on that game, and all of a sudden he said, "Wow, I can do that. It can yeah. become mine." Yeah. And and there is something really interesting about that. And we can see the evolution, Rami, since a few years uh, to now. Of course, we still have some challenges, but we have more opportunities as well. So, and uh, but I believe what you just, you know, well, what with that little time we we gave you to tell us a little bit your story, your journey. Uh, you did you did mention some very key elements, which is your identity, is uh, important. your consciousness of your environment mm -hmm. can really determine your steps and also maybe make you find uh, through that cloud, that noise, really your road, your journey, and you just, you know, believe in it. And then the rest is, is hard work and, and, and some destiny maybe, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, and I believe also, Ahmad, yourself, I mean, you, you also uh, started this in an environment that wasn't really welcoming to it, right? It, it, it's, it's a risk. I, feel, I believe it's a risk. You, you put yourself out there yeah. and you try. You don't do it for the money. You don't do it for the fame. You do it because you believe that your voice might matter. Maybe your voice won't matter for everyone, but it will affect one person. And if it affects that person, he will be the right person to affect others. It's like creating a chain of reaction by you opening that door, you will open doors for others, see it. Yeah, and that's also, uh, for example, DGC now, we really open uh, all registrations for all developers to be, to come in for free, to have the meeting platform for free. Mm -hmm. Just come in, you know, set up your calls, meet Rami, meet uh, uh, Activision, meet anyone you want. You yeah. know? Just have your voice heard, and that's the most important thing. And, and tell your uh, story. And tell your story. Tell exactly. Your story. Don't don't communicate about who you are. And it's it's very interesting, Rami, that the next step for you, when after your first and second successes, that you decided, I want to communicate. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I want to talk to people. I want to tell them who I am. I want to hear who they are. And, and I how to continue my my journey on that on that path to find myself and also find my voice. It's uh, in this community. Just amazing. I mean, I think, I think what you were saying is right. Like in the end, if you try to change the world, it won't work because the world is so big. But if you try to change people, if you just start with one person, if you just make the goal of whatever you do, making a game for one person that they will love, that's a goal you can do. And the, the honest truth is nothing is just for one person. Like as soon as you make one person love it, you will make millions could love it, right? They just have to find it then. That's a big, that's a much smaller step than having to make it still. So uh, I, I think what you just said is, is, is very true. It's just about how do you make something that one person loves? And if you make that one person somebody that looks like you, instead of that looks like the, the ambiguous audience somewhere else, 
uh, you'll make something that a lot of people that look like you will love and look up to and be inspired by. So, uh, yeah, I think that was a beautiful way of saying Rami, uh, really, I'm, I'm so delighted to have this conversation with you. I know that we've met so many times, but we never really talked. So <laughs> I'm very happy that, that we yeah. I, I, had this chat. I, we had the chat now. And, uh, and uh, Ahmed, really, thank you for being with us and also sharing your experience. It was really amazing. I'm sure a lot of people will be messaging you on the meeting platform. We want to meet you. We want to talk to you. So if you, if you have some time, it would be great to continue the conversation with them. Uh, still online. We cannot say offline because yeah. everything is online. <laughs> so, uh, and it would be great to see you again very soon somewhere Hopefully in, here in, in, Dubai. in the world. And really, in Dubai. we'll try. Really, Allah. really. Thank you very much, Rami. We are back, and today uh, we are actually going to discuss a very special session. I, for the, it's for me even it's the first time I actually will listen to this presentation. Uh, we are joined from Kentucky by Robert Connor from Global Venues, who's going to actually be presenting. VR and influencers. Robert, please yes. ed educate me in two minutes before you start your uh, your uh, your presentation. VR and influencers. Oh. Right, right. Um, so obviously, VR is a, a new space, a growing space, and we're going to to see a lot of the trends that we're familiar with online, anything from social media to uh, just anything that we're familiar with online, it's starting to pour into VR. And as VR is a new space, and as the hardware improves, we are improving content along with it. And one of those avenues is specifically with uh, virtual avatars and uh, mixing what we're capable of doing with special effects and, and artificial intelligence uh, to take a modern twist on the influencers uh, where people don't necessarily have to uh, put their true identities out there. They can, they can create their own avatar. Well, that's, that seems very exciting and I'm really looking forward to your presentation now. And we will, if you want, uh have a few questions just when you end. You still have around 25 minutes. So uh, please, you go ahead. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen. All right, hi everybody. Um, my name is Robert Connor and it is a pleasure to be here. Uh, I wanna thank everyone who's on this call uh, with us right now and a special thank you to Mr. Champs for setting uh, this incredible event up and give me the opportunity to speak. Um, I am going to provide a quick summary about me uh, and then as well as my company and what we're doing. So uh, I was born in Sweden. I was raised in America. Um, that's in America. I absolutely was in awe of and fell in love with uh, all of the, the films and the movies. Uh, it was I knew nothing better than going to a movie theater and, and seeing all the cool stuff coming out. Uh, the TV shows just always blew me away with the special effects and, and uh, yeah, just the, the cutting edge cinema altogether. Uh, it just stuck with me and I'm, I'm really happy that it did. Um, it was my dream to work with movies, uh, but there were a few reasons that I wouldn't pursue a movie career in Hollywood. And uh one of those is simply the slim chance of making it. That's a true statistic. The percentage of people who make it in Hollywood are low, and I simply did not want to become a statistic. And uh, not that there's anything wrong with waiting tables whatsoever. I just didn't, I knew I didn't want to go out and, and possibly fail as so many people, even extremely talented and, and gifted people do in Hollywood. Um, I didn't want that. Uh, I, I just wasn't willing to take that chance because there are far too many people taking that chance. Um, I was also taught the American way that uh, work meant to do something to make money, not to do something that you love, something that you're passionate about. 
And uh, so I, I learned the hard way of, uh, yeah, working with something that I wasn't truly passionate about. So at 21, I, I started up my uh, first company uh, doing hurricane protection in Naples, Florida, uh, for these giant mansions and making great money. And uh, the reason I'm, I'm telling you this is because uh, the economy crashed in the middle of me doing that, and I lost absolutely everything. Um, I mean, everything. Uh, I had invested everything back into my company and for no fault of my own uh, due to a bunch of shady practices in the in the housing market. Um, yeah, I, I took a, a hard hit and, and a big lesson in life. So that's when I decided that I would never do something only to make money again. Uh, I would do something that was going to make me happy and uh, hopefully make other people happy in the process. And of course, uh, if I could be a positive impact to society, that would be a bonus on top of that. Um, so I moved to Sweden. I went back to see kind of where I came from. Um, wanted to get in touch with the culture uh, that I, I barely remembered. Um, and I went ahead and attended Stockholm Film School. I would uh, heard a lot about this school. And um, I have a funny story. The the dean at the school, he he met with me and I explained to him that um, my goal was to uh, learn the language of cinema. I was already working with, you know, making my own commercials for my company. Uh, I had a little green screen do it yourself studio in, in my house uh, where I was just having fun and, and putting videos together. Uh, but I told him that I really needed to learn the language of cinema because I was going to take that language and adapt it for virtual reality. And uh, so uh, a few days later, uh, I get a call from the dean and he tells me that uh, he will accept me to the film school under one condition. And that is that the words virtual reality uh, were never to come out of my mouth again. Uh, that this was a film school and that that is what I was there to learn was film. So I was very cautious about learning the language of film during the days. And then at nights and the weekends, that's when I was uh, filming everything uh, I possibly could in virtual reality. And uh, now that Dean is just one of my biggest fans. He, he's become a mentor to me. So it's a great story. But during that time, uh, I had I really did have the one goal in mind, and that was to be one of the first VR filmmakers uh, in the world. So at that time, there were not any VR cameras. Uh, I built my first VR camera uh, with two DSLR cameras and fisheye lenses. Um, the two cameras uh, allowed me to have my first virtual reality movies in 3D. Uh, I would write these stories for 180 degrees in the front, 180 degrees in the back. I would uh, have the the action in the front and the back obviously working together simultaneously. And uh, I, I would film them on separate occasions uh, with the exact same lighting, uh, very specific sound. and um, I would then stitch it together, and uh, I believe that I am one of the first, if not the first, uh, filmmaker to produce a cinematic VR film out of at least Europe. So after that, uh, that's when I could finally get my hands on a professionally made uh, VR 360 camera. And um, that's when things started to take off. Uh, I filmed the first boxing match ever in VR with uh, a Swedish Olympian. Um, I made horror movies and I made comedies in VR. And uh, I focused on healthcare and education. Um, the healthcare virtual reality that I created was, uh, uh, that's a neat story. Um, uh, I was asked by a university in Sweden if I could create content for people in hospice who were no longer allowed to go outdoors. Um, so I went ahead and, and I, I created a, a 360 experience. I called it life. I wanted, I wanted the people to be able to go back to being a child, to go back to 
you know, the, the feeling of being on a playground again, the, the feeling of the connection with uh, a parent. Um, I wanted them to remember what it was like to see a sunset and to be around animals and, and just to, to give them everything I possibly could in 15 minutes to give them the experience of life one more time before they lost theirs. And uh, it's exactly what I did. And it was really moving to see these, these people, uh, they didn't want to give me back the VR headset. They, they would take the headset off throughout the experience. Tears would be rolling down their face. Um, and they were also happy afterwards. So I was very, very happy to have that experience. And that has led me into uh, actually the field of healthcare with virtual reality as well. When I saw just how impactful uh, that was, and that wasn't even an interactive experience. That was you know, 360 3D experience. So uh, we're very involved with uh, the, the healthcare industry uh, now due to that. Um, I also focus on virtual reality for education, uh, created a proof of concept, tested it throughout schools in Sweden, specifically on, on problematic uh, classrooms with uh, learning disabilities and, and behavior disability or behavior issues. And uh, the results were phenomenal. Uh, the kids were immersed in the content. They, they weren't able to bother each other. They, they were following the story. They remembered, they remembered parts of the story that I didn't put in there for, for any specific reason other than I thought it was entertaining, but uh, they, they connected with the story on such a level that the teachers were kind of in shock that these, these children uh, resonated with the content as, as well as they did and, and the quiz they took afterwards that they weren't missing a beat. Uh, it, was, it was very exciting. So we're also very focused on VR and education. Uh, then I was asked by the Royal Swedish Opera if I could film a ballet in VR. Now, I had never seen a ballet before in my life. Uh, I knew nothing about ballet, um, but I knew VR. So I told them, of course, uh, if you want something done in an interesting way in, in VR, I can do it. And uh, I'm very happy I took that on. Uh, that... VR ballet experience uh, ended up being featured at the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C. at Cannes Film Festival. Um, over 50 film festivals worldwide, and then I was even nominated in Venice Film Festival for that piece. So uh, this piece was amazing to be able to do, and, and the doors that it has opened up for me and, and our company is, is truly incredible. Um, for example, the, just talking with you guys now, uh, you know, I feel like obviously everything stems from the, from what you've done in the past. Um, but this piece in particular was, was very special. Um, so it's allowed me to partner with some of the best special effects studios, actually the best in, in the world and that comes out of Sweden. Um, I have to be, Kind of cautious in, in all the details right now, uh, sharing too much, but I can say that you've absolutely, if you watch Netflix, if you watch HBO, if you watch any modern, uh, cinema or TV, you, you've seen their work. Um, and, and the network that it's opened up across, uh, New York City, Los Angeles, uh, just with fantastic, uh, studios there with, with, tech heads in, in Sweden and, and across the world and Egypt, all over the place. Uh, this project really put, put us on the map. So our company is a VR production powerhouse. We're focusing on different pillars that uh, will change the future. Our model of modern day storytelling using this cutting edge technology has positioned us again to partner with these uh, top special effects and, and tech companies. It's also led us to focus on an extremely exciting new pillar, which is, of course, eSports. And the way that we're combining our proprietary software, eSports and VR, to create a new wave of digital avatars that are truly cutting edge is without a doubt one of the most incredible projects I've been involved with so far. Um, I believe that digital avatars is going to change the foundation of media companies for the future. Uh, it's going to be a way for traditional media to communicate with the younger generations on the level that the younger generations understand. Uh, I'll get into that a little more, but um, I do believe that digital avatars uh, 
serve purposes across the board, uh, in particular when you go on to a bit of a higher cinematic level with, with the digital avatars, you're going to be able to create, or we are creating content that is uh, unlike anything ever seen uh, in the past. So what exactly are we doing? Um, we are connecting motion capture, uh, special effects, artificial intelligence, and VR to, incre to create these incredible digital avatars. Um, so I'll give you an example of where an avatar could be used. Now, keep your mind open, uh, be, use your imagination as much as you'd like, but this is a simple example, especially for uh, everyone today who's eSport oriented. Um, so when a commentator interviews the gamers, which that is rather old fashioned in our opinion, it's been a format that's been around forever. You have the camera crew, you have the interviewer, and then you have the subject being interviewed. Um, imagine, well, let's just keep going here. So imagine gamers doing interviews live as their character in the game. So rather than the interviewer speaking with the gamer, the interviewer is speaking with the gamer's gaming persona, uh, or the interviewer as an incredible avatar of their choice. Um, this will bring the production value up and takes a step further into the future. Um, so if you want to have a fun example, if we take a look at the bull, uh, the bull, let's say the bull is the gamer. And anytime the interviewer asks the, the gamer about the opposing team that they'll be playing in the tournament, uh, we'll, we can have a program to where the bull's eyes turn red and, and smoke and fire start to come out of the nostrils of the bull. Um, those are the types of, of special effects and qualities that will bring up the, the production values substantially and, and to a level of where I believe the, the younger generations are demanding um, and will absolutely demand in, in, in the near future. And better yet, imagine the interview taking place inside of the game. So the interviewer is, uh, you know, meeting the gamer and speaking with the gamer's avatar. The gamer can walk around the game and, and explain, you know, where, what they've been doing, what they've been practicing. They can give details about the game that a lot of people might not know who don't spend that much time in it. It's just a very exciting and fresh way for, uh, for this interaction that has been taking place for the for a while now uh, to, to take that step into the future. Uh, the old-fashioned way of commentating is quickly turning some subpar compared to quality of the games, uh, which is a very realistic fact. Uh, I know we want something more entertaining, so that's exactly what we're doing. It's also perfect for streamers that want their identities hidden or because it's just simply more fun to be a digital avatar uh, when streaming um, with the special effects that we can apply to this. Uh, again, the example of the bull and the, and the smoke and fire coming out of the nostrils and the eyes turning red. Uh, all of this can be programmed for, for anybody who wants to use the, the digital avatars and just have fun with it. Uh, and this, of course, means that the avatar conversion is live. So uh, this allows for live commentating and discussions directly from and with the avatars. Um, so, for example, if we're at a tournament, we have the commentators talking about the tournament and they want to turn on uh, live uh, chats with with the viewers and the viewers can speak directly with with these avatars. These avatars don't necessarily or, of course, they don't need to be sitting in, in the uh, arena. They don't even need to be sitting in the same room uh, with this technology. But this live, li these live conversations are such an important part to the way that uh, any any news anchor, anybody in the future is going to uh, be able to keep the, the audience engaged. So we, we feel strongly that our software for digital avatars is the future in esports, social media influencers for sure. Uh, news channels, absolutely, um, and any other media with live commentating. Without supporting this new type of entertainment, companies will become irrelevant. The production value must be what younger generations expect. And, and that's so important that we, we are providing this for the future of reaching these, uh, these audiences. Um, 
in the news, for example, a lot of these audiences are, are, are not, the younger audiences are not following the news. Uh, Brexit was a great example of that and just the, the surprise within the younger generations. Um, the younger generations don't necessarily want to listen to a news anchor sitting behind a desk in a suit and tie. They would much rather listen to a news anchor whose head pops off and if, if he gets pissed off. Um, <laughs> you understand my point. So um, what's great about the avatars is that uh, our AI deep learning tool can scrape for content. And, and a lot of the times the the avatar, the news anchor, the streamer, if they want us to create a commercial for them or something like that, they don't even have to do it. Our technology will just use the content that we've scraped from the past 10, 15 years. Um, and another great thing about the avatars, they're never sick. They're never going to reply with a smart ass remark unless you want them to. Um, they are always on time. They're, they're ours to, to, to work with how we want to. And of course, uh, all of this content is supported on 2D screens and for an incredibly impactful experience, it must be viewed in VR. Um, the content on the screens is, is hysterical and, and pushes the boundaries, pushes the technology. Uh, once that is inside of VR, it's a whole new world. Um, so it'll be very exciting to watch as the VR trend grows, uh, to watch that growth move from people viewing it on, on their computer screens to making the transition to watch this in virtual reality. Um, and so that's why I think that our, our model is, is perfect to, as we've done for the past five, six years to be on the trend of, of the hardware and the progress with the hardware. And now that trend, as we've seen in the last year is going from progress of hardware to growth within user numbers and progress within content, such as Half-Life Alex. Um, so we are, we're simply working behind the scenes on that, on these, on these trends and, and staying in line with it. Um, the point being is that when it's viewed in VR, it's unlike anything that can be viewed on a 2d screen. So we are very excited to show the world the first eSport tournament hosted by avatars in the coming months. Um, and that will obviously be viewed at home. The, the avatars will, will be seen on, on the computer screens as well as, as in the tournaments. If you are interested in knowing how using avatars might fit into your endeavors um, to engage the younger audiences, you can contact me. Um, I, I will respond and, and happily uh, go through this with you and explain a little bit more about what we're doing and, and where we're, we're heading with all of this. Um, and yeah, let's change the world with better content and uh, amazing technology. Robert. Thank you very much for this uh, presentation on VR and influencers. Uh, I, I do agree with you that uh, today everything is going more into virtual reality and avatars. And I believe what you're suggesting is a real new opportunity for the, for the influencers because not only they can tap into the audiences that are over the social media platform, but now we have seen also a great increase uh, in the sales of VR headsets and more communication happening through headsets and so much. So it can also help them a lot in that sense. Absolutely. No, it's very exciting. It's very exciting to see where it's going to, uh, to take off in, in esports as well. And, and the way that the, uh, the gamers, the commentators, everybody are going to use avatars in the future. And we're excited to be a part of, uh, of creating that. So, uh, I want to thank you very much again for, for having me and, um, yeah, thank you. You're welcome, Robert. And, uh, at DGC, we always try to, uh, show, the audiences, the developers, whoever is on the meeting platform, uh, what is the next, uh, what are the next steps, uh, what are the next innovations in uh, the gaming industry, in virtual reality, 
and even blockchain and games. So we are very happy to have you today. And uh, we thank you for your time and presenting for us at DGC Live. Welcome back with a great session now with Tim Dirksons from Arcane Network, who's joining us from Belgium. And we have been, for the past two years, introducing uh, blockchain and games as part of the DGC program. And we have hosted last year many companies, and this year you've already listened to three or four presentations that were already given by other uh, companies, owners, CEO, founders, and really these guys are really creating the next level uh, gaming solutions for the whole gaming industry. There's still a lot of question marks around it, Tim, right? I mean, yeah. it's not that straightforward. And we've noticed in the, our previous sessions how actually we had a lot of questions. We asked them questions. They tried to explain as well. But your topic today is really directly relevant to our audience. You're telling game developers, publishers, we have solutions for you to monetize, correct? Yeah, that's uh, completely correct. Yeah. Uh, so we start from the background uh, of blockchain and we work towards gaming and we talk to the game studios and we discover their problems and their needs. Yeah. So we're really keen to listen to your uh, presentation because you're giving us a presentation. And I just wanted to know a little bit more about you, about Arcane, just, you know, uh, a quick brief about what you guys are doing, how you started this. And then you can jump into uh, your presentation and we'll pick you back when, once you have done for maybe a few questions. Yeah, of course. Um, so as you know, my name is uh, Tim Dirksons. I'm one of the four co-founders of Arcane Network. Uh, my background is in economics and business analysis. And I started Arcane with my uh, teammates because I believed so much in blockchain technology and the use of smart contracts. And the combination of blockchain and smart contracts, we see so many use cases. And we're targeting gaming because we see this as one of the first industries that will actually adopt such a new technology because it makes so much sense for the space to do so. And that's why we said, okay, we understand that games uh, developers and game studios, they um, know how to develop the games, but to connect that, to blockchain, that's just a very hard thing to do. So we thought to turn things around and make blockchain easier for them to integrate. Perfect. I'm sure you're going to explain everything about that just now. So start and we are here. We're listening to you and our audience as well. And uh, let's see what we what you have to say. Wonderful. All right. Let me just start with sharing my screen. And then we can move on from there. All right. So thanks everyone for joining me here today. Uh, as I just mentioned, my name is Tim Dirksons and I'm co-founder of Arcane Network. And we help game studios to monetize their game assets and to increase the revenue. And as we've already concluded with some of our clients, you can also increase the player retention by using blockchain technologies to register your digital assets. One thing we're going to start with is the agenda. I'm going to shortly introduce um, why blockchain is becoming more and more important uh, and how you can use it to monetize the game, uh, 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 the game assets. Um, I, we could do a Q&A with Habib, but uh, let's check whether there's uh, questions coming in, yes or no. So let's dive right in as in, we are currently living in a different time. We've already seen it with Fortnite in 2017, but let's go back about 10 years ago. We used to buy games. You remember Pokemon, you remember Pokemon Go. Well, Nintendo did it very well when they actually said, you know what, we're not going to sell game cartridges anymore. We're going to uh, develop an app that you can play for free, and we're going to monetize in-app uh, and with that, they have a very different monetization strategy. And for them, it turned out very well, as in they uh, earned 3.1 billion euros in revenue in 
under or just over four years' time, while before that it took more than 10 years to earn 162 million. So that's a very big difference in market size and market opportunity that entered into the gaming space. And what we see is um, we want game studios to do what they do best, and in that case, outsource the rest. Because it's very hard to do all the things at once, and one of the things that we want to see is uh, game studios, they need to focus on gameplay and not focus on the hard integration of uh, using blockchain technology. Because in the end, it's not about the blockchain. The blockchain is just a technology that you can and you should uh, leverage for the right purposes. And here, the right purposes, what we see is using it to register game assets and to start selling and trading these game assets uh, through the use of the network. And when you see, it's not only um, small uh, game studios that are moving. For example, the Sandbox is one of the top uh, uh, industry experts that is currently using bl blockchain technology. But right now, you also see that Atari, Panini, Tops, just to name a few, they are already uh, doing a digital transformation and selling their assets through blockchain technology. And they're also making it available for other game studios to use that within their gameplay. So, for, so for example, a Panini, what they can do is they have uh, assets that are on the blockchain. In time, they could actually um, allow the sandbox to use those assets within the sandbox ecosystem. So they're really creating um, an open economy where an asset can be used in multiple games, which is a very powerful thing to do. And what we really want to do is um, we want to focus on the psychology of player engagement. As in, when you're looking at a selling a game versus a selling a game experience, we want to look at a player's desire. Players, they play a game for a specific reason, because they want to build something, because they want to win, because they want to own or bargain something. And here, a game studio has a challenge to develop the game mechanics so that they can really focus onto that player's desire. So what they have to do is they have to uh, play a quest level up, make sure that the game comes back so that they can uh, shop and spend within the game. And to do so, what they uh, focus on is to positively focus on rewarding the behavior. And they mainly do this by giving them uh, badges, experience points, uh, daily bonuses, um, monetize a leaderboard, and sometimes they even punish a player by uh, removing the reward. And what we see is once you're starting to develop this kind of experience, this is what you mainly do with a free-to-play model. Well, there, what you're doing is you're monetizing a player's desire. And this they currently are doing with an in-game virtual currency or multiple virtual currencies, but also you can do this by um, selling a game asset. So the goal here is to really develop a gameplay and that is around an asset class or around the in-game currencies. So that is a monetization system around a player's desire to play, compete, own, or trade uh, within the game. So in that case, a player becomes a stakeholder and not just a player. A good example here is the Sandbox. Um, this is uh, technically not a startup because they were founded in 2011. They already have more than 40 million downloads and already have more than 1 million active users. So what they do is they develop a virtual economy um, and around that they register land and game assets that um, you, players can create themselves. And all of this they're building with blockchain. So within that virtual economy, they are focusing on making it available for users to create assets within the game and to actually own those assets. And what is very significant about them is one of the uh, latest investments in the sandbox was by none other than Square Enix. Some of you know them uh, um, as the publishers for um, Tomb Raider and Final Fantasy. 
And here they say, games using blockchain are no longer in the infancy and are gradually coming to represent a more significant pre uh, presence. The technology, as in blockchain, is capable of bringing something new to the customer's gaming experience and it will be key to growth. And we believe this is the exact and the perfect statement to make because it is in fact uh, the case. So looking at the example, what did the Sandbox do? Well, they have a lot of artists that take creative freedom, freedom to the next level and they create content within the game and they own that content and they can sell it uh, to other gamers within the game. And the game behavior is they allow players to earn with the creations that they make and they actually reward this. They have every two weeks a contest so that artists can um, yeah, be uh, super creative. And the winners uh, of, uh, of that two week campaign, they get land in return. And this is land, what is uh, land for them? That is a playground for which they can actually build uh, uh, the cities or the assets around. And this is how they create a, a virtual economy or a virtual uh, um, ownership throughout the game. And what did they monetize? Well, they monetize the time and the skill and the passion of somebody. And um, right now, it's not the third pre-sale. Uh, just over the weekend, they finished their fourth pre-sale. And with that, they already uh, earned more than $1 million in revenue, which is very impressive for to make. A second example um, is My Crypto Heroes. They are a little bit younger. They were founded in 2018, and they developed a turn-based game. Even though they're younger, in 2019 alone, they earned $3.4 million in revenue just by monetizing game assets. Again, they focus on the monetization of time, skill, and passion. Let's dive a little bit deeper as an example. So here, it's not the desire to create, even though they have that, it's more the desire to compete, win, and earn. They really create um, a game with tournaments. So the game behavior is they want to evolve their heroes as much as possible and um, win and buy extension packs to make their heroes stronger so that they can be used in battle and compete. And they reward this by actually creating tournaments. And here, players are really treating their game assets as an investment because if they do things right, it's a skill-based game, they are actually able to win a big prize money in that, uh, in that regard. So it works really well for their business model. Now, if we look at the common thread, what we see is gamers, they are no longer just a passive gamer, they are actually part of a bigger community. They are creating assets, they are buying assets because they want to play and they want to start earning as well. And uh, it's not only uh, free to play, but it's play to earn at some cases. And the studios that are doing very well, they are creating an asset economy around that player's desire, as we mentioned before. So this is coming back to what we want to say is game studios, you can do everything yourself, but if you stick to what you do best and outsource the rest, here you need to focus on the gameplay. Focus on the player's desire, focus on creating the game mechan uh, mechanics and don't worry about blockchain or anything else. Because in essence, uh, blockchain is just a tool that you will leverage when the time is right. And once you do that, then you will understand that blockchain will make complete sense to use within your game because it fits perfectly within that model of monetizing game assets and you're just using the right tool for the job. And this is actually where, what's, where we come in as in either as a game studio, you have the choice of doing everything yourself. And if you're big enough, you can definitely do this. You can also stick without blockchain and leverage traditional software as a service uh, infrastructures. But there, you probably already understand and know that this is high cost and there's a big vendor lock-in. So it's cutting into your own monetization model. So the goal here is to really look at uh, blockchain asset or, or as 
gain assets and put them on the blockchain and make them a blockchain-based asset. And creating a marketplace around the players within the game and allowing them to actually start owning, earning, and trading those assets. Because when you're using blockchain, you can actually monetize a secondary mar uh, market. As in, with a traditional game, what you want to avoid, you want to avoid gamers to start selling something because here is where you're losing profit. And that's a very big change in paradigm. So that's basically what we want to do, is we want to empower the game studios. It doesn't matter if they're on web, mobile, or console, but we want to focus them on their gameplay so that they can improve the monetization and uh, the player retention, because gamers see that they are becoming more and more part of the game experience. So they tend to stick around longer because they, they have a place where they're saying, okay, it's not just a fun pastime. It's something where they actually feel that they are a valuable community member. And the second thing that we do is we help uh, the game studios to adopt new technologies so that they can automate the value transactions. Because that's basically what the blockchain will do is automate the value transactions throughout different parties. And this creates for us um, and uh, what we uh, believe to be a superior revenue stream because everything is registered, everything is clear, and in the end, it's not tied to one specific game. You can use it into, uh, in multiple games. And this is what we want um, game studios to do. They have to walk before they run. So we want to help them create the digital assets with blockchain technology, help them build their game community, and give them the data that they need to convince them that it is the best decision that they made. So that they can actually measure the adoption, uh, start trading and look at the revenue streams coming in before that they spend a massive amount on um, uh, Facebook ads to attract gamers to start playing their game. And here, what we are doing there is helping them monetize their in-game assets and earn on the secondary markets. This wraps it up um, in terms of this talk. We believe that the asset economy is here, that the way we are doing business has fundamentally changed. And with that, uh, I'm going to hand the talk back over to Habib. Tim, that's really exciting. And uh, as we said in the beginning of your presentation, that this is so much a uh, more opportunity for studios to actually create uh, new monetization uh, ways for their for their uh, games and uh, and also it makes so much sense in terms of the evolution of the gamer himself, right? Uh, enjoying the game, and getting more in the end, right? Yeah, indeed. Um, what we experience when we're talking to the game studios that are already on blockchain is the gamers, they really feel part of the game at this point. As in, they feel that sense of ownership and yeah, the good game uh, studios out there, they are really um, hooking into that. They, they listen to their community very well and that's why the sandbox is so um, successful at this point in time. Mm. They have a, a gaming community since 2011 with more than 1 million users giving them feedback, as in how can you improve the, uh, the gameplay? How can you improve the experience? And this is what they say is, when they saw the um, uh, non-fungible tokens coming up on, um, uh, on the blockchain, here they're saying, okay, this is the uniqueness of a digital asset, and we already know, thanks to blockchain, you can already transfer ownership from one person to the next. And that combination of, the, of um, having a unique, unique asset on the blockchain and transferring that ownership to a gamer, well, for them, a gamer is not just a gamer anymore. It is a content creator. So game designers are actually developing content for the game, and they are actually part of that ecosystem making money. And with each and every transaction that is ha happening, well, 
who is also a, 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 a beneficiary. It's the game studio because they provide uh, that marketplace. They provide all the, the mechanisms to make that possible. Do, do you think that anyone can integrate these solutions? Any game, any developer, whether big, small, medium-sized, uh, is it easy to actually enter that these, uh, and integrate these new solutions? Yes, it has become easier to do so because that's basically why we've built uh, the platform for the past two years. Mm. As in, it's super hard to understand blockchain from a developer point of view and from a player point of view because the user experience is not to, uh, where, it, where it is when you're playing a traditional game. But this is exactly all the things that we're changing as in, we're making blockchain just as simple to use as any other technology. So any gamer can start uh, using or playing with blockchain because we give the game developer the tools they need to create that seamless gameplay experience. So by, by hooking up with you guys at Arcane, it will make the whole process so much easier and, yeah. and have the, these solutions integrated within the games and these monetization options just so much easier. Exactly, because that's the benefit of us. We are not a game studio, but we listen to the game studios. We understand their needs, but what do we understand best? We understand best what blockchain is, what it is not, and how to present that to the needs of a game studio. Of course. I'm sure that uh, you've done some meetings now during DGC on the meeting platform. You will be doing more. You've met a lot of people already. Uh, I'm sure that all of this will certainly bring more of this expertise uh, to also the local and regional studios in, our, in, in, the, in the Middle East, Africa. As you have seen, we had also a lot of speakers from Africa that were there. Yeah. So it's really interesting because I believe that blockchain allows uh, to th these emerging markets, uh, it allows them because they are starting some new things, some new technologies, they are having all of this. It allows them maybe to even grow better uh, in the emerging markets, right? It can, it can give them an edge more faster, correct? Yes, I always think um, emerging, uh, emerging markets will move faster on new technologies simply because they do not have the legacy experience. Yeah. And for them to adopt a new uh, technology and jump uh, and uh, yeah, not be bogged down by the existing infrastructure will make, uh, make it possible for them to actually grow faster and increase and yeah, enter that market a, a lot sooner. And for them to use blockchain technology, it makes complete sense to do so. Because exactly. you saw it with, uh, uh, with mobile as well. They completely skipped landlines and went directly, uh, directly onto the internet with mobile and Wi-Fi. And true. the same thing will, uh, will happen with blockchain technology. True, true. Thank you, Tim. It was really amazing to host you at TGC. Thank you very much. See you again. And uh, maybe the, we will meet in person also and uh, continue that discussion. Continue your efforts and whoever you have met during DGC, please continue your discussions with them. We have seen great things happening from our networking and B2B meeting platform. And as you know, this is, this is the essence of our, of our conference and exhibition is to make people like you meet also companies like you meet companies here in the region and uh, to create this, uh, this bridge between the the, the, the different worlds and to increase the connections and create more business opportunities for everybody, as well as sharing knowledge and new technologies and everything. Thank you very right. much, Tim. Thank you very much for having me, Habib. A pleasure for me to be here. And hope to see you soon in, in Belgium. <laughs> yeah, see I, I want to come to Dubai next time. You will be here, for sure. <laughs> yeah, that's good. <laughs>
Uh, first, I will start uh, talking about myself a little bit. I'm the one on the right. Uh, I'm a software engineer, uh, an entrepreneur. Uh, I've been an entrepreneur for more than 12 years right now. And previously to Tracer that we started two years ago, I contributed to many projects on the blockchain industry, such as Decentraland and Disembed. Those are blockchain projects uh, mostly related to the gambling and gaming industries. Uh, previously to that, I run my own startup, fantasy sports startup in Latin America, which great user adoption and engagement, mostly focused on the Brazilian market. So um, I'll talk about what is Tracers first. Um, Tracers is a fantasy sports stock market where users can create tokens, uh, which are shares actually, that represents their athletes' performances. So we are building a decentralized market where users can buy and sell stocks, which are fantasy stocks, obviously, um, of their favorite sports stars. It's a, for us, it's a new way that users can express their knowledge and passion about sports and also compete against each other. It's a, a new type of fantasy sport, um, fantasy sport game. Um, so how we are doing this? Um, each player performance, historical performance, the, uh, we have different sports, but we, depending on what sports, we track many variables per game, per player, and that accurate uh, an average score for that player, and that score is tokenized into an NFT. For those who are not very, um, for those who didn't hear about NFTs, these are unique items that lives on the blockchain that you can own, and uh, it allows the blockchain allows you to uh, prove basically that you are the only owner of, the, of that item. So we are using the NFT and specifically the ARC seven twenty one standard to tokenize player performances, but with the addition, and this is um, our, um, uh, the, the new thing here, um, the, the NFT can control a variable supply of uh, shares of itself. So um, it, it seemed natural that uh, when, when the ERC-721 ERC standard came out two years ago uh, on, on the CryptoKitties, uh, uh, where the CryptoKitty company were booming and everyone were, were trading kitties at that moment, uh, that maybe the prices get too high for, for one individual to have uh, or to buy an NFT. So uh, the main idea was to fractionalize. Uh, it seemed natural that the next step would be to fractionalize the NFTs. Uh, obviously, the, this can be done with an external contract and, and, and different logic, but we uh, we thought uh, uh, an interesting pattern was, was to uh, add that capability to the NFT registry itself. So we call it an NFT uh, 721 um, contract, and that contract works pretty similar, or, or it has many similarities to um, how decentralized exchanges work. For example, if you look at, uh, if, if they, you know about uh, Bancor or you hear about Kyber or Uniswap, those are decentralized exchanges where you go to the market and uh, trade ERC-20 tokens, right? So this is kind of a similar thing, but it works with uh, sport assets, actually. Okay, so how it works, I have a small video that I'd like to share. Um, basically, we coded the rules on the smart contract, the NFT, and each time the user wants to buy or sell a share, you interact with a contract that has the liquidity enough to provide you that share and uh, to slip the price up or down depending on the operation you do. So in this way, we can have a decentralized liquid market uh, all managed by the smart contract so we don't have the custody of the user's fund. Um, maybe these are after concepts that I it will be more clear with a with a video. So uh, I'll share uh, the video here. So this is login part. It works pretty similar to what uh, decentralized exchanges do. 
but in this case you trade assets that represent sport performances. So this is the dashboard where you can see the tokens and this is a buy operation when you choose the token that uh, you will use to pay for and you can do the order and that's it. Okay, so uh, getting back to this, what we just saw is the use of the platform uh, and a user buying a share of the NFT. Uh, we allowed users to, to trade the NFT itself, which is uh, the holding the, the, the player performance and uh, with some economic incentives, such as, for example, receiving the fees of the marketplace uh, each time the user uh, trades a share of that NFT. But um, as you may notice, the transaction were, was pretty fast, actually, almost near real time for what is a blockchain. Uh, we are using Matic as a layer two solution for scalability and, and uh, it, allowed, it allowed us also to lower the fees by 100x uh, compared to the Ethereum network. So, uh, we are also using Matic uh, as an L2 solution, layer 2 solution uh, for, for tracers to scale. Um, well, to end this presentation, I want to uh, talk a, a little bit about the market. Uh, we are talking about 33.2 uh, billion uh, total addressable market here, which are uh, which is huge actually. Uh, sports funds are, are all over the world and so um, this is represented through this pyramid where you have in the base the sports funds and then going up uh, obviously the the, the, the sports funds that plays uh, fantasy sports they are fanatics and, and play games and uh, we sit on the top of the pyramid where we are focusing on um, trying to give the users or the sports fanatics a new way to express themselves and to compete against each other to show uh, really how the knowledge uh, about sports works. So what we say is how your sport knowledge really works, right? So this is, this is my presentation. Um, thank you very much for your time and I hope you enjoy it. So we're back at uh, DGC Live and with a very, very special panel today. I don't know if I should call it panel or conversation. Welcome back, Brahim from Cosplay Arabia and all of these colorful people you bring with you. It's, uh, it's just amazing. And uh, Brahim, can you uh, do yes. a quick intro of the characters that, are, that have joined us today? Uh, hi, um, Habib. So today uh, I'm very proud of our ambassadors who have joined us and uh, we have with us uh, Foxinity, Eva from UAE uh, and we have from us Jackie from Lebanon and we also have with us Abdullah from Saudi Arabia and they're Hello. all in cosplay. Uh, you can all mention what you guys are in and why you have it. Uh I'll start first then. Uh, hello, I'm Foxinity, and today I'm dressed as Nova Terra. Um, she is from StarCraft, uh, and it's one of the games by my favorite gaming company, Blizzard. Okay, I'll go next. Um, hi, my name is Jackie. Uh, I'm dressed as Diva from Overwatch, and it's also from Blizzard, which is also my favorite. <laughs> and uh, Diva is actually a pro StarCraft player. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, I'm Mixin in Nian. I'm today wearing as Gyu from Demon Slayer. I wore it today because most of my cosplays are armor and this is really easy to get in and comfortable for the session. Yes, sir. And Bara, what are you in? <laughs> I am in a t-shirt of Goku. What's up? See? 
<laughs> and you were wearing a jacket. And we need to meet Hanin. Oh, um, <laughs> I'm Hanin. I'm cosplaying as myself. Obviously. Yes, you are. <laughs> Hard to do. <laughs> so, Brahim, the original cosplay. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Ibrahim, uh, you you uh, as part of Cosplay Arabia, and so when you say cosplay ambassador, what does that mean? Yes. Uh, when we say cosplay ambassador, what it means is that they they have shown leadership skills when it comes to cosplaying in their communities. As you as I mentioned, most of them are from different countries, different parts of GCC, and they're all leaders in their own right, in the sense of they have a positive influence on the community around them, other cosplayers who are joining, or veterans, and they're also highly skilled. Uh, it doesn't mean that they need to have a large following or, they, or we're selecting based on the popular ones. It just means that they are hardworking, they're skilled, and they have shown leadership qualities that we think would be great to incorporate under uh, and represent Cosplay Arabia in the whole region. So uh, I want you to maybe... Uh, or each, each one of you, just to tell us more, how much time does it take to make these costumes? To make? Uh, yeah, the, the, I think Foxini should go first because I know she's crafting and doing a lot of this work, so. Uh, um, depends on the cosplay. It can take from two weeks to a month. Sometimes it goes over. It really depends on the build. Um, and the complexity of it. So for me, I think the longest, maybe two months, perhaps? Months? Whoa. So, uh, How many hours would you say, like if you put like work hours into it, uh, possibly took okay. in those two? Oh, wow. A long time. <laughs> Lots of hours. <laughs> Lots of hours. <laughs> I'm bad oh, with man. math. Oh, man. But <laughs> Lots. Lots. And, and, would and you spend two hours per day? Um, oh, no, no, no. When I do cosplays, it's usually just full day work because I do them when I don't have school. Um, so it's around like sometimes 12 hours of work of just working on cosplay every day. Wow. Uh, extended, uh, extended Neon. I remember in one of our talks, you mentioned you spent 100 hours on a chess piece. I actually mentioned this yes, uh, previously exactly. as well. Can you like uh, elaborate more? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, it was uh, Doom Slayer from the game Doom. It's pretty, uh, really known. It's an FPS game. It took me a lot of time only on the chess piece because it got a lot of details from the side, from the back, and from the front. That's why it took me like about 100 hours. Like uh, the full build, I did not finish it yet, but alone on the chest and the shoulders and the helmet itself, it took me about uh, 460 hours, something like that. Wow. Uh, so it's a few months wow. now you're on the same one, you mean? Yeah. Uh, it took me exactly 30 days only to finish the helmet and the shoulder pieces and the chest. Wow. wow. Uh, and, and Jackie? Yes. Uh, normally, I like sewing projects. And it really depends. Like, uh, a hybrid sewing armor project kind of takes me at least four weeks to do. Because... Um, you have to take in consideration like patterning time and uh, painting time, priming time. And each one really depends like how big is the costume, how detailed is, is the costume, how complicated is the sewing. So I guess if it was an average, I'd say three to four weeks if it was like a hybrid costume. Okay. Is that the longest you've taken or? Yeah, but thing is for me, I kind of, con crunch like when i have a costume i have in mind that's all i work on so it's like if, even if i have university i kind of like go of university and just work on cosplay and i kind of overnight a lot so that's why i kind of like spend over like three weeks when it might take longer but i do not get sleep so and, and <laughs> i i, I want to wow. i want to know something that's dedication right there so, uh, <laughs> once you finished and it's the first time you put the, costu the, 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 the costume on you. What's that feeling? Oh, sometimes it's bad because you realize you made mistakes in the costume. <laughs> uh, like normally the first fitting of a costume is when you realize, oh, this is not proportionate. Oh, I should fix this. 
so it's not really the best time. I think the third time is the best time, which is which, it feels great. <laughs> what about you, Foxy? What about you? Um, personally, the first thing I notice is okay. Next time, I need to do this, this different, this different, this different, this different. Same with Jackie. Um, it's it's. I think for a lot of us, it's just about improving and like thinking about what we can do better next time. Um, but then, you know, the more that I wear the cosplay, the more I'm like, okay, I'm proud of myself for, you know, spending all this time and work and it's finally, you know, the final product. But, what, uh, and, uh, uh, Abdullah. Abdullah, yes. Mm -hmm. Abdullah, did you see? <laughs> Sorry, the internet is really lagging right now, so I'm trying to fix it. So I that was your question. I thought you fell you fell asleep under this this wig and yeah. <laughs> no, no, it's because of the camera and the background. So yeah, <laughs> it's okay, no problem. Because my room is kind of messy, so yeah, that's why. But this uh, no, background. no, it's okay, it's okay. Uh, and uh, Abdullah, how do you feel when you put the costume on and it's the first time you see it? Well. Not gonna lie, it really feels amazing, and I cannot describe the feeling because most of my uh, cosplays are armors, and to feel uh, to have the feeling just like Tony Stark when he wears his Iron Man suit feels really amazing. You know, to walk around, I feel like you're in literal armor, although it's fake and made out of foam, but still, it feels really amazing, and you cannot describe the feeling to be honest. I'm I'm trying to see really. I mean, you so much hours that are put into uh, becoming uh, this character by, by, in the end, by appearance, right? Because, or is it, or do you choose also uh, the character not only for its appearance, but for what you can relate to him in terms of feelings, in terms of uh, actions, in terms of, uh, I don't know, philosophy and life? In, uh, in the character itself, or is it really just related to the appearance of the character? Well, as you've mentioned, we are uh, mostly like most of us customers when we choose the characters, we, cho we choose them as well on based on design, as well based on the personality itself. Like there are a lot of customers who like to impersonate like funny characters, sometimes serious characters, you know. I mostly choose like, uh, not the talkative type, mo most likely uh, serious kind of personality. I really like that. But mostly when it comes to cosplays, I choose based on two things, on how I'm going to look in that character and the design itself and the personality. So yeah, it's not only about appearance, it's as well as uh, personality. Because, you know, when you're in a convention, for example, Deadpool cosplayers, you know, they, they always like to be funny and all of that, make jokes, sometimes even pranks on cosplayers. So yeah. Basically, you become another character for whole day. Mm. And for sanity, what do you think? You do you choose your character based on appearance only? No, for me, it's really mostly about how much I really admire the character. If I have a lot of intense love and passion for a character, and really look up to them and their story, their you know their life. I know that I will enjoy myself in the character because at the end of the day, that is all that cosplay is about, having fun and enjoying yourself. So, I, I yeah, <laughs> that's honestly it from my point. And Jackie? I think I, I agree with Fox and Eddie. Um, normally, when I, every character I've ever cosplayed has, I've cosplayed because I was playing their game or I was watching their anime or I was watching their show. And I think watching them or playing them or seeing them inspires me to cosplay them mainly so the characters for example you are wearing now what yes. what attracted you to them that each one of them I, for example well, I, I, okay okay um i've been playing overwatch since it's beta and i'm a diva main uh and i really love diva so and i've loved her since 2016 uh, so on 2018 i was like i have to cosplay her like it is a given and i did <laughs> and I still love it <laughs> Yeah, but what do you love about her, for example? That is I, close to you, I that relates it. to you. Yeah. She's an icon, you know, like she's like this this kind of like I won't take any um, you know, anything from anyone. I'm strong, I'm I'm like out there, like you can come at me. 
Latino. She's this kind of strong, uh, willing girl. And uh, she gets a lot of uh, bad attention uh, online because a lot of people, they don't like, they like to stereotype gamer girls. But I really love it that even without, with the stereotypes, she still, she still shows strength and she still shows like willpower and yeah, she's great. <laughs> Nerf this. <laughs> and for Trinity, well, I mean, I, I, I don't want to ask the question all the time. I mean, when I ask one question, you guys can jump in, but just, you know, feel free. It um, seems you're very interested in this, man. That's why we just didn't want to say much, because it seems you're so yeah. indulged in cosplay. You, like, every time we talk about it, I can see excitement in your face, Habib. We, we, need, we need Habib to cosplay next. You need him yeah. to join the dark side. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> we make Habib like a transformer. He walks in, he has Bitcoin on his forehead, you know? <laughs> Bara. Um, Bara. Right, should I? Right. Bara. Um, Bara, you can so... mute yourself. It's okay. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> can someone mute Bara? <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, continue. Right. Uh... So actually, um, before I actually got to know the character of um, Nova, I first saw her from Overwatch because my favorite character from there had a skin based on Nova, Widowmaker. Um, and I was like, who is this? Like, she looks so cool. Um, and I didn't start with StarCraft for like a long, long time because I wasn't, you know, it didn't really pull towards me. And I actually first played her in Heroes of the Storm. Um, and I just, she was one of the first characters I picked. She was, she was so cool. Her voice lines were so like badass. Um, she honestly, what I love about her, she just doesn't, she doesn't take criticism. She, she thinks she's the best and she just goes with it. And I love it. That's great. Bara, you wanted to say something, I believe. I, I want you, I, actually, I was listening and I, I know that you are listening too. And I really wanted to have your opinion uh, because you, you host also, uh, you participate to a lot of these conventions. But I, when, when I travel also to, to a lot of gaming conventions, I see a lot of cosplayers. But you feel that, and this is why I was asking a lot of questions now, because you feel that when they are in the conventions, they are so much in character that you can't really talk to them, you know? You can't really uh, ask them why, what. Uh, I'm just taking advantage of the situation now because now I can. So, uh, but Bara, what do you think about cosplaying, really? And uh, Dude, cosplay is, is a very important part of pop, pop culture. Like I said, we just can't go without it anymore. You know, it adds so much color, so much substance, so much value. To the point right now, um, some of the events are willing to put a lot of money into prizes, you know, just to make it happen. Because the thing is, cosplayers at some point, they're not just hobbyists. They're part of the culture. They come in. They, they like the character, you know, if, if it's Jackie or Foxinity or Abdullah. And they will just walk in, of course, with their armor. They spend time. They want to have fun. But at the same time, they're working with us, you know, hand in hand to add more color and value to the event. When they walk around and they take pictures, it feels that they are definitely putting more effort than us sometimes in making the event work. So it's so important. I mean, actually, and here's another thing, Habib, they would love you to approach them. You don't feel like, you know, intimidated. It's like, I can't ask them any questions. They walk around and like, oh my God, look at this armor. No, they don't, they don't hurt. Yeah. They're very nice people. <laughs> you go and ask them, take a selfie. It's all good. They love it. You know, so uh, at this point right now, we just... We want to say to the cosplayers, we love you. We love you so much that we want to support you in any way we can. That's, that's basically it. When I go on stage, I try my best to give this crazy energy to every cosplayer that gets on stage. Not only that, I try to even support them. If some cosplayers are so good in craftsmanship, but they, so let's say, just lack some stage presence, we go, we go together, we have fun, we dance, we make fool of ourselves. Um, if some cosplayers like feel a little bit shy or nervous, no, it's time to go together. We all have this one love. The thing about cosplay is that the energy is, is phenomenal. It's definitely, undoubtedly, something that will just make you feel this push and bursts of unbelievable, let's say, uh, aura that just takes you there. So when you're done with the event, 
You're just like, what just happened? Oh my God, all that energy, all this positivity, the colors, the cosplayers, the things we saw on stage, that was a proper show. But the crazy part, none of them were, uh, none of them like practice beforehand. They all just go on stage and together they create magic on the spot. That's why I love cosplay. Just when it's cosplay competition, we go on stage, I present, cosplayers get on stage, they do their thing, they leave. People will think it's an actual show that we practiced, but we didn't. It just happens on the spot. And that's why it's like, it's magic in the making. That's what I think. Do you, do you compete with each okay. other when you are, uh, when you are uh, creating these costumes? Do you have uh, in the back of your mind, well, I'm doing this because I want to look the best at that convention. I want to have the best costume. I want to be recognized as the one that has the best costume. Anyone can answer it. Uh... No, I think I'll answer. I don't think, I think the, the primary uh, impression is that they, that cosplayers do think that, but we don't. <laughs> like when I make my costumes, I think about how accurate I can be to this character. I think about how much love and celebration I can give to this character because in the end, I'm taking this character and I'm putting it out there to people. So um, when I put myself out there and when I look at other cosplayers, I don't want to think of it as I'm competing with them, even if I see another character. Like when I was doing Tifa from Final Fantasy VII and I saw another Tifa, I just went and I'm like, oh, come give me a hug. I love you, you know, because they're also celebrating that character and they're also showing that love. So if both of you are showing that love, that means you have a lot of things in common. So I don't think it's the competition. It's really all about the characters and the, the source material in the end. Foxinity? Uh, honestly, I agree with everything that Jackie said. Um, if you're, I think if you constantly are looking to compete with somebody else, just, just like making a costume just to compete with somebody else, you're not going to enjoy the costume that much. And you're going to eventually, without even noticing it, push yourself further and further away from the craft because you're not doing it for yourself anymore. Abdullah? Yeah. Well, I'm going to agree with both of them because, again, to be honest, Jackie said it all. Uh, well, I don't have anything to put on the table. <laughs> Ibrahim. Here, here's what I can put in. Uh, the yeah. cosplay community as a whole in the Middle East is very uh, loving and very supportive of each other, especially when they come to you know, places like Dubai. Uh, you know, there, is, there are some people who are competitive, and being competitive is good. It's just when the, yeah, when the focus shifts to just competing, I think you lose the essence of cosplaying, which was to bring people together. Yeah, uh, becoming too competitive could lead to things breaking apart. So while we have some of those people on, in general, it's, it's, very, uh, it's a very united front. And, and cosplaying, I think, uh, in general, is very loved by everyone. You know, Brahim, what fans. I... Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Sorry, please continue. No, no, please, go ahead. You know, I, I was asking all these questions and mm -hmm. in the end, and I think Jackie said it and Foxanity said it in a different way as well, uh, and Abdullah as well, is that it's just the love of the game and the love of the character. And yeah. so, because, you know, guys, you know, I, I, when I first saw you on, on, and you came out on camera, you are, you are uh, impressive, you know? And there is a, an element of intimidation somehow, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and it does, it does, it does exist uh, in, in your characters and wearing like this and you're really in it totally and it looks so real. But so this is why I was asking all, all these questions to understand what's really behind it, you know, is it competition? Is it just, you know, being able to do something from uh, and start it and do the best of it? Is it... Uh, just, can, you know, showing off in convention. But actually, can, it's not. It's really the love of the character. You love the character so much that you want to take it out of the game and really give it freedom in reality. That's it. You're right? There, there, is, there is one more aspect. Uh, we were fortunate enough to work with Baron Writer Circle and, and one of the established writers, Nora Noemi, she looked at it from a bit different perspective. She looked at it from a point of uh, using cosplay to do things which are not normally in your personality. There's a lot of people who are introverts 
There's a lot of people who are shy, who don't really do performances in public or things like that. But when they wear the costume, the confidence, the power, the energy that comes with that costume makes them behave like a completely extrovert person. Like if you met this person in their normal clothes, in their normal life, they'd probably not talk to you much and keep to themselves because, uh, you know, they're mostly gamers or they're not very outgoing. But in cosplay, their personality takes a shift to their characters. And, and this is something that, that, you know, if you look at it from, it's a, it's a bit different point of view, but this is also one of the reasons that people cosplay is that they want to experience that side of their personality that they normally don't exhibit. Yeah, this is why I was asking also, how do you relate to the character? Do you choose the character just for the appearance or, or uh, for, for what the character makes you feel or you feel about the character? But is, is, what Brahim is saying is correct. I mean, uh, is it, do you cosplay because it gives you something that you cannot usually be uh, in, your real, in your normal real life? Oh, definitely, definitely. In my case, I'm very, very shy and have no confidence whatsoever. I can't so believe it. I, I cannot in believe In general. It. <laughs> yeah. I, I can't believe it. In general, yeah. I'm just drawn to characters who are so confident. So it helps me, you know, emotionally as well um, to become just somebody else and sort of push out some confidence. I think personally, cosplay has made me regain touch with my feminine side um <laughs> honestly like i'd say in 2013 before i even started i wasn't that you know girly uh he he you know but when i started wearing characters like hatsune miku uh like uh, you know idols you know school idols from japan i realized like oh this is really cute frilly skirts dancing you know it's pretty cool and i think i got more into that side of being, you know, cute and stuff. So I guess that helped me a lot. Abdullah, uh, I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> <It's>, uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, in general, uh, to be honest, uh, cosplay helps overcoming insecurities a lot, like because a lot of people uh, in our cosplay communities, you know, have body insecurities or face insecurities. Cosplay helps you overcoming them. Like in my case, to be honest, uh, when always uh, like, 2015 or 2013, I was really insecure with my face. But like when I started cosplaying in 2018, it really helped me overcoming my face insecurities. So yeah, cosplay does help you with a lot of things and uh, could make you from inter introvert into extrovert. Deb, I really uh, think that there is this sense of community when, yeah. when you're at a con and we actually do see this. We see that they have this sense of togetherness and they start like helping each other. Like I've seen it happen. Like someone's maybe like their prop came off a bit or had the little defect in their cosplay and they actually just gather up, they huddle up and help each other, which I really find is, is interesting. It's a, sense of community that they all share this love for cosplay and getting into character and despite whether even if you see that the characters are rivals they actually like uh, um, love each other support each other and they they exchange like ideas and advice and they they have this beautiful uh, kindred spirit i guess that's the word <laughs> i'm not sure but uh it's it's really beautiful and maybe the intimidating part comes out is because that's the time where they feel the most confident and the most expressive of themselves. So you can see it like their confidence just being boosted through the, their armor and their, uh, their styling of themselves and the character. It's, it's really beautiful. It's just that uh, the amount of work they put behind, this is, I mean, uh, I totally agree with you, Hanin, but the amount of work they put behind, I mean, they can, they can buy a costume and, be, and become the costume and have more confidence, but they're actually working hours and, ten, and hundreds of hours just to, 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 to make it look like uh, I'm, I'm seeing now. So, it's, uh, so maybe it's, there's this that is really, it's not confusing, but I'm asking uh, what, 
what makes this uh, so much uh, love for the game and for the character uh, to the point where uh, you put so much uh, effort behind it, you know? It's, uh, I think it's really you want to become that character, totally, yeah. like without any flaws. Like if you just were drawing it in, in, in the studio that is uh, developing the game and, and you're just becoming it, right? More or less. Yeah. More or less. <laughs> like uh, normally when, I w when I'm making a costume, I have reference sheets. And I think referencing takes me almost two days because especially if I'm sewing a dress, I have to make this dress exactly in, this, in these exact proportions as this character. So I even like, for instance, when uh, Tifa from Final Fantasy VII Remake came out, she wasn't out in her full image. So I had to go and get like reference images from uh, people that made a life-size statue of her in Japan. And I went into, I think like Reddit and 4chan and I think Tumblr just to get these reference images because her full picture wasn't out yet. And they, and they ended up changing the skirt design in the end, which was really bad. But um, it's, it's more or less like we use these pictures, like we use these things in order to get the most accurate result out of it. So. Uh, obscenity, you, we, have, we still have around two minutes. Uh, I know Bara, Hanin, uh, Brahim, uh, I'm sorry, I, I, ju I, I know I focused my questions on the cosplayers, but no, it's, okay. it's, the, it's the first time <laughs> we actually it's host cosplayers. No, no, it's about them. Uh, yes. Usually, usually, you know, you know, uh, this this conference, this event is uh, is more related to the industry, to the, the business behind it, to the creators behind it. Like, if if you come to GGC, you would meet the game designer that worked on your game, that drew your character that you cosplay. So he's the guy that actually worked on it, imagined it, and gave it its shape, its colors, and, and everything. So this is the type of, of, uh, of speakers, of uh, businesses that usually come to this event. So it's the first time I host cosplayers, so I'm sorry I was asking maybe too many <laughs> questions, good, but I was just about them, like Mara said. Yeah. I, and Ibrahim I'm very and happy. You know uh, I'm very happy, mm -hmm. Ibrahim, that you gave us this opportunity with Hanin to mm -hmm. uh, do this competition and to have this panel. And I'm I'm really happy to to meet you, uh, Foxinity, Jackie, Abdullah, and uh, it's uh, it's really amazing. And I hope that we will be able to do more things with the uh, with the cosplay community uh, and. Uh, and uh, uh, we we had uh, we had a, a panel earlier with uh, Ibrahim and Kate Edwards, and uh, Kate is uh, she's a an executive in the gaming global globally, you know, and she's still cosplaying. Mm -hmm. And she had her helmet during our session and everything, <laughs> and yeah. her daughter is doing it. If you want to watch her, uh, uh, you can watch again her what we recorded about her uh, when it will be out. But you guys, I'm, I'm really, I'm really happy that we had this talk, and uh, we just the time just ended, and so. But uh, I don't know. I have a thousand more questions, but no more time to ask. <laughs> really. So okay. thank, you, thank you, thank you very much for sure. uh, for being here. We have our competition <laughs> still going. We have a PlayStation as a as a prize. Uh, so um, we're very happy to give that uh, to the winners. I mean, it's, it's, it's just nothing compared to the work you guys are doing. And really keep up the good work. Uh, just uh, one more question because I cannot leave without it. It's the, whenever there is a new game that comes out and that you play, do you always pick a character in a new game or you, can, or, or you stay on, let's say, one or two games and these are the ones where you will be uh, is it is it like whenever there is a new game you pick a character? Just quickly, quickly, very quickly. Yes, no, yes, no. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, mostly yes. Uh, most as cosplayers like to choose like more trending video games characters, and as well like uh, new video games, anime, or shows. We like to cosplay as these new characters because 
most of us cos cosplayers like to cosplay characters that nobody cosplayed like around the world only like about two or three uh, cosplayers who cosplayed this character like it gives more an amazing feeling like hey i'm actually one of the three around the world who cosplay as this character right now so yeah mostly yes i mean um i i guess like uh normally i personally i just cosplay what i what i enjoy you know even if it's not a very trending game like from vocaloid i i have these plans of cosplaying every single uh vocaloid even though it's not popular anymore at all so it really depends but normally i think just cosplayers cosplay what they love so even oh, if yeah, it's exactly popular, uh, I'll have to agree with Jackie. Honestly, as long as I find it interesting, if it's new, I'll probably do it if I like it. Um, so honestly, as long as it's something that I, I that I feel passionate about, I think this goes for a lot of cosplayers again, um, then we'll probably do it. That's great. And uh, uh, thank you, Brahim, really. Thank you, You're Jackie. Welcome. Thank you, Foxinity. Thank you, Abdullah, Hanin. Bara, I'm sorry we didn't talk much. Uh, but I think you have, you have other sessions with us, so you, you'll have the, the, yes, the call for you on your own. And uh, thank you, Brahim. And uh, we will be, I guess, uh, thank you. showing some of these uh, videos from the contest. And Kate Edwards, will, uh, who is our judge, and yourself and Hanin will pick the winner. And then we, we will also announce this. And well, that's it. Thank you very much. So day three is over. Our adventure, our journey for DGC Live is at a close. But it's only the beginning. It's us. only the beginning for all of the developers. There's so much opportunity that we've seen through all the panels, through the keynotes, uh, by talking to our fantastic partners as well. It's obviously clear that the MENA region, well, Let's be honest, we're going to become a really big hub for the gaming industry, aren't it's, we? It's really exciting to be in this region, Thomas. I mean, it allows us to dream. Mm. It allows us to have a really uh, amazing future. Mm. And the gaming industry has a great future in this region. Mm. And we just noticed that in the past three days. I think so. Um, I'll let you guys into a little secret here. There was a little bit of uh, uncertainty about how we were going to do this because obviously the world as we know it, doing a completely virtual event. But looking at the numbers, we've definitely pulled it off. Yes, and it's the first DGC Live. We used to do it uh, as a physical event. Yep. And we took the challenge, and it was really uh, supported by so many people, such excitement. And we have to thank our partners for this as well that supported us. And all the developers of the region, our friends in the international companies mm -hmm. as well, and the support of Media City, Internet City, and all of our facilities here in Dubai. Yeah, and don't forget the team because you guys are watching us two right here, but there are about 30 or 40 people behind the cameras right now, uh, and they are basically helping us produce this live. And it's no small effort, and we really have to thank the team for that. And I'm basing that purely on the amount that I have learned about the gaming industry. The gaming industry is evolving massively in our region, massively. I can tell you when we first founded DGC, mm -hmm. we used to go for meetings and you know, people would not take us seriously. <laughs> and now we see at DGC Live, 100 more speakers, global event, mm -hmm. global reach, many companies joining, many companies interested in, in, in joining the gaming industry. The gaming industry is really the, the way of the future of our region. I completely believe that. And I know for a fact that kind of all the panels and all the content, um, it doesn't disappear. It's still there for everyone who has been a part um, of DGC Live. Um, and so you can enjoy that. Yes, of course. On our YouTube channel, on our website, you'll be able to watch again if you have missed it. I hope not. And you will be able to watch again all of the sessions until the next DGC Live. Exactly. So three days, 36 hours of live content. I need to go to bed, man. <laughs> so I, uh, should we just say goodbye? I, I think we got, you know, used to being here. So I'm not sure what's going to happen. <laughs> well, I know what's going to happen. I'm going to sleep. Thank you very much for joining us for the fourth year of DGC Live. Thank you very much, Thomas. 
And I really want to thank you for being with us this year as our co-host. I want to thank you as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, guys.